Uh, ho hold on, Sergeant Dautai. Hold on. We're waiting for the live link. Go ahead, Sergeant. On your video devices to vibrate, please mute. Please mute your microphones on Zoom. Please ensure that you have named yourself correctly in Zoom, or you may be either renamed by the Zoom host or removed from the hearing. We will begin the meeting of the Committee on Finance. Are we now live? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to use my trusty MSQI debate league gavel to gavel us in. And uh, with that, I'd like to say good morning and welcome to the city council's second day of hearings on the mayor's executive budget for fiscal 2021. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the finance committee. We are joined by the committee on education chaired by my colleague, Council Member Mark Traeger, and the public advocate, Jamani Williams. I now want to introduce my colleagues who have joined us, and they are Council Members Adams, Lewis, Borelli, Van Bremer, Rudenchik, Kalos, Lander, Brannon, Minority Leader Matteo, Amphrey Samuel, Powers, Council Members Barron, Gibson, Levine, and Rosenthal, and I know that others will be joining us shortly. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you. My name is Stephanie yeah. Ruiz, and I am counsel to the New York City Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including answers. After you are acknowledged, please wait for the Sergeant Arms to tell you at, that your time has begun. The Sergeant Arms will also indicate when your time has expired. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. I will now hand it back to Chair Drum. Thank you very much. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed our daily reality in many respects, and our city students have not been spared from these disruptions. In response to the spread of the virus, New York City public schools were closed, and students and staff transitioned to remote teaching and learning from home. I, for one, could not be more proud of our city's teachers. I also want to thank our chancellor for making this transition so smooth. In a matter of days, they pivoted to a completely new teaching platform, and they showed up for their students. In doing so, they provided their kids with consistency in a time of uncertainty and support when so many young people were stressed and anxious. So to all the teachers and school support staff, we thank you and please know that the council is working hard to ensure that you have the resources you need in this budget. DOE's fiscal 2021 executive budget totals $27.5 billion. As economic projections become increasingly dire and DOE's budget cuts reach a total of 851.6 million in fiscal 2021, the DOE will operate with a 1.7% less funding than anticipated in fiscal 2021 preliminary plan. Yet the plan we are presented is incomplete. There are several areas of spending in DOE's fiscal 21 executive budget that are underestimated and underfunded, such as Carter cases and charter school tuition payments leaving the city further exposed to a number of budget risks. Meanwhile, the executive plan does not reflect all projected spending related to the pandemic or make baseline adjustments to account for the need for change services related to COVID-19. Similarly, on the capital side, the budget does not align with the capital plan approved by the Panel for Educational Policy. 
We all know that in this fiscal situation, difficult decisions and budget cuts need to be made at the DOE. But many of the mayor's proposed cuts to the DOE's budget will directly impact the day-to-day -day functioning of schools. I believe that we must avoid making those cuts to school budgets and that we should look elsewhere to reduce funding, to reduce funding. I started out by thanking our teachers, but there are so many other school staff that need to be praised for their work during this pandemic, including the cafeteria staff who are distributing food every day, the custodial staff who continue to ensure the buildings remain clean and in working order, and to our principals and assistant principals who are leading by example. And I just want to quote one thing from Lainey Hampson's article this morning in Gotham Gazette. We've lost 74 Department of Education employees during this pandemic. 30 of them were teachers and 28 of them were paraprofessionals. The DOE has been on the front line of this pandemic, working hard for our city. And I would like to thank you for all of the work that you have done uh, to get us through this current crisis. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to, see, uh, to say that COVID-19 has already had a brutal impact on the public school system, and we must ensure that our schools have the resources they need so that this pandemic does not have lifelong consequences for a generation of children. Now I'm going to turn it over to council member and Chair Traeger for his opening. Chair Traeger. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum, and good morning. I am Councilmember Mark Traeger, Chair of the Education Committee. I'd like to welcome everyone who is joining us remotely today to the fiscal 2021 executive budget hearing on the DOE uh, budget, co-chaired by my great colleague, Chair of our Finance Committee, Daniel Drum. This is the Education Committee's first remote hearing, and I wanna begin by thanking the Finance Division staff including Chelsea Badenmore, Mace Sarkessian, Doheny Sambura, Regina Ryan for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Uh, I also wanna thank the Sergeant at Arms and the IT division for all their work in making these hearings possible. Uh, before we go right into the DOE budget, I wanna take a moment as well as, you know, as my colleague did and thank and acknowledge every educator, food support staffer, custodian, cleaner, uh, the team, the chancellor's team, the, the entire office uh, for their incredible work for these past couple of months to help our children and our school communities cope with this crisis. I also wanna extend my heartfelt uh, apologies and thoughts uh, with all of our school community family members who have lost loved ones who have been great, greatly impacted uh, by, by this crisis. Uh, while we are aware that the city is in the middle of a crisis that continues to gravely impact our budget. As a former educator and longtime fierce advocate for increases to fair student funding, uh, I am very troubled by the disproportionate impact on school budgets and FSF that the mayor's peg would introduce. I wanna be very clear about what my North Star is and will be throughout this budget process. Those closest to the struggle must be farthest from the pain. This budget will determine if the trauma our students are experiencing right now will be temporary or generational. They will never get back the lost instruction. They will not get back the school community members that, that they've lost. This has turned their world upside down and it is up to us in government and leaders to make sure that we protect them and protect their future. We know and we have identified several alternative savings within the city's budget and DOE's budget from areas that do not affect the vital COVID related support and work that our uh, educators, school staff, custodians, social workers, counselors are performing while also not impacting uh, you know, the overall budget. It is imperative that during this time of need, we continue to invest in our children who are in fact our future. I fear that cuts of this magnitude will force our most vulnerable schools to make programmatic cuts in areas that our children need most. DOE's fiscal 2021 executive budget totals $27.4 billion. 
This is $462.9 million less than the budget identified in the pre prelim plan, a result of 851.6 million in cuts to DOE's fiscal uh, 21 budget. A shortfall in state funding compared to what the city expected in a pre-COVID world required the DOE to backfill 381.5 million in spending. The remaining 470.1 million in cuts are from the administration's program to eliminate the gap or known as a peg. In the interest of time, we have asked uh, the chancellor also to limit his remarks. So I will also follow suit. In addition to the finance staff I mentioned earlier, I'd like to thank the education committee staff, Malcolm Butterhorn, Jen Atwell, Kalima Johnson, and also thank my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, and I will turn the hearing back to Chair Drum. Thank you very much. And we will now hear from our public advocate, Jamani Williams. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. As mentioned, my name is Jamani Williams, public advocate for the city of New York. I'd like to thank the committees on education and finance. Uh, thank uh, Chair Drum and uh, Chair Traeger who have been leading uh, on these issues for this executive hearing, as well as the chancellor for being here today and lend my voices to those who are praising all of our heroes and the school system for helping us get where we are. And I still have a lot more work to do, of course. The rapid spread of COVID-19 and the subsequent statewide shelter in place, uh, or pause order rather, has caused a massive disruption to our local economy. And of course, we all understand the need to consider budget cuts. It does more harm than good for the city to continue to significantly invest uh, in law enforcement, yet reducing funding for youth programs, education, vital services, uh, to particularly low moderate uh, com income communities and communities of more color. Ultimately, what this means is a criminal justice response instead of an innovative solution that we know work. It is our duty as elected officials to ensure that cuts are equitably distributed, especially at a time when it is clear that some of our most marginalized communities are unexpectedly and disparately impacted by the coronavirus, specifically by decisions made locally. I'm saddened by what happens to be a short change to our city's young people through cuts to education and other youth services. While a reduction in operational cost is understandable, the more than $400 million uh, in cuts of, to the Department of Education and $166 million to cuts in CUNY will make it more difficult for our city's youth to get the educational and workforce development they need to plan for future careers. Last week, the IBO reported that our city stands to lose at least $2.3 billion dollars in education funding should the state's decision of 20 to 30 percent of across the board cuts occur. If the city truly wants to end the tale of two cities, the administration must reject these cuts and look elsewhere in the budget for opportunities uh, to weather the storm. It is very much nonsensical to reduce funding for DOE when the very nature of learning has drastically changed. Schools in New York have implemented distance learning, which is necessary, and it is our responsibility to eliminate the digital divide and ensure all students have access to the technology they need to continue their education. I have concerns about DOE's current capacity to meet the needs of students with disabilities, students with special needs, and our ESL learners. I'm also deeply troubled to hear about reports of ACS investigations into families who have had difficulty obtaining or utilizing remote learning devices. The transition to distant learning which has created a great deal of challenges for our students, their families, and teachers. We need an equitably funded strategy to address these problems. Our investments in young people need to extend far beyond the school. We know that jobs are a key factor in keeping young people engaged in our communities. The city's youth employment program has programmed, the city's summer youth employment program has proven to be an invaluable opportunity for our youth. As previously proposed, SYP should not be dismantled. It should be instead adapted to meet youth where they are in the current crisis. The city should use a stipend payment and allow to, for remote work and skills training, filling essential roles where the city needs the most. All New York City youth should have access to summer jobs, regardless of citizenship status. And my bill, intro 1670, would ensure they do so. SYEP's young and eager youth workforce deserves an opportunity to build their own foundation. Like all of us, students and educators are experiencing a great deal of trauma. I am concerned about their mental well being during this time. Identifying real time support for mental wellness and trauma informed school practices for both students and the staff is a challenge. The administration must, however, prioritize extending professional development to school staff and supports for mental wellness, grieving coronavirus devastation during this time, as well as those who have lost loved ones and a student or school staff who have passed in their respective schools across New York City. I know the city is facing an economic crisis, 
difficult decisions will be made. We cannot place this on the back of our vulnerable children, their families, or their teachers. I'm eager to hear from the administration today and how their commitment to serve New York's youth aligned with this budget. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Public Advocate. I'd uh, like to say that we've also been joined by Council Members Moyer, Yeager, Salamanca, and Lansman. And I'm just checking to see if any others okay. That's it. Uh, before we begin with testimony from the administration, I'd like to remind the public that the Finance Committee and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget will be holding a remote hearing for public testimony on the executive budget on May 21st at 1130 a.m. Now I'm seeing some tweets in regard to being disappointed uh, about the public not participating in this hearing, but that's the way that it's always been and for the executive budget hearings, and we take public testimony at the end of the executive budget hearings. Uh, and many, uh, in many cases, that testimony given particularly by parents and others has made a significant difference in our budget negotiations. So if you would like to testify at that hearing, please register at www.council.nyc.gov slash testify. Let me say it again, www.council.nyc.gov forward slash testify and information about how to access the Zoom meeting will be emailed to you. You may testify at that hearing via web or via telephone. You may also submit written testimony through the registration website or by emailing finance testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's finance testimony at council.nyc.gov. And also, I believe that the chancellor's testimony today is available uh, on live stream. If I'm not mistaken, let me just double check on that. Excuse me. Yes, the uh, you can please um, the public that the chancellor's testimony is available on the council's website. Excuse me through Legistar. Um, I will now call on the members of the Department of Education to testify. We will hear testimony from Chancellor Richard Carranza. Chancellor Carranza is joined by Lindsay Oates, the Chief Financial Officer, and Ursulina Ramirez, the Chief Operating Officer. Will the committee council please administer the affirmation? Thank you. I will now administer the affirmation one time, and you will be called on individually to so affirm at the end. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, belief? Chancellor Carranza? I do. I Ms. do. Oates? I do. Ms. Ramirez? I, I do. Thank you. Chancellor, you may begin when ready. Thank you. So good morning, uh, Chair Drum, Chair Traeger, uh, Public Advocate Williams, uh, and all of the members of the Finance and Education Committees here today. I am Richard Carranza, and I have the privilege of serving as New York City Schools Chancellor. Joining me this morning is Ursulina Ramirez, Chief Operating Officer for the New York City Department of Education, uh, and Lindsay Oates, Chief Financial Officer for the Department of Education. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify on Mayor de Blasio's fiscal year 2021 executive budget as it relates to the DOE. And I hope that you and your families are all safe and healthy. I would also like to take this moment to thank and applaud all of our teachers and principals, food service workers, our custodians, our school safety agents, our crossing guards, everyone working in the rec centers that are making it possible for our first responders and essential workers to continue to serve our city. Thank you for your service. Thank you. We, all, we are almost two months into a pandemic that has had catastrophic impacts on our city, including the closing of our school buildings from March 16th until the end of this school year. This has been a painful time and we are all devastated by the lives lost through this crisis. At the Department of Education, we have lost more than 70 of our colleagues. Our communities will never be the same without them, and we owe a debt of gratitude to all of our staff on the front line, as well as our first responders and the essential workers across our city. Having seen firsthand the incredible resilience and commitment of our DOE staff, our students, and our families, 
as well as New Yorkers in general, I know that we will get through this together. I would also like to express my gratitude to Speaker Johnson, as well as Chairs Drum and Traeger and the entire City Council for all you have done and continue to do on behalf of New York City schools, and especially our historically mar marginalized students. You remain fierce advocates for equity in our school communities, and we are grateful to have you working with the Department of Education on how to best provide for all of the students in New York City during this time. Your insights and support have been crucial in the midst of this crisis. As you know, the pandemic has also had a devastating effect on the city's fiscal condition. As a result of the near complete shutdown of the New York City economy, the New York City Office of Management and Budget is projecting a city tax revenue declines of $7.4 billion against prior expectations across fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021. Furthermore, the state's enacted budget left a nearly $400 million shortfall in funding that we were owed for our schools, which the city had to backfill. This is troubling financial background in which the mayor has announced painful cuts to city agencies in our school system. The DOE's fiscal 2021 executive budget of approximately $34.2 billion includes $27.5 billion in operating funds and another $6.7 billion in education-related pension and debt service funds. Our funding is a combination of city, state, and federal dollars with the city tax levy dollars making up the largest share, 57%, and the state dollars, 36%, and federal dollars, 6%. The executive budget includes $111 million in reductions in savings from the current year operations for the Department of Education, and $471 million in reductions and savings for fiscal year 2021. The federal response has not matched the economic impact of this pandemic. The Federal CARES Act, providing funding to state governments to distribute, New York switched out that funding for their own, using it to backfill $700 million uh, whole year-over-year -year reduction in state aid. In addition, the state budget allows the governor to make mid-year cuts as a pandemic progresses, with the potential to cause budget gaps for us in fiscal 2021. We expect the state to announce further large cuts to our budget as soon as this week. This economic reality requires the city to make hard decisions, including painful education cuts. These cuts are of a shocking magnitude. We first began in our central budget, slashing programs, including some of our hallmark equity and excellence programs, programs such as College Access for All and Civics for All. Other centrally administered areas for reductions in fiscal year 2021 include professional development spending reductions, hiring free savings, and delaying the expansion of 3K programs, amongst others. But the degree of reduction necessary meant DOE could not take these cuts purely out of administrative budgets. And budget cuts to our schools now include $100 million in reduction to the fair student funding formula, and a $40 million reduction to other funding streams. As an educator, as a lifelong educator, I cannot overstate how troubling this is. And I wanna be very clear that school-based cuts are absolutely the last resort. And we are doing everything we can to avoid or minimize the pain for our school communities, minimize the pain for student learning and educators who serve them. We are working internally and with our city partners to come up with an equitable methodology that minimizes the impact to our most vulnerable communities. But as a former teacher and principal, very few things break my heart more than having to go through this exercise of trying to save resources for our schools. Let me be very clear, under these circumstances and without additional direct support from the federal government, we simply cannot afford to maintain school budgets and programs at fiscal year 2020 levels. We need federal intervention. You will hear me detail the incredible work of our staff and families, none of which will be possible without adequate funding going forward. This city council has consistently been partners in advocating for academic funding and more resources for our schools and our communities. And I know you will continue your advocacy to our congressional delegation for additional direct aid to localities and future relief bills. Within days of this crisis beginning, we engineered the complete transformation of our educational system, closing school buildings and bringing learning and teaching for 1.1 million students online. This shift to remote teaching and learning poses all kinds of challenges, 
and can't possibly equal the richness of classroom experiences, but it was the best option to sustain our connections with our students. Several weeks in, I can honestly say that I'm in awe of what our staff, our families, what our communities and our students have done to make this new reality work much better than anyone could have anticipated. During a crisis like this, it can become easy to lose sight of our broader goals for New York City schools and children. But from the beginning of my tenure, equity and excellence for all has been my focus. This administration has made historic investments in education initiatives as part of our ex equity and excellence for all agenda to improve outcomes for our students. We have and will continue to use the same lens throughout this crisis and beyond. Even as we adapt to the radically changing landscape, we will keep our most vulnerable students in mind. I'll begin by diving further into remote learning services and supports for our 1.1 million students. This transition demanded that we figure out a way to bridge the digital divide as quickly as possible. We are the only major school system with a substantial effort to provide remote learning devices to our students. And as I speak to my colleagues, heads of large urban systems across the country, there is no one that comes close to what we have done in New York City. Immediately, we began distributing approximately 175,000 existing school-based devices to students in need, while collaborating with partners to bring hundreds of thousands of internet-enabled iPads to students who previously lacked the means to access remote learning. Distribution of, of centrally purchased devices began with our most vulnerable students, 13,000 students living in shelters, followed by students in temporary housing and foster care, high school students, multilingual learners, students with disabilities. This has been critical in allowing us to provide related service for students with IEPs through teletherapy where appropriate. To date, we have distributed more than 280,000 internet enabled devices across the city to ensure our students have access to remote learning. This was a hugely heavy lift but absolutely necessary and would have been impossible without the council's longstanding and continuous investment in technology for our schools. Our regional enrichment centers, our RECs, educate and provide safe spaces to the children of first responders and other essential workers. To date, we have over 8,800 students that have been given placement across the 57 REC sites across our city in addition to a range of childcare sites for children ages zero to five. We will be operating these spaces for as long as necessary so that essential workers have the childcare that they need so that they can continue to serve our city and our, our, our residents. In addition to the rec, schools are being used in yet another unprecedented way. We have opened nearly 450 meal hubs across the city that are safely providing three meals a day to anyone that needs them, both children and adults. Our numbers continue to increase and to date we have served over 10 million meals and now exceed 500,000 meals that are being served on a daily basis. These sites prov provide halal and kosher meals to those who need them, including expanded halal meals during Ramadan. This has been a huge accomplishment and I can't tell you how proud I am of everyone on our team for ensuring that New Yorkers remain nourished during this destabilizing pandemic. We know that remote learning during this time remains an immense challenge given the stress and trauma facing our students, our families, and our educators. We also know that healthier students are better learners. So we have focused on ensuring that our students receive access to supports needed to promote their health, wellness, and engagement. And I wanna acknowledge that the City Council and especially Chair Traeger have been key partners in our ongoing work to address the needs of the whole child. Your commitment to ensuring that students have access to social and emotional supports has been essential to their well-being during such unsettling times. Through our wellness DOE program, schools are conducting universal wellness checks, especially for our most vulnerable student populations and working to identify less engaged students, making sure that they are properly supported. We have created resource to, resources to promote SEL learning, through remote learning, and we have provided direct clinical supports to students since the day remote learning began. We are, of course, eager, like everyone else, to reopen our schools and return to classroom in-person learning. However, we recognize the gravity of this situation and the need to center this decision on the health and safety of our students, families, staff, and city. This is going to be a process and a gradual one. We will not reopen the day before public health 
Health experts say it's safe. We are looking at different options for how to resume in-person instruction. And our goal is and focus is on returning to buildings in September. Even with all the work we have done to make remote learning as successful as it can be, we know that there will be a new level of work required for us. From ensuring buildings that are safe to rethinking health protocols to addressing learning loss, providing heightened social emotional supports and all of the trauma informed supports that we know are necessary. We will continue to keep you updated and solicit your feedback as alternatives are evaluated and hope to provide as much clarity as soon as we can allow for maximum planning and understanding. In conclusion, I hope that this paints a useful picture of how critical public education is in these unprecedented times. Our city, our state, and our nation's health and economy have been ravaged by this crisis. Our resolve and resilience are being tested daily. Hard choices that we could not anticipate nor want to make have been foisted on a daily basis, but that is exactly why we cannot abandon our investment in this work and why now more than ever it's critical to the future of our students' families, neighborhoods, and our cities. The Department of Education is all in it, doing everything we can to equitably navigate these challenges. And my commitment is that supporting our students, families, and educators will always be front and center, no matter what. We need the City Council's continued feedback, advocacy, and wholehearted dedication to our 1.1 million students. I want to thank you for your time, and we, will, myself and my colleagues, will be hands, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chancellor. And uh, let me jump right in to one of our biggest issues, which is the um, issue of state aid. The governor, and you may mention somewhat of this in your testimony, but the governor recently announced that there's a potential for an additional $8.2 billion cuts in the budget to localities if no additional federal, uh, federal revenue is granted to the state. One of the areas that will be impacted will be school aid. Currently, New York City makes up 41% of the state's total school aid allocation. So if this cut does come through, it's likely that New York City could lose $2.1 billion in school aid. Uh, would it be possible to absorb this cost without layoffs or massive disrupt disruption to contracting with nonprofit providers? Mr. Chair, uh any additional cuts, uh, as I mentioned, let me give the context. As I mentioned, the Federal CARES Act, which was supposed to be stimulus money that directly supported schools, was, uh, was used by the state to cover a budget hole at the state. Uh, and then we were subsequently um, cut that funding uh, in our state allocation. Any additional allocations will be devastating to the Department of Education and the students uh, and staff in New York City. Uh, we are cutting the bone. There is no fat to cut. There is no meat to cut. We are at the bone. Uh, in my tenure, over two years here at the Department of Education, we have taken over $600 million in cuts, which have all been centrally cut. Uh, and this additional cut this year is the first time that schools are feeling uh, a segment of pain around these kinds of cuts. To add more cuts from the state to our budget will devastate our school system. And it's why I've been advocating and uh, partnering with all of the city council members to advocate at the federal level for federal stimulus, which will not allow supplantation of that funding elsewhere. Uh, it will be devastating to us in every facet of what we do to educate children. Chancellor, if these cuts uh, happen, uh, will school budgets continue to be the target if the governor implements these cuts? We, uh, we are absolutely looking at keeping the cuts as far away from schools as possible. Uh, we are decimating. Uh, we have decimated central budgets. We have frozen hiring. We have reduced professional development. Uh, we are cutting everywhere we can cut centrally, but we are at the bone. And that's why, for the first time, schools are feeling some of the sting of these cuts. Uh, it breaks my heart as an educator uh, that any school would receive or feel any kind of a cut. That's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, evidence of the fact that these cuts are so deep, that they are now starting to affect our schools. Uh, so we need that stimulus funding and we need to protect our schools and our classrooms as much as possible. 
Chancellor, what's, what is the plan if we do see these cuts? Have you uh, given thought to that? We are working on multiple scenarios and uh, we are working very closely with OMB uh, around uh, planning for what, how and what we would do to absorb these cuts. Uh, one, of the, one of the many reasons I am so proud to be Chancellor in New York City is the infrastructure that has been created in New York City of our most vulnerable students and our most vulnerable community. And my greatest fear is that additional cuts will uh, chip away. Uh, in fact, it won't chip away, it will hack away uh, the very infrastructure that we've created to save <laughs> to serve our most vulnerable student uh, communities. With your permission, sir, I have my chief financial officer, Lindsay Oates, on, on board. She can talk a little bit more detail about what the planning is uh, for for these kinds of cuts. Lindsay? Thank you, sir. I uh, just wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Yes, yeah. okay, <laughs> great. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I agree with both the Chancellor and Chair Drum's assessment of the state cuts. Um, Obviously, we want to see what the actual numbers are, and we expect, as the Chancellor testified to hear, hopefully later this week, to put in context, um, these additional state cuts on top of existing cuts are somewhere around 10% of the Department of Education's budget. I mean, these are huge, huge numbers, um, and we are doing everything we absolutely can to spare direct school budgets. But, you know, the entire budget DOE supports schools, our school food workers, our, um, you know, our maintenance, our, our facilities, our custodians, um, all of our budget supports direct schools. And so whatever these cuts end up looking like there will be an impact. Um, we're working as closely as we can with our city partners to assess how to do this in an equitable way to try to ensure that the highest need students uh, retain the supports that they need during this crisis and to certainly prioritize all of the resources on direct response efforts as long as this crisis is ongoing. Those are our top priorities right now, but um, there is a lot of hard work ahead of us. And we appreciate, as the chancellor said, all of your advocacy at the federal level, really secure direct financial aid we need direct from the federal government to New York City. Um, we need that direct aid to really help um, maintain our school system right now. Have you been in contact with the federal government on this or uh, how are you advocating for that aid? Uh, yes, Chairman Drum, I have personally spoken with uh, our, our, both of our senators. I've also spoken with our congressional delegation. Uh, in addition, New York City Department of Education is part of a consortium of the largest urban school systems in America, the Council of the Great City Schools. I have signed a letter with my colleagues across the country to Congress uh, requesting uh, uh, aid and uh, stimulus dollars, uh, and we continue to engage at the federal level um, almost on a weekly basis. Okay, thank you, Chancellor. Um, remote technology. The DOE purchased uh, 300,000 iPads to implement remote learning. The current estimated cost for these devices is, I think it's about $159 million in capital expenses and $72 million in city tax levy dollars. Um, we knew that the DOE had to purchase these devices for about a month before the release of the executive budget, yet none of these costs were reflected in the executive plan. Can you explain why they were not included in the executive plan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to ask our Chief Financial Officer uh, to uh, give you details on that. Lindsay. Sir. Um, so as you noted, Chair, uh, a significant portion of the cost of the devices was funded through um, capital appropriation, and we want to thank um, Controller Stringer for his quick action with um, our mayor to ensure the emergency appropriation letter was signed so, to support that. Um, and so I think uh, you'll see that some expenses are hitting our budget related to this, our expense budget, but most of this is in uh, the capital budget right now. And uh, a lot of the expenses occurred, you know, right before the, the exec budget was released on April 16th and are continuing through the month, month of April. Um, and so you'll see those expenses started to start to hit as we, as we move forward. But that's the main reason why it wasn't reflected in uh, the executive budget is it's in, in the capital, it's primarily funded by a capital appropriation. 
Well, I recall that because for years we were advocating for yes. uh, the purchase of iPads with capital dollars. So I'm glad to hear that it's finally happened. It came uh, at the right time, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know that's been an important issue for the committee as well, even after I uh, was finance chair and, and, and Chair Traeger took over. So, okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about one shots. In the fiscal 2020 budget, the city council negotiated for over 11.9 million in funding to be added to programs such as community schools, sustainability, urban advantage, the LGBTQ uh, inclusive curriculum, and diversity and integration initiatives. Actually, one of the things that I'm most curious about is that um, whether or not these programs, and particularly culturally responsive, sustainable education, as well as implicit bias training, will continue to be um, uh, implemented um, despite the budget cuts to the professional development budget. So um, these programs were not included in the 2021 budget. So can you point to any uh, performance issues that would support their exclusion? Why were they not included? So uh, Chairman Traeger, I mean, Chairman Drum, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share some thoughts and then I'm gonna ask uh, our Chief Financial Officer if she'd like to elaborate with a little more detail. Uh, all of the initiatives that you have uh, mentioned uh, are not one-off initiatives. We have integrated them into the very fabric of what teaching and learning is in New York City schools. So implicit bias training is not something we just do, it's part of how we look at the work that we do. So we've built capacity to continue to uh, have those kinds of sessions in-house. Uh, and culturally responsive sustaining education is not a thing. It is, it is a strategy. It is a, it is a pedagogy. It is what we do to the curriculum reflecting of who our students are. 82% of students of the 1.1 million students in New York City public schools are Black, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian. So we feel very strongly that what students read, what students study, the historical figures within the context of the, the time frame should be reflective of all of our students. That, that is what culturally responsive sustaining education is. So as long as we're learning and teaching in New York City, we'll be learning and teaching within a culturally responsive and sustaining framework. That goes the same for LGBTQ, where our students need to see themselves reflected in historical figures and historical time frames. So you, you're not seeing that as a specific item in a budget because that has been uh, included in the very fabric of what we do in terms of teaching and learning. Uh, Lindsay, did you want to add anything? I agree with you, sir. It's braided into a lot of different actions across the department between the Chief Academic Officers Department as well as uh, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson's area. Uh, it's blended within a lot of different initiatives um, and we use a variety of different fund sources also to uh, fund this really important work. It just concerns me because um, these are signature programs, I think, of this chancellor's um, tenure and um, something that I have also been fighting as an educator for for many years. Um, and I certainly would not like to see any of these programs pushed to the side because I think that they are, um, you know, um, it's extremely important in terms of the uh, direction that the school system is heading. And as I said before, these are stuff that we have not had before, so I don't wanna lose them moving forward. So I think there was a million dollars for LGBT inclusive curriculum. Can you commit to working with us to keep that million dollars in the budget? Yes, sir. Uh, we will continue to work with you in the, the manner that we've worked with you. We think it's important. We think it's vital for all of our students uh, to be supported and represented. So we, we look forward to continuing working with you. Chancellor, what about restorative justice programs? What are you um, thinking around that? I think we put um, 1.3 million in the fiscal 2020 budget, but it was not included in fiscal 2021. Um, you know, that also is extremely important and it requires a whole school effort. So um, are we going to continue with restorative justice training and practices. So Mr. Chairman, uh, 
similarly to uh, my response uh, around culturally responsive education, uh, implicit bias training, uh, our equity uh, initiatives, uh, restorative practices are part of the fabric of how we interact with our students. Uh, when so so that that we we see that now as the way we uh, work with students, the way quote unquote we do business. Uh, it's not a, a punitive approach, but it's a restorative approach in working with students. Uh, so that will continue to be in effect. Uh, we will not um, cut that. Um, in fact, we, we we've integrated it even more. We've also changed our policies. We've altered our chancellor's. Uh, uh, regulations to reflect a restorative approach. As you know, we've also, we also have a new memorandum of understanding with NYPD, which further uh, memorializes this approach that is restorative. It's, it's almost neighborhood policing uh, in, in, in schools. It's, 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 it's about relationships. It's about developing uh, the capacity to understand uh, what behaviors are appropriate and not re appropriate. And then, uh, to uh, to be responsible for those behaviors. So it is in the fabric of what we do and that will not go away. Um, thank you. Uh, that requires me to ask then, then um, are there any plans to reduce school safety agent funding? Uh, that has been a point of contention for the council for a number of years in terms of uh, the fact that we have more school safety agents than we do guidance counselors or social workers. Is there any plan to reduce the school safety agents in the schools? So, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, during in this budget environment, what I've said to uh, everyone is that everything is on the table. Everything is on the table. Um, but I will say to you that uh, having served as a superintendent in a number of different school systems across the country, uh, school safety is, is never an issue until it's an issue. Uh, and I can tell you visiting our rec sites, I can tell you right now visiting our school sites, uh, there are school safety agents on duty uh, protecting our sites, but also protecting our rec centers and providing a valuable service for us. Uh, but we continue to look at what that looks like within the context of the budget, within the context of the pandemic response. And as we get clearer uh, direction from our health professionals uh, and we start uh, thinking about what will in-person uh, learning look like? Uh, the question of school safety agents, as well as every other position in the Department of Education uh, is being uh, actually looked at in terms of how is the new uh, reality gonna look like when students come back to in-person learning. Thank you. Uh, let me just ask a couple more questions and then I'll turn it over to Chair Traeger. Um, significant changes have occurred in the DOE's executive budget and commitment plan capital plan due to a freeze on non-essential capital work across the state and executive and the executive plan shows a $500 million cut for school capital projects in fiscal 2020 and $388 million cut in fiscal 21. So what is the department's plan for revising the amendment to the five-year capital plan to align it with the current budget and to reflect adjusted schedules as a result of the pause? So, Mr. Chair, I, I will uh, give some uh, preliminary remarks and then I'll ask our chief financial officer to weigh in as well. Uh, but obviously the economic, uh, the, I call it the economic pandemic that is associated with COVID-19 uh, has changed the landscape uh, for all of us, including our capital budget. So as uh, we are trying to uh, model uh, what future learning is going to look like and what that environment will look like, uh, we thought it was only prudent to pause on the capital plan and the capital budget and reevaluate what that's going to look like. Uh, and that's why we, we did not bring it to uh, the panel for educational policy, uh, because we're actually taking a good look at what will this look like. And let me give you an example. Um, uh, whatever the recommendations are from our public health experts, uh, we know that uh, in September, we will probably have to be doing social distancing. And in uh, the very compact environment that are the schools in New York City, what is that going to look like? So do we need to do additional uh, partitions? Do we need to install certain things? What, what will that look like to be able to meet um, health guidelines? Uh, we don't know yet. So as we get more information, we thought it was only prudent 
that we pause so that we can evaluate what that looks like uh, and then build that into our capital plan. Uh, I'd like to ask Lindsay if she can add some more detail to your specific question about what is the planning process for the revised plan. Thank you, sir. Um, so I believe the SCA uh, met with some uh, council staff yesterday uh, along uh, President Grillo and um, folks from DOE to talk through sort of the specific future of the goals there. I think there's a lot to learn from community engagement. Um, we heard specifically from a lot of students at our panel meeting who very spoke very eloquently about their concerns for the capital budget. Um, and I think as the chancellor said as well, we have a whole new world in front of us. And I think there's a lot to learn from engagement. And I suspect the SCA um, during their capital hearing that you mentioned at the top, sir, will be able to speak more to the specifics and the next steps along those lines. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on and hold it. If I have any other questions, we'll get back to you on them, but I wanna move to Chair Traeger. But before I do that, I wanna say we've been joined by council members, Jonai, Rose, Kostelwitz, Ayala, and Rodriguez, and also by Majority Le uh, Leader Cumbo and Council Member Cornegy. So uh, thank you very much, uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Traeger. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, and just a quick note before I go right into my questions, I, I wanna say that the mayor said recently on television uh, during one of his briefings that next school year will have to be the greatest school year ever to make up for all the loss that our children have experienced and are still experiencing. And the proposed budget that he has advanced will devastate the next school year. And so as it stands, this is not a budget that's acceptable uh, to this committee. And we're gonna have to fight tooth and nail, uh, both at the city, state and federal level to make sure that we put more money uh, in, into, our, into our schools. Uh, the exec budget identifies a 100 million cut dollar cut to fair student funding, the most flexible form of funding available to schools, and an additional $40 million cut to school allocation memos. While we're still waiting guidance from DOE on how it proposes to implement these cuts, we know what these cuts will mean to our students and schools. It means larger class sizes, fewer enrichment opportunities, and fewer social emotional supports as teachers, social workers, and guidance counselors. It means trusted relationships will be broken as staff are accessed when students have already experienced so much loss. It means cuts to programs like art, music, sports, after-school activities, and academic enrichment programs. How do you propose to uh, implement these cuts? And as I ask that question, just wanna note, um, I and a supermajority of my colleagues have clearly articulated our guiding principle for evaluating this budget proposal. Our students have lost so much that they can never get back. We cannot impose more pain and loss on them by, direct, by cutting direct services unless we have turned over every other stone to find other areas to cut. What alternative cuts did you and your administration pursue before turning to school budgets? And as we are both former educators, Mr. Chancellor, we both know uh, what impact these cuts will have on day-to-day -day lives of our city students. In concrete terms, how would a child feel, directly feel the impact of a similar cut to the school support organizations or the borough offices, which accounts for about $300 million in the DOE's budget? I appreciate your answer. So a whole lot of questions in that <laughs> one question. So if I, if, if I forget one part, please remind me, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so thank you for the question. I will say I'm still an educator. I'm still educating and working in a school system. Um, but I will tell you as a teacher, I faced cuts my entire career as a teacher. Uh, as a principal, having to lead uh, two different school systems in two, two, two schools in two different systems, I had to experience budget cuts. Uh, they always impacted my students, my teachers, my community in devastating ways. Uh, there's a saying that says we can't just throw money at education. I wish just once in my 30 plus years as an educator, somebody would have just thrown money at education. We've never had money just thrown at us. So any cut is devastating to a school community. And I feel it deeply, as I know you do as well as a former educator. Um, I will tell you that uh, this, this budget um, 
is devastating to us in the, in the Department of Education. Um, I've said that uh, FSF uh, should be sac sacrosanct. Unfortunately, with this economic pandemic that we're facing, uh, there are hard choices that need to be made that have to be made at this time. Uh, and why it's so important, and I think the mayor has been very clear on this point, that we need federal stimulus money that comes directly to cities to uh, offset the economic impact that this uh, virus has had. Uh, the FSF cut uh, is never a good thing, but it's less than 1% off of the $10 billion base in, in our schools. Um, this is not something that we uh, are happy about. We have cut centrally, uh, as I've mentioned, over $6 million, uh, $600 million in, in my two years as chancellor. Uh, we have been taking pegs uh, and keeping them away from schools. What will students feel? I think you've been very eloquent that students are gonna feel uh, perhaps bigger class sizes. Students are gonna feel uh, the, the, the reduction in uh, services and reduction in uh, enrichment activities. Uh, I think that our communities are going to feel, uh, they're going to feel the impact of a, of a cut of this nature. But to your other question about how would they feel uh, the impact in borough offices? You know, New York City is a large system, and I'm stating the obvious. New York City is a large system. Uh, so it is impossible for anyone to think that everything that happens to support teachers, and administrators in schools only happens in the schools. Teachers teach and students learn and guidance counselors guide and social workers intervene and support, but they need supports as well. And that's what happens in the borough offices. And even during this time of remote learning, we have supports to teachers that are navigating remote learning in a very different way. They're being supported. They're being given coaching. They're being uh, supported in learning how to use uh, the, the virtual websites and how to develop uh, their Zoom capabilities and their Microsoft Teams capabilities. Teachers need support. Uh, it's not just a teacher and a Blackboard and a classroom. Uh, that's what happens at the borough offices. They're critically important to supporting our schools and what happens in our schools. Add to that the support to students with disabilities and the support that comes to them. Add that to our multilingual learner students. Add that to our parent engagement specialists that are engaging with our parent communities at this moment. There are no good choices in this budget. There are no good choices. And I am pained by this budget, as I know you are as well. Uh, however, these are the difficult situations that we're in given the economic impact that this pandemic is having. Mr. Chancellor, I, I, I appreciate the answer. I, I would just quickly follow up by saying that uh, what are the systems and structures going to be worth if you have fewer teachers to teach, fewer counselors to guide, fewer social workers to intervene? Uh, that, that has a, the most detrimental impact on a student's day-to-day -day life in, in a school setting, which they need even more social workers now, uh, more, more, than, more than ever. Um, if there are fewer direct service providers in our schools, uh, but there's no change in headcount at the central offices, there are fewer people to guide. Isn't that correct? Sir, uh, Chairman Traeger, we have not announced any layoffs. We have not announced any reductions in school-based staff. Uh, conversely, we have cut personnel centrally. And I just want to remind everyone that's listening that when you talk about central personnel, you're also talking about custodial workers. They're centrally funded. You're talking about food service, student nutrition workers. They're centrally funded. Schools don't pay for that out of their budgets. You're talking about support systems with students with disabilities. You're talking about 4410s. You're talking about early childhood. So central budgets, it's not, it's not a group of people at Tweed, and that constitutes the entire central budget. The central supports are always out in the school community. And I think our chief financial officer could even add a little more color to what that means. Lindsay, could you please uh, also add some uh, detail to that? Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, Chair Traeger. Nice to talk with you again. Um, so I, I think it's important to just note that the 
Pro offices that you're discussing, I think as we discussed last Friday when we spoke, is, are part of the central cuts that exist in our budget right now. They will feel the pain. They absolutely will. They will feel the pain uh, of the professional development cuts in our budget. They will feel the pain of the hiring freeze cuts in our budget. They will feel the pain of the um, you know, supply cuts and the all sorts of non-essential things that are being cut from our budget. They are absolutely going to be um, participating in those cuts. No one is being held harmless, unfortunately. Um, the cuts are just too large. So uh, please, uh, please note that I guess that, that just to remind you that they are part of, of these cuts. And so um, as the chancellor said, there are critical supports for these schools. Um, as you all know, huge school system needs a lot of individualized support from school to school. Uh, the BCOs absolutely provide that, along with the superintendent's offices, of course. Um, I just want to remind you that they are part of the cuts, they will be cut, they were going to continue to feel the pain, along with all of our central office team. So my next question is going to further specify what I mean by some of the central areas that, that I feel uh, you know, uh, deserves some more scrutiny. In fiscal year 20, uh, the council fought tooth and nail to ensure that the budget allocated uh, included $29.7 million in baseline funding to hire 269 new social workers, 100 bridging the gap social workers, 85 uh, school-based uh, crisis response clinicians, and 84 direct school-based social workers. The fiscal 2021 executive budget uh, identifies $8 million in fiscal 21 savings related to a re-estimate of 25 of these positions, which were never filled. Why has the department failed to hire all of the 269 social worker positions? We negotiated at the end of the last fiscal cycle and what support was provided to schools at the borough office and central levels to hire for these school-based uh, positions? So I will start and then I'll ask uh, either our chief operating officer, Ursulina Ramirez, or our chief financial officer, Lindsay Oates, to also add some color to this. Uh, so our most recent report to the council shows that schools, all schools do have access to a guidance counselor or social worker. Uh, in addition, we actively work to fill those positions. We hired 68 of the 85 school resource clinicians. We hired 79 of the 84 high needs uh, positions and 97 of the 100 budgeted. Uh, so we show there was about 25 that were not hired. Virtually all of the bridging the gap uh, workers are in place. Uh, so we think that uh, we've worked as hard as we can, uh, given the supply of these positions and people that are qualified to take these positions. Uh, and absolutely, more work to do to, to get to 100%. Uh, however, uh, again, candidates, the, the pool, and who's available uh, all factored into how we were able to fill these positions. Uh, Lindsay or Selena, did you want to add anything? Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger, for your question. So as the, as the Chancellor mentioned, we have uh, made significant uh, progress in the hires for these positions. Um, and uh, obviously we were not expecting uh, things to get this drastic in terms of COVID-19 uh, uh, earlier this, uh, this, I'm sorry, I'm getting a big feedback back from my phone. I'm, I apologize, one second. Sorry about that. Um, so we've, we've made uh, significant gains in hiring social workers uh, earlier this school year and, and Chair Trigger, as you know, I'm a social worker myself. I totally understand the need for social workers in our school system. Um, it's a huge priority for the system and for the chancellor himself. Um, we did support schools uh, in those hiring and, and when you talk about the borough support centers, that is what they were doing. They were supporting schools to make those critical hires. Um, and so uh, totally understand your concern around some of the, uh, the gaps that were or the hires that were not filled. Um, but that being said, we did hire most of those candidates. And so is there a freeze just so we're clear because there's been some confusion with OMB and others. Is there a freeze on school-based pedagogical staff? 
Trigger, yes. Um, we are in this fiscal environment. Uh, we have frozen uh, most positions. Obviously, we're a large uh, entity that still has to serve our students and community. So critical positions that need to be filled are being filled, but it's on a case by case as needed uh, basis. And when, when, when was that uh, decision made? Because OMB recently testified that there was no freeze at the school-based level. And now we're hearing that, that there is. Ursulina, Lindsay. So, Ursulina, do you wanna go? Uh, yes. So just uh, at the end of the school year, roughly around this time every year, uh, we put a freeze on hires, just to be clear. And that is really to, to make sure that we're taking a hard look at school's budgets. Um, and it's a, so late in the school year, we wanna just make sure that things are settled for the following school year. Um, that being said, for next fiscal year and next school year, of course we're considering hiring freezes. Um, and based on the budgets that we're seeing right now, we're gonna probably have to do a hiring freeze for all teaching staff. Um, and obviously if, if federal resources come our way, that's excellent and we can figure out a way to lift that freeze. But as of right now, uh, we are expecting a hiring freeze for next school year. So before I move on to the next question, just wanna make clear, principals have already been told, prepare for horrific budgets next year. Mm -hmm. If any teacher, anyone has notified them that they plan to retire, those positions will be very difficult to fill. And, and so, and also the mayor made a commitment to, for example, the renewal schools that 100% of their FSF uh, would always be preserved. And now they are facing a cut. So any of those new social workers, any of those new counselors, because we have a seniority system, those relationships will now be cut. And, and that is what many of our school communities are, are facing. I wanna move to transportation. Most bus contract operators are eligible to continue to receive 85% of their contract amount for days uh, since schools transition to remote learning. However, the tens of millions of dollars from this 15% savings do not appear in the financial plan. Beyond this, because the contract extensions were pulled from the panel for education policy, there is considerable ambiguity on what the DOE's plans are for school busing. Why haven't we seen savings for these contracts reflected in the financial plan or for the contracts which does not require payment uh, during closure and has the DOE arrived at a figure that they could share now with how much savings will be made, how much in city tax levy portion of the savings. Thank you, Chairman Trader. I'm gonna ask uh, our Chief Operations Officer, Lynn, uh, Ursulina Ramirez to answer. I, I did wanna just, uh, uh, just respond very quickly to uh, your last comment. Um, one of the things I learned uh, early on as a leader is that during a time of crisis, uh, I led Houston through Hurricane Harvey and it was the plain speaking, unvarnished truth to our leaders in the field that I heard they, they appreciated the most as we were able to uh, navigate that, that, uh, that horrific event. Uh, so I am speaking very candidly with principals. I am not sugarcoating a thing. Uh, I would be uh, less than genuine if I told them things will work out. We are facing the most horrific budget this school system has ever seen. And it is not just New York City, it's not just New York State, it's not just the United States. This is a global economic pandemic as well. So I appreciate, and I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I wanna be very clear with everyone that this budget is horrific. And revenue is down, there are cuts that will undoubtedly, if the economic situation doesn't change, will happen. And it pains me as an educator because I couldn't agree with you more, Mr. Chairman, uh, that these kinds of cuts are not helpful. They're not good for students. They're not good for school communities. But we also have to be optimistic, but realistic. Um, so if any principals uh, are communicating that we're scaring them, we're not scaring them. You, you need to have information to be able to make decisions. So I'm gonna ask our chief operating officer if she can answer the transportation bus question. Uh, thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Chair Traeger, for that question. Um, as we've discussed in, in some of our, our weekly calls, uh, we have stopped making payments to the bus companies as of right now, and we are considering all of our options when it comes to busing. Um, as you note, uh, uh, 
a lot of our contracts do have a provision within them that uh, requires a 85% uh, payment for snow days. Um, and as I've mentioned to you, we're taking a look at that provision and taking a look at all of our contracts. Um, just a reminder, we have 10,000, roughly 10,500 routes um, that we run, and we're trying to make sure that when school is ready to open, that we are able to provide services for all of our students. Um, but we're also, you know, as, as mentioned, we're in a really tough financial situation and trying to assess what, uh, what we can do right now um, while we are not in school and while we're not in session. So thank you so much for that question. And can the DOE provide for the record, what is the estimated number that can be recouped in savings uh, with the 15% callback provisions uh, for, for the remainder of this school year? Um, so for between April and June payments, um, and just a reminder, it is not a recoupment. It is, we will be paying an 85% rate. Right. Um, it's roughly around $74 million, uh, the delta between the 85% and 100% payment. $74 million that can be uh, an added lift and boost to schools uh, uh, during during this fiscal crisis. Um, I, I, I think that's important to have for the record. And what is the plan uh, as many of the bus drivers are still in limbo with regards to their health benefits, um, what is the plan that DOE plans to undertake to find these uh, savings while at the same time ensuring that bus drivers can maintain their health benefits? Um, thank you so much for that question. I think that this is something that weighs on our team heavily. Um, it is trying to both find financial solutions right now while ensuring that we can provide adequate services in September, while also caring for our bus drivers and knowing that this is a really tough time for them. So we're in conversations with bus companies right now, um, and hopefully we'll be getting back to you soon on what our, uh, our proposal is for the fall um, and, and how that impacts our workers. So we'll be back to you soon on, on that. And, and I just wanna make it clear for the record that I think there is a path forward to protect health benefits for the drivers and to find these areas like the $74 million that you talked about, which could be even more, uh, to redirect directly into school budgets uh, to stabilize the system because the system is interdependent. We need the drivers to make sure that we transport our most vulnerable kids. But if we don't have services in schools, what are they transporting them to? So yep. the system is very interdependent. I think the drivers will understand that and schools will understand that. And that's something the council feels very strongly on. I wanna move to, uh, uh, there has been uh, charter school rent, and then I'll turn over to, to, to colleagues for, for questions. The executive plan contains around $2.4 billion in charter school expenses, one of the largest areas of spending in the DOE's budget. Uh, spending on charter school leases increased by $45.5 million due to changes in the executive budget. What is the cause or increase uh, lease cost Towards the uh, towards the end of the school year, especially during uh, COVID, why weren't these costs known in the, in the prelim budget? And also, just to be clear, DOE's share of payment for charter school lease is tied to 30% of the charter tuition rate for each student. Success Academy Charter School Hudson Yards, which has 306 students, has a bi-monthly payment of $238,131, according to information the council was provided by DOE. Can you tell us how much DOE pays for its share of the bi-monthly leases? And this is space that Success Academy owns, which we're being told we have to pay for rent on a property they own at Hudson Yards. I, I'd appreciate your answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna ask our Chief Financial Officer, Lindsay, uh, to uh, address your question. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for the question. Um, you know, a couple things. Uh, first, I want to uh, say, you know, as we discussed last week, we're legally required to continue to pay for our charter expenses during this crisis. Um, that is includes leases. Uh, you mentioned the Hudson Yard example when we spoke last Friday, and we're looking into that. If what you're saying is true, that's concerning. We're, we're certainly going to share with you what we find. Um, hopefully have more information for you later this week. In terms of busing, one thing I just want to state clearly for the record is the $74 million that Ursulina mentioned a few moments ago is savings in fiscal year 20 only between April and June. 
we want our school system to be up and running as much as possible in the fall, right? as much as our health officials will let us to be. And we need busing to be running. That's an important part of our school system. That funding's not necessarily going to be available in fiscal year 21 to support anything other than busing uh, next year. There are some unique opportunities for savings this fiscal year because we've canceled, we've you know canceled non-essential activities and because we've closed schools. But I really just think it's important to note that those are one time only. We need those resources to run our fully functioning school system in the upcoming school year. So I hear you and that's gonna be a part of our discussions and negotiations, but these are the types of areas that we've identified some of the school bus uh, contract areas. And also, uh, and I think this is an area of disagreement or, but you know, some of the continued use of some Thrive consultants with, within our school system that some of them are not licensed social workers. And last year we had a fight like hell to reprioritize some of that money towards licensed social workers. So that fight will continue this year as well, because again, we must prioritize direct services to our kids. And with that, I'm gonna turn back to Chair Drum to call uh, and, and to our Sergeant uh, for additional member questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Traeger. Uh, we have also been joined now by council members Levin and Miller. And I'm going to turn it over to our council to uh, call on the first council member for questions. If any council members have questions for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You'll be called on in the order in which your hand is raised. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the sergeant arms to tell you when your time begins. The sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. We'll now hear from council members Adams, followed by council member Van Graham and Kalos. Starting time. Good morning, Chancellor, it's good to see you. Um, good morning to your team as well. Uh, this has been uh, an extremely difficult time. So um, I certainly do salute all of our educators who've been out there on the front lines. Um, well, I have a rec center or two in my district. The work has been um, very, very tough. It's been very tough to start up um, and it's been tough to keep it going also. So I commend all of our educators to your whole team for enduring through this uh, most unprecedented time. Uh, just have a couple of questions regard, uh, regarding um, remote learning and um, I had to go off and do a, a story time reading for the public library a minute ago. So that's why, uh, full disclosure, um, that I was off screen because I'm usually on screen the whole time. So I hope I didn't meet, uh, miss this. Uh, I hope I'm not being redundant. If I am, please let me know and forgive me. Um, we know that um, students have, um, they've missed a lot in this remote learning atmosphere. How is the DOE ensuring, um, I've heard the, the percentages over the past few weeks, but how are you really, really ensuring that, um, that the percentages of students who are actually getting the learning are actually learning? I'd like to hear a little bit close, more closely, uh, if you can, and just let us know how those percentages are arrived and how can you assure uh, parents um, that their children are really um, getting the education as closely remotely as possible during this time. Thank you, Council Member Adams, and it's good to see you. I, I, I continue to wish health and safety uh, for you and your family. Um, so what I've said to the organization since day one of our pivot into remote learning is that you, we cannot shoehorn the standard traditional in-person learning environment into a remote learning environment. That just doesn't work. So it's required us to be flexible. It's required us to be innovative. And it's also required us to be very patient. So because of that, uh, as many uh, of our council members have mentioned, I have tremendous faith uh, and, and trust in our teachers. So what we've done is we've issued guidance where we're asking teachers to be sure to check in on students on a weekly basis uh, for students that have not checked in because remember the digital divide as such, not every student had a device, but even in those cases where student, teachers weren't able to check in on a student, um, we have staff that has been following up with students that haven't been checking in. 
And the check-in can be many different ways. We have the technology to track student engagement by when they log in, how much time they spend in a given lesson, in a given classroom. We can also gauge by submission of uh, work that they've been assigned. Um, but I will tell you that I've had the opportunity to be a guest on a number of in-person synchronous classrooms where teachers are with a full screen, have all of their students and they're doing lessons with their students. Um, I just give a lot of credit to our teachers for really keeping a pulse on what's happening with students. That being said, and it, as imperfect as it is, we, we are gauging engagement and currently we're at 86% of our students, which is really incredible, are engaging with their teachers uh, on a regular basis. And we take attendance once a day uh, and, and, and we're logging that attendance. That being said, it's also more important than ever that as we're identifying where those gaps are, because we know there are gonna be gaps in learning, uh, teachers are uh, starting to document student learning needs. Uh, and as part of our grading policy that we rolled out two weeks ago, uh, the in-progress classification and the incomplete classification are the markers that teachers will use to identify students that need more time to master the content uh, that they haven't mastered yet. Uh, that is going to be important because we also are working through the formative assessment of our students so that we have real-time data as we transition into the summer and then more forward-looking as we transition into the fall, knowing exactly where the learning gaps are for each one of our students. So it's, it's all connected uh, and it's in many ways uh, very different and novel because we've never done this before, but we're trying to be as inspired as we can. Thank you, Chancellor. I, I wanted to thank you for your, your response. I wanted to get into a little bit more also about uh, 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 social workers and therapists in schools. And I really hope that my colleagues will delve into this uh, a lot more than I was able to. I know we're not going to get a second round here, a second bite of this apple. Um, but I thank you. Thank you, Chair Jerome. I didn't thank you and, and uh, Chair Traeger as well. So um, I look forward to um, more of your responses uh, through more questioning of my colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Councilmember Adams. Let's call the next council member, please. We'll now hear from Councilmember Van Bramer. Thank you. Um, uh, good to see you, Chancellor. Thank you, sir. You, you mentioned earlier in your testimony um, a little bit about the potential uh, uh, protective devices that might need to be installed, for example, uh, in schools when they reopen. And that was right along the lines of, of the, the line of questioning that I had. Obviously, September, uh, God willing, we're reopening. Um, and it seems like a long time away, but it isn't, as you know, from a planning and budgetary perspective. So uh, look, one of the things that's been most embarrassing about this country's uh, response has been our lack of testing, lack of PPEs, uh, the lack of supplies. So, are you now already planning? Uh, and what does your planning look like around, for example, having masks uh, for all of the staff? And of course, we're all concerned about this Kawasaki syndrome, uh, masks for the children even. Um, uh, extra cleaning, as I think you know, uh, uh, my stepfather was a janitor at IS-10 in Astoria, Queens. So I am very proud uh, to have been raised by a school cleaner and janitor. These are indispensable people in our public school system. Um, and there's gonna be extra cleaning needed and extra protection for those people who are doing that cleaning. Um, temperature checks. Um, uh, are we gonna have those devices? Are we gonna be doing things like that on a daily basis? Um, so uh, some thoughts on, on the planning that you're already doing around all of those issues and also the budgetary implications for those issues. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer, and congratulations on officiating that wedding in, in the backyard. That was, that was a, <laughs> a ray, of, ray of sunshine. Uh, so thank, thank you. you. So we are absolutely 100% in uh, scenario planning and modeling different scenarios, uh, very much along the questions that you're asking. 
Uh, one of the insidious parts of this COVID-19 virus is that it seems to be, uh, we seem to be learning more every day. Uh, when we uh, uh, initially took on um, uh, closing the schools in March, uh, what we knew in March was very different from what we now know in May in terms of this virus. Uh, the, the, the Kawasaki disease, for example, we have 53 children in New York City that are, are now suffering from, from that complication. Uh, so trying to plan for all those scenarios is really rooted in what the medical experts are telling us. But uh, to, to your questions, we are absolutely, um, we've, we've stockpiled uh, cleaning supplies. Obviously, we're not using all of our buildings, uh, but I can tell you the rec centers that I visited, uh, they are consistently and constantly cleaning everything. They're not waiting for one time of day. Somebody is literally going around with a spray bottle and a rag and spraying and cleaning yeah, the whole time. I think that is going to become part of the new normal. Uh, the guidance around social distancing, what will that look like? Uh, the guidance that the CDC put out around uh, school lunches, you know, students should eat in their classroom and not go to a school lunchroom. That was the original guidance. We're taking all of this information as part of our scenario planning and looking at what will that look like in an in-person learning environment. The other thing that I have to be honest about is that um, what we don't know yet is what I really worry about, uh, given the manifestation of this virus. Uh, what we don't know, we don't know yet. And we're trying to be very nimble. We're working with consultants that are helping us think through this, that have a global view of what's happened uh, with the manifestation of this virus. Uh, but I can tell you school safety, safety supplies, uh, cleaning supplies, uh, protective uh, gear uh, for students, staff, and all people are all a top priority in, in consideration of opening in, 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 in September. Great, um, that's good to hear. I wanted to um, also just talk very briefly in the last 45 seconds about uh, arts and education, which I know you uh, believe in and feel very strongly in. We know that when children have uh, arts and culture as part of their education, uh, the results are always better uh, for them. So uh, I just wanna stress the importance of that and also ask you about how DOE is gonna use uh, virtual cultural programming um, to make sure that when in-person programs aren't um, possible, that children are still uh, being able to uh, experience the arts uh, particularly our public school students who are uh, in so many cases and not having them available. Thank you, sir. So uh, absolutely, I consider, the arts, I consider the arts not to be uh, an addendum to the core curriculum, it's part of the core curriculum. Uh, and even in this remote learning environment, we have dedicated arts programming right now that is being done remotely for our, our students. Uh, that will continue and we have not made any cuts uh, to arts programming, even in the face of this budgetary um, um, pandemic. Uh, but we, we are dedicated to continuing to have the arts be a vital part of what our students experience. Thank you. Thank you. Next council member. We'll now hear from council member Kalos, followed by council member Gredenjic. Starting time. Thank you to Chairs Drum and Traeger for your leadership and to Chancellor Carranza, DOE teachers and staff for adapting to the pandemic and to more than 60 that lost their lives. Today I'm concerned with proposed cuts that will only drive costs, like skipping an oil change only to replace a more costly engine. The number of questions in only five minutes, so please, if you can, spend no more than 30 seconds answering each question. As one of two parents, both of whom are working more than full time, we feel the stress of balancing work with childcare. We won't be able to return to normal without access to childcare. Wouldn't you agree that scaling back the role at a 3K for all to school districts in Manhattan and throughout the city will reduce access for families to employees, employment and put children who have fallen behind because of the pandemic even further behind? We are in a global pandemic and an economic pandemic. I'm, I'm always willing to listen to their ideas. Um, these are hard cuts for everyone, and unfortunately, they're reaching even the most fundamental uh, programs that we believe in, like 3K. We're not cutting 3K, we're just not expanding, we're pausing on the expansion. 
Similarly, Mayor de Blasio is proposing cuts to SYP and you're proposing cuts to Sonic after school. What will children do between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. while parents are working or traveling home? Uh, again, this is about access to economic opportunity and getting people back to work. Yeah, so again, we're working with our city partner and some of those programs are in different agencies around developing alternatives. Uh, we are also engaging the philanthropic community uh, and seeing if they can be of assistance during this time of need for the children of New York City. I appreciate that we're doing the quick back and forth and respecting the time. Uh, I, I would just say that this is my tax dollars, our tax dollars, and we should be paying for the programs versus turning to philanthropy. I welcome the philanthropy but uh, we should pay for it. DOE has a multi-billion dollar contracts budget. I'm the contracts chair. Uh, both our finance chair and education chair brought up a number of the different contracts. Is there an opportunity to first cut all of our contracts, multiple billions of dollars? I know we're looking for hundreds of billions of dollars, but could we stop spending externally before we start cutting internally? Uh, sir, so I think it's, it's important uh, to note that uh, contracts are not bad in and of themselves, that you have to have contracted services to serve students in some regards. Uh, so without specificity of what contract and what it's serving and what, what that impact would be on students, uh, it's kind of hard to answer your question. I'd like to ask my ch chief financial officer if she could also expand a little bit on that. Lindsay? Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Councilmember Kalos. So just as a reminder, some of the things that we do spend our, our contract budget on include our community schools program, nursing, um, custodial supplies, nursing supplies, food, transportation, um, you know, related services for our students. Those are all things I think that are critical to running our school system. Um, IT obviously is a big area that we spend money on, as you're well aware, but that is supporting our critical response right now. Remote learning is critically supported by all of that. Um, we are looking at reducing contractual spend. That's part of the existing executive budget. We are always looking at more, but there are critical services that are provided by our contractors. Would you be open to sharing the contracts that you're considering canceling or not moving forward with in order to save money, as well as the contracts that are under consideration, but you chose not to move forward with so that we can work with you to evaluate? We can absolutely get back to you with more information. Perfect. Uh, and let's just jump into the technology. So I guess big question right off the top is Chancellor Carranza, will skills, schools open in September? Yes, no, or planning for the best, but ready for the worst? Yeah, uh, none of us have a crystal ball, so we don't know how this uh, virus is going to continue to metastasize uh, out, out in the community. We are shooting for a September opening. That is our goal. That's what we're preparing for. But we're also preparing for any other eventuality. Again, we're going to be guided um, in those decisions by what the medical professionals tell us and what's safe and secure for students, staff and community members. Thank you. And so I'm going to do my best to finish in 30 seconds, but I just diving into the technology chair drums gone in to the DOE's $231 million spend on 300,000 iPads at a cost of $770 each, which is almost twice retail. We're now on the hook for $36 million a year just for the internet. And this isn't fast internet. This isn't broadband and none of these devices have keyboards. Do you believe that having kids on slower speeds without keyboards is equitable? And would DOE consider I'm saving a quarter of a billion dollars by distributing $100 or $200 laptops and working with Spectrum or LTs to deploy free broadband to all students, giving every student a laptop and uh, using the free service during the pandemic and then Internet Essentials, which I negotiated with Attorney General James, to continue at $14.99 a month and a huge cost savings over the emergency procurement. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councilmember uh, Kalos, so... Um, I disagree with the premise of your question, um, very respectfully. Uh, when we transitioned and pivoted to remote learning, there was an immense digital divide. We'd never, we, we did not have the time for a year long procurement process. Uh, we had to work with uh, entities that could provide us the devices in real time. Uh, and we found 
people that would provide us with those devices. I mentioned earlier, we've, we've delivered over 280,000 devices to children that didn't have those devices. Now, those devices are equipped with, those iPads are equipped with uh, internet capability. So there's a chip that's installed that gives them internet capability. They have a hard case and we also purchased insurance for each one of those devices. We think that's important from an equity perspective because we did not want any student or any family to not uh, ask for a device on the fear that something, if something happened to that device that they would uh, somehow be held responsible for that device. Uh, again, in real time uh, addressing this crisis, uh, I am proud of the work that this organization has done to get devices into the hands of our students and, and our most vulnerable students. But as always, and again, I really appreciate your thoughts because we want to continue to improve how we're serving our students and what that looks like. So happy to partner with you on additional partnerships and what this looks like as we continue to uh, move into the next uh, chapter of this school year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next uh, council member, please. We will now hear from council member Gudenchik followed by council member Brandon. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Oh, chairs. oh, I'm sorry. Good morning, chairs. Can you hear me? Yes, I hope. Uh, good morning, Chancellor. Good morning, Ms. Ramirez and Ms. Oates. Um, I do want to, uh, at the start of my remarks, associate myself with Chair Traeger. Um, having lived through uh, more than one budget retrenchment uh, as a student and as an adult in New York City, I am very, very concerned about um, the fact that when we cut the budget, it's usually the people that actually provide the services in schools, that being uh, teachers and paras and social workers and guidance counselors and food service workers who end up getting cut, not so much the bureaucracy. So um, I think that really, Chancellor, um, we need to know what the plan is going forward, um, considering a worst case scenario uh, was mentioned before by you that the governor is threatening, threatening um, billions of dollars more in cuts. Last week, we heard from the OMB director, uh, Ms. Hartzog, and it seems to me that the city's plan is to hope for more money from the feds. But um, that really isn't much of a plan um, because it may not come. And we need to know and we need to know exactly what your plans are. I know it's not easy, but we do need to know what they are so that we as a council and the residents of this city, 8.6 million of them, with over a million children in public schools, can have a chance to look at that plan and hopefully uh, make it better. Usually the more eyes on something, uh, the better it is. That doesn't always work. So uh, my first question, we've heard about fair student funding being cut. And I'd like to know from you exactly, sir, uh, will it go below 100% in the schools where it is currently above 100%? Not that I have too many of those schools in my district. Yeah, so I'm gonna ask, uh, I share your concern, uh, council member. Uh, again, budget cuts are never helpful. Um, and, and, you know, we- in the I know you share my concern, but I'm not gonna get seven minutes like Kalos got. So can I, uh, <laughs> can I, um, can I hear about fair student funding? Well, you're going to hear my response. Okay, I mean, I'm thank you. Response. Uh, I don't sell widgets. I don't produce revenue generating product. So we are dependent on what the state and the city provides us to run our schools. Agreed. So give you a, a detailed plan without knowing the fi finality of what that financial plan looks like is impossible. We're preparing for all potential uh, eventualities. I'm going to ask our chief financial officer uh, Lindsay Oates to uh, specifically address your question. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, council member. Um, so there are multiple ways that we can implement this cut across the fair student funding formula. We're exploring all of them. It may include schools over 100%, but we're looking at other options. Um, we're looking at how best to you know, minimize the pain and have this be an equitable cut. Um, those are conversations that are going on between our office and uh, our city partners. And I think there will be more to come soon on that topic. Okay. I agree with the chancellor that these large cuts coming at this time of year makes it particularly hard for, for us to think about about the upcoming school year. Um, but we are we're doing the best we can uh, under these really trying times. Okay, I, I want to thank you for those remarks. I do want to say that with regard to uh, the school safety officers in my schools, I can't vouch for uh, all the schools, although I, I have 35 schools in my district and I visit them all the time and I miss that right now. 
I want to say that they are outstanding professionals. Uh, they're mostly women and mostly uh, women of color. And if you want to get into one of my schools with trying to get past them without talking to them, good luck to you because it's just not going to happen. Um, they are consummate professionals, each and every one of them. Um, I know most of them on a first name basis. And even then I still have to provide them with an identification card. Uh, they take nothing for granted. Um, I do want to uh, thank you all for your work. I know it's, it's not easy. Um, uh, I am concerned also, we did have a, a very a good discussion yesterday with uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallach about screening uh, for middle school and the screens and, and, and those in place. Um, I, I do want to associate myself with, um, with uh, the remarks made by my Senator, my state Senator, John Liu. I don't think that this um, is a time to make great changes. I understand that some changes may be necessary. Um, I have great middle schools, I have great high schools. I do worry, of course, that uh, to get to uh, the Stuyvesants of the world, uh, any Stuyvesant graduates here, nothing, uh, no, no ill will intended uh, from Eastern Queens, it, it would be easier in some cases to go to Suffolk County uh, as opposed to Manhattan. So um, I, I hope that you will tread lightly and that whatever plans that you have, you will cast as wide a net as possible um, in re reaching out to uh, our CECs, our PTAs, and uh, really all of us that are involved in the education of our children. And again, I think- Time expired. You. Time expired. What about, no, I'm only kidding. Thank you. Thank you. Next council member, please. We will now hear from council member Brandon, followed by council member Landard and council member Gibson. Starting thank time. you, Chairs. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Um, I think all of my colleagues are pretty eyes wide open when it comes to the dire fiscal reality that we're in. Um, uh, and I echo what everybody is saying and certainly what all parents and teachers are, are telling me directly that safeguarding funds for uh, the day-to-day -day functioning of schools and school communities must be number one. Um, with all due respect to my former colleagues at Tweed, um, I think we should take a good look at um, the amount of employees we have, central, the central office administrators. I think there's something like $6 billion that we're spending just on central office staff. Again, with all due respect to my former colleagues at Tweed, I'm sure we could find some savings there. As Chair Traeger mentioned, the mayor does like to say how next year uh, needs to be the most extraordinary school year in history. We all agree with that. Um, I think we have to make sure that in order to have the most extraordinary school year in history, um, that we're safeguarding funds and making sure that teachers have all this, uh, the, the, this, the tools that they need for students to catch up with uh, in September. One thing I'm hearing that I, I would love to get you to, to, to clarify, hearing a lot of concerns from parents um, about the emergency grading policy that was put into place for the emergency. Um, a lot of rumors out there, a lot of, lot of theories out there. Uh, would you be willing to, to, to clarify that this is just an emergency grading policy and, and not a trial balloon for anything else? Thank you, council member. Absolutely, this is, this is a response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and our transition to remote learning. Uh, everyone, uh, I think, understands that this is not the normal way that school has been uh, conducted. Uh, so you can't have the normal grading system, especially with uh, the digital divide and getting devices to students and not everybody had them at once. So this is a response to this pandemic. It is not a change in policy. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next council member, please. We'll now hear from council member Landred, followed by council member Gibson and council member Barron. Starting time. Chancellor and uh, Ursulina and your team, thank you so much for being here. You know, we appreciate what an extraordinarily difficult time this is. And, you know, I remain grateful as a public school parent to see what's going on in my, my daughter's classrooms and in seeing the extraordinary work that so many of our teachers uh, are doing. Um, I want to, you know, associate myself with some of my remarks of my colleagues, and I'll just add, you know, I've been making very clear that if we can't afford to hire new teachers, then I don't think we can afford to hire new police officers either, um, and I'd like to see some of the couple of hundred million dollars that we currently have allocated for that brought back into the Department of Education to abate some of these devastating cuts, 
And I also just want to continue to push to say, I think there is more we can find from the borough support offices and, and from some other places uh, within the DOE hierarchy to help restore some of these devastating cuts to schools. A um, couple of questions for you. Uh, you spoke with uh, Chair Drum at the beginning about the work on social and emotional learning programs and restorative practice programs. Last year, you and the mayor's office really pledged, developed a great plan to do more to work on and improve school climate. And obviously right now, those programs provide just transformative tools to students to help them process and cope with pandemic related trauma. Um, I was glad to hear you say that those programs are being maintained. Can you just help us kind of find them in the budget? Um, I know our allies and young people worked hard to preserve those. And just we want to see them in the budget, be able to see they're not being cut and make sure we know how they're going to continue. So can you kind of help point us out, point them out? Thank you, Council Member. Um, I'm going to ask our Chief Financial Officer to uh, address that question, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, member, uh, Council Member Lander. So I just want to clarify for the record, uh, the previous comment from Council Member Brannon, uh, the $6 billion reference uh, to the central budget is just inaccurate. Uh, that's a number pulled off a state report that uh, includes an entirely wider net than just our central budget. Our central budget is around $615 million in the upcoming um, fiscal year, the current um, $6 billion number includes things like leases and safety and community schools and contracted related services and things that really are um, central supports to, to schools and not, uh, not tweed, certainly. Um, uh, so I do uh, take your point on, on, you know, looking elsewhere outside of school budgets, which is something that we have a strong uh, track record of having done. And we've cut our central office uh, quite a bit over the last several years, um, and we will continue to do so. There are significant budget cuts to central offices um, in this executive budget. Uh, I, I want to give uh, Councilmember Lander a little additional time since your um, answer was more directed toward uh, Councilmember uh, Kalo, uh, Councilmember Brannon. So uh, let's give him some a couple of minutes back on the clock, please. Thank you very much, Chair Drum. And I wonder, uh, uh, CFO Oates, if you could just answer that question about where in the budget we see the uh, restorative practice and social and emotional learning programs so we can feel reassured that they are being preserved in this, in this budget. Sure. So there are a variety of funding sources that are used for that. Um, and I think, you know, I think we want to be, you know, we are, we, we're facing huge cuts. We're prioritizing uh, services to our students, um, and you can see, you know, you you can see the list of the itemized cuts that were published, and you can see that social emotional learning and restorative justices were not included in that rather itemized list. Um, you know, I think for my part, we are um, have to unfortunately look at all areas, um, but we do have some uh, Title IV funding that is federal funding that provide some uh, support to those programs. And we, as the chancellor said, are gonna continue to try to ensure as much as possible, these really successful, important programs prioritized by our chancellor continue and, and yourself and many others of this body continue to support. All right, I appreciate that. And maybe let me just ask if you guys will follow up and you know, it's, it's obviously not having not seen them on the cuts list is helpful. Being able to kind of see them in the budget is also helpful. So if you can help us really identify and understand where those are um, and I guess also know if you're thinking about continuing any of those uh, into the summer as remote summer school gets stood up, you know, how, how we're going to, you know, they're just extra important. They were important before and they're extra important amidst the trauma that the pandemic is, um, uh, is providing. And then um, so my other question, Chancellor, is for you and, uh, you know, it might, might be the sort of uh, the, uh, different point of view than Councilmember Gradenchik uh, outlined, but I would like to ask you to talk a little bit through the question of how you're thinking about admissions for next year. Um, you know, I do think a, a crisis like this really can help us focus on what we think is most important and sometimes make us question things that we've been doing a long way, a long time for a certain way. And as you know, we move to middle school admissions, especially for next year, but high school admissions as well. We're going to be doing it all doing it in the shadow of this very difficult semester where we've had to realize that like 
in a lot of cases, the kind of traditional grading rubrics we have used aren't actually what matter most to helping students show, uh, show up and grow and learn and thrive. And, and that's a useful way of thinking about what's important and how we'll do middle school uh, admissions, especially in high school admissions as well next year. It's important to get feedback on that and ask people their perspectives and try to design something that makes sense for next year, but also that we can learn from. And I, I just wanna ask you to kind of share with us your thinking and, and how we're gonna move forward from here. So thank you, yes. So we have already started a, a public engagement process where we're actually getting and gathering feedback on what the admissions will look like. If, uh, if you remember when we transitioned to remote learning, uh, the first thing that we had to do is uh, have guidance on a new attendance policy because we're not in face-to-face -face contact with students anymore. We did that. The next thing that uh, was important is when, the next thing that was important is that as we knew that we were going to finish this academic year in remote learning, we needed a grading policy. We took feedback, we listened to lots of different voices, and we came out with a grading policy. Throughout all of those iterations, I've been very consistent in saying uh, that we will not hold against students uh, anything that is beyond their control. Uh, and a pandemic is beyond their control. So we, we're not gonna use the attendance, we're not gonna use the grades because we all understand that the grades aren't the grades that students would have gotten the first half of this school year. Uh, so as we're doing the, the work of crafting what the, the admissions policy will look like in light of the, the seriously disrupted year this year, uh, we're gonna take a lot of feedback, but we're gonna be very conscious of making sure that that's not, uh, it's not inadvertently hurting students for things that are beyond their control. But I'm really excited to hear what uh, the community has to say and what their ideas are. Uh, I will tell you, just like the grading policy, uh, it's not probably not going to please everybody, but we want to have something that is going to make sense as a response to the pandemic and the interrupted school year. Uh, but we're not out looking to create policy uh, in the face of a crisis. That's not what we're looking to do. We just want to be fair and um, equitable to all students, uh, given the trauma that they've gone through this year. Okay, very thank you very much. We're going to go to our next council member's question. We will now hear from council member Gibson, followed by council member Barron and council member Moya. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chancellor and the DOE team. Thank you to Chair Drum and Chair Traeger and all of my colleagues on the call and certainly many New Yorkers who are watching. Um, I echo the sentiments of all of my colleagues and really, you know, understanding the harsh impact that COVID has had on the city of New York, certainly on my borough chancellor of the Bronx and school district nine, which I know you know a lot about. And you know, the decisions we make over the next few weeks are going to have a real impact. I think we have to ensure that this budget is reflective of our values of breaking down the school to prison pipeline and making sure that we focus on social workers and guidance counselors, the social emotional learning, the trauma informed care and the holistic and wraparound services that our children and their families need. Our children and families have been traumatized. Many of us are traumatized, right? Um, because we've never dealt with anything like COVID before. So I am reminded of the importance of education, of academics, of making sure that our students have everything they need. And I know that this process has not been easy. So certainly I thank you and all of the educators and principals and teachers, the cafeteria workers and custodians, the crossing guards, everyone who really has been going above and beyond, sacrificing themselves to really help. So I had a couple of questions and I apologize if you already asked, but today's current role and the responsibilities of our school-based health center providers, our school nurses, our social workers, and our guidance counselors. Um, I wanna understand what guidelines we're giving them for the summer, for summer learning in terms of teleconferences and telecall. How are we checking up with families and their day-to-day -day needs as we prepare for a hot summer? My second question is the coordination with DYCD on summer learning and youth programs. You know that we are fighting like heck to get summer youth employment and summer camp for kids. But what is the work that DOE is doing with that? Um, I am very concerned like many others about FSF, 
We fought hard for that, fair student funding, bridging the gap, social workers, and I definitely want to understand how we move forward with that. Also want to add my voice to Chair Traeger and others who spoke up about our uh, school bus drivers. Many are not working. We want to protect their benefits. Many of our essential workers, including bus drivers and patrons, as you know, Chancellor, are people of color and women and women of color. And so these are the front line, some of the lowest paid workers, and we have to do everything possible to protect them. So if you could just give us an understanding of where we are with a lot of our social support staff, the summer learning, the interagency coordination with DYCD, and how we move forward and assure New Yorkers that we are going to prioritize students' needs and not more policing in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, so our, our guidance counselors and our social workers are hard at work right now. One of the things that I, I like to remind uh, the community, I don't have to remind you, but the community is that school was never out. We just pivoted to a new learning and teaching model. Uh, so we've been in school these weeks. Our guidance counselors, our social workers are being deployed in, in supporting our students that are in crisis. But they've also been very housing, uh, and they're they're being they're they're out there finding kids and working with students uh, in, in trauma. The plans for summer learning are in development right now. We'll have more to share in terms of details very very soon. Uh, again, we all understand that uh, what uh, we're going to be guided by the medical professionals and what we can and can't do, and that that only pertains to things like. Can we be in person or can we have blended environments or can we have what what those are the type of logistical but very important operational questions that uh, we're working our way through. We will have we have multiple scenarios of share that with you uh, very, very soon. Uh, the other question about interagency collaboration and coordination, we are absolutely working in an integrated way with our sister agencies. And what we're really trying to do at the direction of the mayor is to make sure that we are, um, we are adding value to each work stream. So in other words, uh, we always try to coordinate, but this summer in particular, we want to be able to really break down any silos that exist and how do we use a little funding from there, a little funding from here, and how do we create that support system for our students, uh, particularly uh, over the summer months? Uh, and then how do we address the summer learning needs of our students that have lost instruction? All of that is working uh, very, very, I would say very strategically, uh, but we're gonna have more details to share in the very, very future. Okay, great. And then as my time runs out, I just want to urge you to continue to work with a lot of our stakeholders. Um, I, sometimes I find it troubling and during COVID where we have agencies that are making decisions and then the council members are told after. We have to have a system that's more engaging because the school providers and the CBOs on the ground are working with our children every day, all day. And there's a continuity of services. And particularly in communities of color, low income and immigrant communities, there's a relationship that's already been established. And understand that when we talk about the impact that COVID has had on children, it's also their families as well. Everyone's been touched. So when you talk about being traumatized, it's real for us, particularly in the black and brown neighborhoods, when we're dealing with so much death and pain and frustration, the remote learning in itself was a challenge just to address that. So I definitely think we have a lot of work to do. And please don't forget about my school bus drivers. They are emailing me consistently, Chancellor. I'm sending those emails to you and your team so that we know how hard that, you know, they're working and how we need to continue to work together. So I thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, Ursulina, and everyone on the call. And I look forward to the next few weeks. It's not going to be easy, but certainly we have to recognize that this budget should not reflect harsh education cuts that are going to have a negative impact on our school districts, our teachers, their budgets, and overall our children and their families. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for your relentless advocacy and your leadership. And we have a lot of work to do. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Our next council member, please. We will now hear from Council Member Barron, followed by Council Member Moya and Council Member Rodriguez. Time starts now. 
Thank you. Uh, push up another two minutes so that I can get my extra time as well. Uh, I want to thank Chair Drum and Trega and Chancellor Carranza and his staff for being there. I also want to say that I extend my condolences to all of the Department of Education victims of the novel coronavirus. And I want to thank all the DOE staff for the work that they're doing in this very difficult trying time. As you know, I was a member of the Department of Education in various capacities for 36 years. Chancellor, your theme for our uh, system is equity and excellence, and that's a goal towards which we are working. And I just want to be sure that as a part of the pedagogical approach that teachers are going to make sure that it's incorporated so that we can see a reflection of the culturally responsive education, the restorative justice, and the social emotional learning. So I've got a lot of questions, and if you could do that quickly for me, I can get to my other questions. Thank you. That is absolutely continues to be uh, one of the cornerstones of our approach. So uh, everything we're doing instructionally, pedagogically, curricular wise uh, and materials wise is based in culturally responsive and sustaining education. Good. And as we talk about uh, making sure that our staff has the tools that they need, I have been forced into the world of Zoom at a rate that has been astronomical. What are we doing to make sure that those and staff members who have not been technologically at the top of this peak uh, are now getting the support that they need to be able to be competent in reaching our children. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the supports uh, are coming from our borough offices. Uh, so the specialists, our, our art team, our academic response teams, uh, that's the work that they're doing. They're, they're identifying, working with principals to identify teachers and staff members that need additional support. And then they get the, they get the coaching. Uh, so we're going to continue to do that because we think it's really important to build a capacity to continue in this remote learning. Thank you. The phrase we're all in this together applies that there's some kind of equality for all of us. And that is not the case. We know that we have been in a system of systemic racism since black and brown people have been here. We've gotten less than anybody else and we've gotten the least in our communities. And historically, that underfunding has been in black and brown communities, and it was highlighted by the CFE case for which we have still not gotten the monies that we are entitled to. So as we talk about the fair student funding, will every district get the same percentage for the students that they have in their districts? Uh, so my understanding, we're working through that implementation of that peg right now. So I'm gonna ask our chief financial officer uh, to answer that question for you. Thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, here, here on the CFE uh, case and not getting that funding. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, we are, as the Chancellor said, and I have testified previously, looking at how to equitably distribute this cut with our with our city partners, and there will be more to come in the future. Okay, I hope to hear that everyone will get the same percentage. Yes, it's going to mean that some people who have gotten more than 100% will now have to come down and share that burden. And uh, Chancellor, I'm very much interested in how we're going to meet. You talked about focusing on the highest student, highest need student population, and certainly that special needs students. What are we doing to, to accommodate them, students that perhaps had three adults giving them individual attention? What are we doing now during this process? So this has been one of our uh, biggest priorities, Council Member uh, Barron. Uh, so we've prioritized every one of the students and their families uh, has, has uh, had an IEP meeting where we've uh, uh, revised the IEPs uh, to fit this remote learning. Uh, we are providing daily um, interaction with students that's synchronous. Uh, we also uh, are providing uh, teletherapy to some of our students. Uh, we are also uh, working with our partner agencies and partner organizations to provide whatever support students need. Uh, okay. I, got, yeah. I have two more quick questions again. Good. I've always believed that education should be a continuum from 3K through post-secondary education for at least the first two years of college. So there was a program, uh, the linked program, where the DOE was working in collaboration with the uh, higher education CUNY system to provide assistance to children, to move them in, give them remediation during that first uh, transition into college. Are we gonna be able to see that program? And since my time is running out, in, in, case, in cases where students will be returning to school in September, hopefully, how are we going to institute 
distance, social distancing uh -huh. in a classroom that has overcrowded numbers registered? Yeah, so two good questions. I'll do it very, I'll do the last one first and then I'll, I'll answer the opinion question. So that is uh, at the crux of what we're doing in our scenario planning uh, right now. I referenced it earlier in my testimony. We're working with experts that are helping to guide us on, on what that looks like. I will tell you the short answer is it's very difficult uh, in, in schools, period, but in New York City particularly because of how our buildings are set up and the age of our buildings, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's a number of things. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I'll give you just a taste of what it could look like. Do we then bring all students back at the same time? Or do we have a phased approach? Do If you have one school, do you then implement a cohort model? In other words, uh, three groups of students. One group, uh, group one goes to school on one day, groups two and three participate in remote learning. Uh, the next day, group one stays back with group three, and then group two goes to school. And then the third day, group three goes, one and two are home doing remote learning. Is that something we could do? Uh, is it, is it, could there be shifts? So there's an AM and a PM shift. Uh, all of those things are being explored and all of them have uh, real serious benefits and serious, serious downsides. But we're trying to be prepared in all of the models that we're putting forward based on what the medical advice uh, um, would, would eventually look like. Uh, in terms of the, the, the supports, we do, we, we are continuing to have college access for all programming, uh, of which the program you mentioned fits into. And we are, we are desperately trying not to touch that at all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to get to that equality that we want to talk about, the equity that we want to talk about. Thank you to the chairs, uh, Drum and Traeger. And to all of the people who worked to put this together, thank you so much to those technical people. Thank you very much, council member. We'll now go to our next uh, council member for questions. We'll now hear from council member Moya, followed by council member Rodriguez and council member Lewis. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Chair Drummond. Uh, thank you to Chair Traeger. Uh, Chancellor, good to talk to you today. Um, you know, I just wanna uh, go with some of the uh, questions that uh, Council Member Barron was talking about, because I've been talking to a lot of the parents in school districts uh, 24 and 30, where I represent and share with, with Council Member Drum. You know, we, we are probably the hardest hit uh, district in the entire city uh, due to this COVID-19. Uh, their concerns have been coming up that a lot of the material that is uh, being self-taught, uh, they feel that there's very little support um, for some of the most needy students, and those are the students with uh, learning disabilities and ELL learners. Uh, and even with the related services that are being provided, uh, we know that it's not the same thing as, as being in the classroom. And so uh, is there a plan in place to, to compensate for the lost time and the possible regression for some students that may be experiencing this? Uh, and if the remote learning does go beyond the summer, uh, what steps are being taken to support uh, students with uh, learning disabilities, ELL, and especially the parents uh, who don't have the command of the language to really teach their kids? Uh, is there something in place? I know that you started talking a little bit about uh, the students with disabilities, but if you can get into that a little bit more and also for uh, ELL learners, that would be that would be great. Thank you, council members. So uh, I, I, we are very much aware of the challenges with remote learning, particularly on the impact it's had on parents because parents have been thrust into the, into the role of being uh, not only breadwinner, but, but teacher. So we, we understand that we, we, we have done a number of things. We put out a survey on remote learning, which we got incredible feedback on. We learned a lot from what people told us, uh, students and parents told us were some of the gaps and some of the challenges. So we are implementing some, some solutions, some uh, alternatives based on that information. We have also put out very specific uh, resources and guidance on our Teach Hub, which is where teachers can log in for resources and curated uh, um, virtual material uh, specifically targeted to differentiating instruction for students with disabilities, but also for uh, working with students that are multilingual learners, uh, ELL students. So teachers have resources, principals have access to those resources as well. In addition, we have our borough specialists 
that are pushing in and they're pushing in at the request of principals and teachers uh, to provide additional support in helping to develop intervention plans for students that are multilingual learners. Uh, and then our special education department uh, has been all hands on deck in terms of providing uh, more and more resources to meet the needs of students with disabilities. It is part, it is central to our planning for summer uh, students with disabilities and multilingual learners. We, we consider them to be, <clears throat> in this environment, some of our most uh, educationally fragile children. Uh, so we are planning with them in mind about how we're going to enrich their learning, uh, build in time for, I don't call it remediation, I call it enrichment, uh, and trying to really serve their needs given the experience that they've had this summer. Great. Thank you, Chancellor. I just want to uh, thank uh, Allison Avila, who was the PTA president from uh, IS uh, 227 in my district uh, that really brought this uh, to my attention. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll now go to our next council member. We'll now hear from council member Lewis, followed by council member Rosenthal and council member Rose. The time is starting now. Good afternoon, everyone. And I just want to thank uh, Chairs Traeger and Drum for organizing this Zoom. And I just want to thank the Chancellor, Chancellor um, Caranza as well for taking the time to meet with myself and my colleagues last week to address matters regarding the digital divide among Black and Brown communities in Brooklyn. Um, most of my questions were answered already. So I want to thank my colleagues um, for raising a lot of the concerns that we're getting from our communities and the school communities. So I just have some follow-up questions regarding some of the questions that were already asked. Um, regarding the 5 million in cuts to Sonic and after-school programs, Chancellor, you mentioned that you, your team is working on asking the philanthropic community uh, for assistance. I just wanted to know what was the actual ask uh, to the philanthropic community. Um, you also answered a question regarding the delays in 3K. I know that East Flappish and Brownsville was supposed to get some additional uh, 3K programs this year. So I wanted to know what was the actual definition of delays and a pause? We hear it often, but we don't know what that means. We don't know the time frame um, of the delay or the pause. So if you could please address that as well. And regarding the digital divide and tech and remote learning, um, I wanted to know if we would be prepared for summer school remotely and for the fall, as we're still trying to figure out what school, what uh, the school year is gonna look like, will we have enough devices for all students by the fall? Um, and those are my three basic questions. So thank you so much. Thank you. So in terms of the philanthropic ask, we've asked uh, philanthropy to uh, help ensure that some of these proposed cuts if they could cover these cuts uh, during this uh, financial uh, downturn for the city. Again, being optimistic, we, we are optimistic that uh, once we are past the co the, this is pandemic, that uh, the, the economy will, will jumpstart again. Uh, but absent that and absent any federal stimulus funding, we, wanna be, we don't want students to feel that, that cut. So we've specifically asked on a number of programs uh, different philanthropic uh, uh, potential funders if they would consider that as part of their portfolio. So we're in active discussions with them. Uh, I, I will be just uh, very apologetic up front to say that uh, it would be it would probably not be diplomatic for me to mention the names at this point because I don't want them to feel unduly uh, pressured. Uh, but I will tell you that we're having some very positive conversations. The pause in terms of 3K is really about the current situation that we're in. Uh, the mayor believes strongly in early K, in, in, in pre-K and 3K, as I do as well. That we, we have data that shows they've been game changers in terms of the opportunity gap. Uh, it, it pains us to even uh, consider not rolling out the, more, the plan that we had, but the pause is just that. It's not a cut. We're not cutting programs, uh, and we're not going to uh, do away with the commitment that we've made to uh, have these programs roll out into new communities. What it means is that given this particular budgetary environment, we can't roll out this coming year, but we definitely have the goal of next year being able to, or even if, if things change drastically, as soon as we're financially able to do that, even before next year, to actually uh, fulfill that promise that we made. 
Um, and then in terms of devices, we currently have uh, in the hands of every student and family that has requested a device, we have put a device in their hands. And what we've done is in our purchasing, we've also allotted for the fact that not everyone is going to fill out a survey. Not everyone's going to make the phone call and let us know that they need a device. So we have our parent engagement specialists. We have our parent coordinators. We have our, our principals, our teachers, our social workers, our guidance counselors. And as they identify students that perhaps hadn't uh, filled out a survey and let us know they need a device or hadn't called that number. As we're finding folks, we're getting devices into their hands as well. So we, we feel very confident at this point uh, that everyone that has asked for a device has a device and we have devices in case somebody's device, you know, we, I know of a per, I personally know of a case where a student had their device, they had their own computer and it broke. So that student wasn't part of the original count. They called and said, hey, my computer broke. Is there one for me? Absolutely, we got, we got a device to them. Um, so we're gonna continue to keep our eye on that because as we stay in remote learning, that is a huge equity issue. Okay, our next council member, thank you, council member Lewis. We will now hear from Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Rose and Councilmember Ayala. Time starts now. Got it. Oh shit, gotta go. Bye. Okay. Folks, just a reminder to mute yourselves. Thank you. Hi, Councilmember Rosenthal. And she needs to be unmuted. Okay, Councilmember Rosen, up. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilmember Rosenthal. Great, appreciate it. Appreciate all your time, Chancellor. Really have the patience of a saint. Um, I, I wanna ask two quick questions. Um, first is, given that the state is likely to cut our education budget again, uh, within the next two weeks. I'm wondering if your financial team is continuing to look through your central office um, budget with a fine tooth comb, looking particularly at the consulting contracts, number one. Um, and secondly, an issue that uh, so many people have talked about, uh, if you're looking at the nature of procurement and if there's a way to um, just bring down costs uh, in those areas. Yes, ma'am, thank you for, the, for those two questions. So we are absolutely continuing to look uh, uh, through all of our budgets uh, and, and in particular, uh, you know, our, our consulting um, budgets, our professional development, um, we're looking at all of them. And I've been very clear with the organization that uh, everything is on the table. There are no sacred cows. Uh, we are absolutely looking at everything uh, in the Department of Education. Uh, has anything jumped out at you if you, as you've started to go down that list? Are there specific things that have jumped out that you've said, you know what, we're going to take a cut here and some that were lower, lower hanging fruit? Um, there is starting to emerge some, some things that everything now is painful. Um, but there are things that we, we've done because New York City has been a progressive school system uh, for a number of years that uh, we, we are actually looking at what are the must-haves and what are the good-haves. So, you know, the good things to have and the must-haves to run a school system. We're definitely in that, in that sphere right now. Um, I think it would, to add a little more detail to, uh, to your question, I'd like to ask our chief financial officer, because she's really in the weeds doing this work right now, if Lindsay could, could add a little bit more detail to that. Lindsay Oates, could you unmute her, please? While we're waiting for... Oh. Hi, um, everyone can hear me? Yes. 
Great. Um, so Council Member Rosenthal, I know you are a fellow lady of finance and I appreciate your questions. Um, I want to say that we are really hard at work on the procurement side. Um, our senior executive director, Charlotte Hamamjian, is, is working with um, MOX, the law department, and many other areas to learn what other city agencies are doing. Um, one of the things that um, we are looking at and actively negotiating with many of our vendors on you are voluntary price reductions. So we've started that work with some of our largest vendors. We have vendors who are agreeing to this, and that I think is um, a big step in the right direction. Um, my understanding is that this is work that happened after Hurricane Sandy, which was very successful for the city the last time we had a major um, economic downturn and crisis. And so we're gonna continue to do those kinds of things, uh, but point well taken, and we are absolutely looking for, for savings there. Well, I'm going to move on uh, to a second area, but you know, if you could come back to the council with a list of the the savings areas with that level of specificity, I think that'd be really helpful. And even if you want to categorize it the way you're talking about it here, the must-haves, lucky to have, mm -hmm. um, you know, to sort of categorize it that way so that the council can see um, how you're looking at it. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, and, and I'm just going to add the way that Laney Hameson and others unearthed the contract that uh, was so completely overpriced was by looking harder at the way the RFP was written. Um, and the way the RFP had been written on that computer consulting contract was um, really landed it in the hands of a single provider who then was able to charge as much as they want really for the service once they had the monopoly. Um, so, you, you know, it's that kind of fine tuned mm -hmm. details that I'm hoping you'll look at. I only have five seconds. Uh, Chancellor, if you would consider putting out surveys at the grab and go sites, I'm wondering if you're, you would consider putting out some surveys about whether or not people would be wanting their food um, via the, the grab and go meals or via a bag of groceries. I'm wondering if that's something that's possible. And secondly, whether or not at the grab and go sites, you would consider putting out information about domestic violence and how people can be seeking help that is available to them if they would just um, know that it was available. Is that something you can, you can do without a lot of money? Yeah, so we will definitely um, look into what that looks like and, and absolutely consider it. I would just share that uh, as of, uh, and I, I think they're both good ideas. We just have to see how physically, operationally, we could actually do that. Um, I visited some of those grab and go sites, and I'll tell you that as of right now, we have served over 10 million meals since uh, March 16th when we re pivoted to remote learning. 10 million meals. And mm -hmm. we're been amazing it's in every single one of those absolutely what we have to move along yep. thank you very much thank we'll you. follow up later yes okay next council member please we'll now hear from council member rose followed by council member ayala and council member rodriguez the time starts now thank you thank you uh chairs drum and traeger and um, I just want to thank you for your commitment to the young people and, and education. Um, I want to thank all of my colleagues on this at this hearing today for um, your questions, your support, and your articulation of the importance of SYEP, Summer Sonic, Compass, and Summer Camps. Um, Chancellor, I'm sure that you um, that you have uh, had an earful in terms of how important summer programming is for our young people and how committed this council is to making sure that they are getting services. But uh, another thing, this pandemic has exposed the historic inequities that are suffered by many uh, New York communities of color. And it's exacerbated the negative economic realities of our most vulnerable youth. 
And one of the barriers to um, remote learning for our older students has been the need um, for them to work to support their families in light of the economic hardships suffered um, during this pandemic. These students may not um, earn the credits that they need this term, and they will need to participate in summer school, likely through remote learning. So um, has the DOE um, thought about possible summer options? And have, have you considered a summer program that would include both a remote work-based learning component with a stipend and a credit recovery um, a component so that these students can actually find a way to earn money and, and get their course credit um, this summer? And, and if not, uh, how are you going to engage the older students this summer who really need to work to help um, their families through this economic um, crisis and, um, and help them get their uh, course, their course credits. So council member Rose, uh, thank you very much for, for bringing that up. Um, I've been meeting with a number of community-based organizations and elected officials, and this particular idea has been raised uh, uh, in the last week and a half. Uh, so my team is actually exploring what that would look like and how we could actually bring that to scale within a summer environment. Part of the complications with our planning for summer is that we just don't yet know what medically we will be able to do in the community, whether it's in person or does it need to be remote? So we're really trying to plan for both eventualities. If it's remote, what does that look like? If it's actually, we can do some in person with appropriate social distancing and all the precautions, what does that look like? And then also, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, uh, working with some uh, philanthropic opportunities to be able to fund this. Uh, in this in this particular time. So it's a great idea and we're, we're uh, kicking the tires to see what that could look like. You know, um, Chancellor, I just want us to remember that many of these same youth are the ones who uh, were already disadvantaged and behind. And so um, when we're looking at programming for, um, for summer uh, SYEP and to try to make up for, for the losses of this last um, three months, we have to include, we have to make sure that these support services are in place for these young people. And I just want to make sure that we do this equitably. You know, um, we had a, a rec center that was only open four days and our essential workers were not able to access the rec center so that they could continue to go to work for, um, uh, to, because economically they needed to do that and as essential workers. So when you're looking at resources, um, I, I wanna implore you that you need to look at it um, with a different eye and making sure that um, the inequities that we said we were going to, the mayor said was going to be addressed are truly being addressed and that the communities that need these services most are actually in in the whole formula and and get get the resources. So um, please, and when you talk to the philanthropies about subsidizing some uh, youth jobs, please ensure that um, you impress upon them how important it is, because you know how how important it is, and that DOE and SYP and DYCD is gonna put the monies into these, these programs. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, I, I have to ask a clarifying question. Mr. Chancellor, you just stated something that's new to me and I'm the education chair. Uh, are you telling me that the Department of Education is putting together an SYEP program this summer? No, sir, is that I correct? Said, no, no, what I said is that we're exploring opportunities uh, to have some kind of a program where students can remotely uh, participate in job experiences and get paid for that. Uh, we don't have the funding for it yet. Uh, we don't have the programming for it yet, but this is as a result of a number of conversations that I and my team members have had with a number of folks around the city. Uh, so we're exploring what that could look like. So I just wanna clarify that no IEPs have been changed. 
because you can't legally do that without parents at the table. Uh, what has possibly changed is what you can provide from the IEP in this remote setting. Uh, so I just wanna just state for the record that if there have been certain changes made in terms of IEPs without parents notify being notified, that's against federal law. Absolutely, it's against federal law. And that's not what I've said, sir. I said that we've adapted IEPs. In some cases, you can do that virtually where parents have agreed to be part of a virtual meeting. Uh, just like we're all on Zoom today, you can do that. Uh, so again, I don't want my comments to be misconstrued. We are following all of the federal laws, but we are also working to serve the needs of our students with disabilities. Thank you for allowing me to clarify. Right, and just, just note, and then I'll turn to my colleagues, that if a student is falling behind because of remote learning right now, I am concerned about how and what changes folks can make virtually in the summer. Um, we keep hearing about the number of kids who responded to the survey, but thousands of kids also did not respond to the survey. And those are the thousands of kids who are still having difficulties and challenges adapting. So I'll turn it back over to my cause. I just wanted to clarify for the record that IEPs cannot be changed without parents and that where accommodations might be happening now is a different situation. So thank you and let's, let's move forward. Thank you, Chair Trump. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wanna clarify for the record as well that IEPs are not being illegally changed, that we are following the rules, we are following the, the law and that we are adapting in full communication with parents. I just wanna be very clear um, that, that that is what is happening. Okay, our next council member, please. We'll now hear from Council Member Ayala, followed by Council Member Rodriguez and Council Member Amphrey Samuel. Time starts now. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself. Good afternoon, chairs. Good afternoon, Chancellor. Um, I am really uh, concerned, I guess my question is really relating to the uh, social emotional needs of our young people. Um, as a parent, you know, I am at home, with the exception of today, I escaped, um, but I am at home every single day with my children and my children are, you know, 14 and 18, so they're a little bit older. Um, but, you know, even in that age group, I'm witnessing, you know, some of the, uh, the anxiety and even borderline depression, I would say. And so I wonder, given that we're working remotely and that there's really no, I'm sure that teachers are communicating with parents um, via phone, but there's, there isn't that face-to-face, -face, right? So that interaction um, that we're used to. So when a child comes to school and is, is there's something a little bit off about maybe, you know, um, the way that they're behaving that day, it becomes pretty evident to the, to, to the, to the educator at that moment. Um, and in light of, you know, not having that, um, anymore. What I, I just, I'm concerned about uh, our kids and I wonder what is the DOE doing today to ensure that the social uh, emotional needs of our children are being met and how does that relate to how we are preparing for a fall where we're having children come into a school setting after months and months of being um, away and, and really suffering from traumatic, you know, a humongous traumatic experience. Yes, so uh, Council Member Ayala, you, you are absolutely um, articulating one of, our, one of our concerns that we're working through. So we are continuing, as I've testified earlier, we are continuing to have our guidance counselors and our social workers working with students, uh, albeit it's remotely, <clears throat> but having that interaction. Uh, we've also, uh, part of why we've asked our teachers to be uh, checking on students and have a, a check-in with students, especially students, uh, finding students that have not checked in in a while is because we want to be very cognizant of what their needs are as well. In addition, uh, Deputy Chancellor uh, LaShawn Robinson and her team are continuing uh, to provide resources on our Teach Hub and Learn at Home uh, site, resources for teachers and parents that are guidance uh, around uh, attending to the social emotional learning needs of students, trauma-informed practices, trauma-informed uh, interventions uh, for our teachers. Uh, so again, what we're trying to do is braid uh, the academic 
resources with the social emotional learning trauma informed resources that our teachers have. Um, this is a very difficult time for everybody. I, I know I know for a fact as well that uh, our students are, are are undergoing trauma and our parents are undergoing trauma. And what makes it even more pernicious is that at the same time, the people that are teaching the teachers and the principals are also suffering from trauma as well. So we're trying to provide as many resources as we can uh, right now, but we're also uh, being very, very clear about how that is going to continue into the summer, into the next school year, because I can tell you from my experience leading my community through Hurricane Harvey in Houston, that the effects of trauma are not evident immediately. The effects of trauma start manifesting themselves anywhere from six months to two years after the traumatic event. So we have to, we know that this is a long-term commitment that we need to make to make sure that our students and our staff and our communities are being well supported. Thank you. And we'll now go to our next council member. We will now hear from Councilmember Rodriguez, followed by Councilmember Ambry Samuel and Councilmember Cornegie. Gracias. Gracias, Canciller. Eh, creo que nosotros tenemos una gran responsabilidad. Eh, la brecha en Nueva York entre lo más rico y lo más pobre se demostró ahora. Yo creo que cuando decimos que el trauma afecta a todo el mundo, eso es relativo. Porque si bien es cierto, cualquier padre puede haberse afectado, pero los hijos de la familia que viven en lugares más pobres son los que han sido golpeados. I feel that the coronavirus has shown the face of New York City, a city bay, built based on systematic racist society. It is true that the coronavirus doesn't discriminate, but if the parents send the kids to the school, that they can raise a million dollars, that the PTA raise a million dollars in those school districts, they will have to deal with some type of drama. But it's not a same thing, Chancellor. Uh, those families of the PTA cannot raise one dollar. So what is the plan that DOE has right now to use poverty as we will have to take tough decision on cutting funding so that funding will not affect the poorest neighborhood. I mean, the students who live in the poorest and overcrowded neighborhood. Señor miembro del Concilio Rodríguez, muchísimas gracias por la pregunta. Con todo respeto, lo preguntó en español. Yo le voy a responder en español también. Uh, yo estoy de acuerdo que eh, eh, es, es, este crisis ha afectado a nuestras comunidades, especialmente las comunidades de color, uh, de una manera que no es igual. Entonces, eh, estamos viendo esto en todo lo que está pasando y nosotros estamos enfocados en asegurar que los recursos, los apoyos que son necesarios para los estudiantes que han sufrido uh, por generaciones en nuestra ciudad, uh, no tomen eh, el golpe de, de financiero de esta crisis. Uh, so, Council Member Rodríguez, again, I want to thank you for your question. It's, it's, it, your question speaks to the heart of how we're approaching trying uh, to grapple with this, uh, this budget crisis. Uh, we agree that equity is important and we agree that there have been, this crisis has uh, really brought uh, into the sunlight in a much more powerful way the, the inequitable experiences uh, of our communities of color. Uh, when you just look at the effects medically that this pandemic has had, a disproportionate impact it's had in communities, our African-American community, our Latino communities, uh, our Asian community. You can see that it's had a disproportionate impact. Um, earlier in my testimony, I testified uh, about uh, the FSF and, and the, the cut that we have to make to S FSF. Our chief financial officer talked about really looking at uh, an equitable way of implementing that PEG. Uh, that is one of the ways that we're looking at. What are the communities that are most impoverished? What are the communities that are most disproportionately and historically underserved? And how do we implement this PEG not on the backs equally of all of those but much Chancellor. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the answer, but I feel it is important, and, and I know where your heart is, but I think that it is important that the DOE designate fund 
to heal the mental traumas of both children and parents that we know from research can prevent the learning and especially the English language learning. As you know, 42% of the students, they're Latino and they close to 40% they are American. So among the English language learning, who are those who live in the poorest one? And as you know, more than 50% or around 50% of the 42% Latino, there are English language learning. So how can we get the DOE to work? I know where your heart is, but to get the city to look at those families and designate additional funding to those families for themselves, for the students, and for the mental health that will, they will need a lot of hope after this trauma. Yeah, so again, uh, our, our guiding principle is making sure that we're serving from an equitable perspective all of our students, and in particular, our students with disabilities, our multilingual learners, and those communities. Uh, uh, so as we are planning for how we're going to address this budget, that is a central, fundamental piece of uh, our planning process. More to come. Okay, my my, more my to last come. question. Uh, sorry, my last question because of the time. Is the quality of food served? to the community, at uh, the school, the same in the middle class as in the poorest neighborhood? Yes, sir. To, to my knowledge, there's no, there's no different uh, uh, menus for different parts of the city. It's, it's all the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, excuse me, I want to go back to Councilmember Ayala because I didn't realize uh, she was still wanting to question uh, and she has a couple of minutes left. Is Councilmember Ayala still here? Sorry, did you have additional questions? Yeah, I just had one question. It was around the census and wondering what and how the DOE was working with parents to ensure that they were completing the census. Chancellor, you're not unmuted. The time again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so we continue to put out guidance around the census to our families. Uh, we've also uh, asked our parent coordinators to continue to disseminate information about taking the census. We're working with uh, the city agencies in, in, in getting that information out as well. Um, so we, we had a very robust plan of parent meetings and, and PTA meetings and back to school nights, which uh, a big wrench got thrown into those plans with, uh, with the move to remote learning. But we are still working and coordinating with our sister city agencies to get that word out. Okay, thank you. And now we'll go to our next council member. We will now hear from council member Ambry Samuel followed by council member Cornegy and council member Powers. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chancellor, and thanks, Chair Drum and Traeger, for your leadership. Um, my questions were related to summer programming and addressing the mental health needs of our children, as well as the census question. So my colleagues did a great job at um, addressing those concerns. So I have one um, last question, and it's it's about the school safety agents. I know that a few of my colleagues spoke highly of our school safety agents and everyone knows that my mom is a retired school safety agent. She retired three years ago. Um, and I, I actually have to right now just, um, you know, just continue to uplift the families of the school safety agents that did pass away um, during this time. But you mentioned city agencies working in silos in the past and that your goal is to be able to add value and lend your voice in the multi-agency discussions. So with that being said, there have been widely publicized instances of violent social distancing enforcement by NYPD, and um, more recently an announcement that the school safety agents are being deployed to enforce social distancing. And I would say that I prefer to say healthy spacing and not social distancing. Social distancing gets up under my skin because we are a social people. So I yeah. prefer to say healthy spacing. Um, but in light of this, are you involved at all in conversations around the school safety agents and their role in the months ahead? And have you been able to lend your voice with the um, mayor's office, the city administration, as well as NYPD or even um, 
Teamsters Local um, 237, um, where the school safety agents, um, you know, they're members of that particular union. So have you been able to, to be a part of those conversations and lend your voice because they are so, um, you know, important inside the school buildings and to what DOE is doing? And so I just want to hear your thoughts to find out what's going on with um, healthy spacing conversations. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. Uh, uh, just very quickly on the census, because that was one of your questions. We are also distributing information at all of the meal hubs about the census as well. So we're trying to really get the word out there. And I forgot to say that on the last question. Uh, but uh, the mayor has charged all of us uh, agency heads uh, since the beginning of the city's response to COVID-19 that we, are, we all wear the same uniform. We all work for the people of New York City. So that means that we are going to support each other and we're going to work across uh, the, the perceived uh, silos that exist in our agencies. Uh, we've seen that in a couple of ways. Our school nurses are uh, very hard at work uh, providing uh, services at our rec sites. But there are also a number of school nurses that at the height of uh, the, the, the community spread were actually deployed to hospitals all across the city and were supporting and augmenting our hospitals in, in responding to uh, the COVID-19. Uh, I will just say to you that uh, there may be members, senior members of my team that have been involved in those conversations around school safety agents, uh, but I have personally not been involved in those conversations. Uh, school safety agents uh, serve in our schools, they're, but they're actually employed by the, New York, the NYPD. Um, but I haven't personally been involved in those conversations, but it would not surprise me uh, only because of the example that I shared with school nurses uh, going out and serving uh, in, in other areas where the city critically needed them as well. I can tell you that uh, my experiences with school safety agents as I've been able to go around to these rec centers has been absolutely amazing work that they're doing. Uh, they are not only keeping our schools safe, uh, but I've also seen them uh, as well wipe stuff down and, and be very, very uh, cognizant of students wearing their masks. And if they don't have their, their face covering, giving them a face covering. Uh, so I, 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 would, I would expect that even in an assignment around um, uh, safe distancing, uh, that they would bring that kind of uh, care uh, to that assignment as well. Okay, I just wanted to, um, as I close, um, to say that it's unfortunate that you are not part of those conversations because um, your experience and how you see like the work that the school safety agents are doing and also just your, um, you know, just being creative on other types of work that the school safety agents can be doing inside the buildings or just around the buildings or working with families can be critical. And to um, not have that love, that voice in those conversations can be detrimental at times because if the administration is not speaking to the elected officials and they're also not speaking to the heads of agencies about the people that work in those spaces, right. we are really missing out. And so I would just encourage, you know, just the opportunity to be able to hear what's happening and be able to give your own suggestions about the folks that work in your buildings and see how they can be um, best utilized because there are other people that can do what um, the administration has planned for school safety agents and not the SSAs themselves. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next council member, please. We'll now hear from council member Cornegie, followed by council member Powers and council member Levin. Time starts now. Councilmember McCornegie, are you there? Why don't we move on? And if he comes back, we'll put him back in the lineup. Will do. We will now hear from Councilmember Powers, followed by Councilmember Levin. Time starts now. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm not seven feet tall, so I can't do a Robert Courtney impression, but uh, uh, thank, nice to see you. And I hope everybody is hanging in there. And I wanna thank everybody, uh, all our teachers, principals, parents, everybody who's working 
uh, over time right now to make sure that our kids are getting educated. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in even at, at this late moment. Um, Chancellor, I had two questions. I mean, I think that most of my questions have been answered, but I wanted to ask two that uh, I didn't hear asked, but I, I will stand corrected if uh, if I if they were asked. Um, one is um, it just you know we're we're learning a lot of lessons around COVID right now, and what particularly about how to utilize remote learning in the future. And I'm wondering if that if you see this applying anywhere ahead, whether it is around uh, summertime, snow days, or other ways that one might utilize remote learning in the future, and whether any lessons around that and or challenges. Uh, and the second is, um, I, I was reminded by somebody in my staff um, uh, yesterday around the fact that as the schools are closed, that perhaps um, uh, there would be an opportunity here to do a number of the capital projects or construction that is intended or planned for by, uh, by the DOE and the SCA. Um, but some limitations obviously right now of construction. Are schools able and are they going under any construction right now? Is there a plan to do that? And do you see this as an opportunity to do some of the infrastructure uh, 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 changes to the schools that were intended or anticipated? Thank you, Councilman Powers. So uh, I, I'll answer the first question on remote learning and then on construction, I'm going to ask our chief operating officer to uh, give you a little more detail on that particular question. So uh, obviously, this is this is a, a, a horrible experience for everyone. Um, this is a very difficult experience. This is the first pandemic in our lifetimes that we've had to experience uh, in this way. But it, it, it has provided us with some opportunities that I think we need to seize and continue with. One is the, the digital divide. And we, we've been able to, as I've testified today, put a device in the hands of, of every student who said they want a device. Uh, our teachers have been able to build capacity, knowledge on how to use technology in a very different way. In some cases, teachers were already doing this in very creative ways, but in other cases, they've developed this capacity to teach and have additional ways of teaching that we shouldn't lose once we go back to in-person instruction. Uh, I'm very optimistic that we will continue to develop this capacity uh, and that teachers will be able to use these skills to augment their pedagogy as we go back into face-to-face -face learning. Uh, I also think that students have become uh, much more independent learners, uh, not because we want them to only be independent learners, but they've had to really adapt. And that's part of the trauma, but it's also part of the capacity that they've built to be able to learn in a different format as well. All of those things uh, I see being a part of any future uh, schooling that happens in our city. Uh, I think it's just an incredible opportunity to add to what students are able to know and do. I'd like to ask her, Selena, if she could address the construction question. And before she does it, I just, the one, the one I'm asking is because we also know about it, like how during the summertime, for instance, how many students, you know, may put down the pens and paper, pencils and paper and, and, uh, and not be learning over that time and uh, divide in that as well. And I wonder if they, at some point in the future, we could be seeing even optionally parents be able to, you know, tap into digital learning and remote learning as a way to, you know, help reduce that. Um, Absolutely. But, yeah. and I'll, but I'll take Ursulina to take the second question. Ursulina? I think she needs to be unmuted. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that question, Councilman Powers. Um, so as, as you were aware, uh, the governor and the mayor put a pause to all non-essential construction so that caused uh, the, a lot of the work done by SCA although we did the SCA just restarted doing uh, I would say started working again on the new tools that we're developing that will add additional capacity uh, for September so that work has started in terms of uh, the facilities team we're doing uh, what we call life or I should say you know life and safety work so think about that as um, you know fire extinguishers things along, along those lines but if it's not essential, we're not doing it. Um, and they're doing a lot of the maintenance work, painting, waxing, stuff that they would be doing uh, when the school is closed in the summer. Okay. Well, you guys perfectly timed your answers because we're at five seconds. But thank you. Thank you to both chairs for giving me an opportunity and, uh, and best wishes to everybody. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I believe that we've come to the end of the council member questions. I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Chancellor. 
Steve Levin is still looking. Okay, sorry, Steve Levin. Council Member Levin. Can Council Member Levin, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, uh, so I just wanted to, and I, I apologize if, uh, if, you've, if you've already covered um, this topic in your testimony and, and uh, responding to other council members' questions, but um, how, how exactly are we tracking um, students that are not participating in remote learning right now? So at the current moment, we, we're having, uh, our guidance is that teachers check in with their students uh, on a regular basis. Most teachers are doing that on a daily basis. Uh, we also have the ability to track when, uh, when uh, students have logged in. Uh, then we know that they're, they're engaging and we have the ability to also do some tracking on when they've submitted assignments or posted assignments as well. So those are kind of the, 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 three, the three main ways that we're tracking if students are engaged. Um, and uh, what are we seeing right now in terms of um, remote learning engagement? So just in terms, like in terms of class time, um, what is the range? Where, what, are, what are we identifying as particular challenges? Um, where is it successful? Where is it less successful? Um, yes. So those are great questions. Uh, we currently are tracking about 86% of our students are engaging on a daily basis, which is phenomenal. Uh, it's not regular attendance like we would take in, in a face-to-face -face, uh, situation. But one of the things that we've done, and I keep referring to guidance, is that uh, how that remote learning looks and feels is going to different from school to school, teacher to teacher, even within communities, it's going to look different. So the guidance is that teachers are daily, on a daily basis, checking in with their students, uh, and that they are, at, to the extent possible, having synchronous lessons with their students, which means the teacher is on the screen, the students are on the screen, and there's an interaction. For a myriad of reasons, that's not always possible, but that's the guidance that we've put out there, and many teachers are actually doing that. Uh, but we, we are seeing just a variety of different ways. Some teachers have morning sessions with their students. They have morning day breakers. Some teachers have office hours in the afternoon. Uh, any possible way you can think of teachers interacting with students, we're seeing that happen in, in, in this remote learning um, time period. Are you seeing um, greater success uh, by particular um, uh, grades? Uh, some grades that are on, on balance um, having a better result than others? Older kids, younger kids? Just generally speaking, I would say that we are seeing uh, much more active engagement. Uh, not much more, but we're seeing more consistent engagement at the high school level, uh, particularly with our high school seniors. But, uh, we're seeing much more active engagement. Middle schools are very active as well. What I'm really excited about is that at the elementary school level, uh, especially the earlier years, kindergarten, uh, first grade, second grade, uh, we're seeing much more uh, active synchronous teaching with teachers working with their students. At the older grade, we're seeing a little bit more of uh, assignments are posted. Teachers have office hours. Students can check in on that. Um, so it, it really depends range of different kinds of engagement um, data. Um, I mean, I, 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 uh, I really just want to acknowledge all of the parents out there that are um, participating in this. I have, I have two kids that right now that are younger than school age, but um, the prospect of, of engaging in remote learning with them and, um, and doing uh, what I have to do as a you know, I'm fortunate to still be working at this job. I think it's, uh, you know, to those parents that are, that are doing all of that at the same time, my, my, um, I, I'm just astounded at, at the, the, their ability to do that. And I, I want to acknowledge that because um, they're now, they're now acting as teachers themselves. Um, and obviously to all the teachers that are uh, doing this, um, and taking on this unique challenge at this time um, that they never anticipated. Um, 
you know, it's uh, my hat goes off to them as well. Last question, um, Chancellor. Um, uh, th at the grab and go sites um, where uh, we are uh, um, uh, giving food out to New Yorkers who need it, um, at the moment, I don't believe that the menstrual products are part of that um, uh, assortment. Is that something that, that is within the DOE's um, uh, portfolio, or is that, um, is that somebody else's portfolio? Uh, council members, so during the in-person uh, education experience, those products were available to our students at all our schools. With the, trans with the transition to remote learning, I'm happy to say that uh, we've heard that feedback. Uh, our team's been working hard on that. And uh, absolutely, starting next week, uh, those products will be available at, at grab-and-go sites. So we've heard the community, and, and I want to thank the team for working so hard to make it happen. Okay. Thank you so much, Chancellor. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I um, have uh, two more. If, if Councilmember Carnegie is there, did you want to ask a question, Councilmember Carnegie? Just give him a minute to be unmuted. And Councilmember Rivera, are you there? Councilmember Rivera, no, and Councilmember Carnegie. Okay, thank you very much then. Uh, Chancellor, we really appreciate you coming in and spending over three hours with us to answer these questions. We, of course, will have some follow-up questions, which we'll forward you by mail, and uh, we wish you luck. And again, thank you to everyone in the Department of Education for the job that you have done in terms of transitioning from classroom to remote uh, learning. Uh, it has been a very difficult time for all of us, and to be honest with you, if I was still a teacher, and I had a transition, I'd need heavy duty uh, professional development and how to get on to remote learning because uh, I'm not all that techno technologically aware. But uh, we thank you very, very much for what you're doing. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Chancellor. And also to um, Ms. Oates and, and Ms. Ramirez as well. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we will now take a break until 1.30 p.m when we will hear from the Department of Transportation. I ask my colleagues who will be joining us for the transportation portion of the hearing to remain in this Zoom with your microphone muted until we are ready to begin. And thank you very much. This portion of the hearing is ended. Previously heard from the Department of Education, and we will now hear from the Department of Transportation. Uh, we have been joined by several council members. They are Councilmember Powers, Menchaca, Adams, Lander, Amphrey Samuel, Grudenchik, Miller, Rose, Ayala, Cabrera, Brannon, Yeager, Koslowitz, Cumbo, Joni, Levine, Ku, Carnegie, Holden, Levine, Matteo, and Gibson. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but I would like to ask our committee council to go over some procedural items before turning it over to Chair Rodriguez for his statement. Thank you. My name is Noah Brick and I'm counsel to the New York City Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including answers. After you are acknowledged, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you that your time has begun. The Sergeant at Arms will also indicate when your time has expired. Please also note that for 
ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Council Member Drum, uh, Council Member Rodriguez for his opening statement. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Idan Rodriguez, Chairman of the Transportation Committee. I want to begin by thanking my colleague, Co Chair, uh, Co Chair Council Member Danny Drum, and the members of the committee on, the, on, the, uh, on financial partners for partnering with the members of the committee on transportation in holding this virtual budget hearing. First of all, I would like to put out prayer to all those families that they have lost their loved one. As we know, coronavirus doesn't discriminate. Anyone can die. But most people that have been dying, they are the poorest New Yorkers. We don't want anyone, regardless they are upper class, middle class, or working class to die. But we need to address the reality. It is the combination of coronavirus plus poverty that have killed so many people. We want to be sure that we, at this hearing today, realize that a lot of investment has to be made related to transportation in order to connect more people who live on the third community to buses, trains, bicycle, and ferry. Today, we're here to continue the fiscal, the fiscal 2021 budget process, but under completely different circumstances that we found or saw just two months ago. Since our preliminary budget hearing, nearly 20,000 New Yorkers had died due to the novel coronavirus and the lives of all New Yorkers have been completely changed by the virus. Over 20 million people have applied for unemployment in the USA, numbers that haven't been seen since the Great Depression. We are experiencing a national health crisis, the likes of which we have never seen before. As we all continue to do our part to practice safe social distance, family has been separated, jobs have been lost, and community business has been being forced to close. And of course, transportation also has been affected. Thanks to the dedication and sacrifice of all essential workers, our trains and buses have continued to run. Our, our livery and for hire vehicles have been able to deliver meals to New Yorkers who cannot leave their home. Our supermarkets and grocery stores remain stuck and our nurses and our doctors have been able to save thousands of lives out of home attendants being taking the buses and the trains to go and provide the services to our senior citizens. Many parents, they had to serve to work as a teacher assistant, even though they had never applied for the job by staying in the apartment and helping the children. This is what it means to be a New Yorker, to look out for one another and to ensure that we are all doing our part during this pandemic. Without the work, our city will never be able to function. However, we must also acknowledge that we have lost many essential workers, including more than 80 transit workers. I would like to take a moment of silence to recognize and honor the sacrifice of all these workers and the many New Yorkers who have fallen to this virus. Through this hearing, we hope the continuation of the budget process will lead to the adoption of a budget that is progressive, responsible, and fair for all New Yorkers, especially the immigrant, the Latino, Black, and Asian, and the poorest neighborhood, those that they have left behind, those that show one more time that even though Mayor de Blasio wanted a mandate to close the gap between the rich and the poor, today more than ever, we have seen inequality as the face of New York City. We need a budget that will effectively meet on the department's effort to maintain and improve pedestrian and cyclist safety in the city's roadway infrastructure during this pandemic. And my brothers and sisters who represent middle and upper class community, as we will have this discussion, let's put all our priority for anything related to bike lane, to buses, to cyclists in underserved communities those dealing with asthma and obesity, those that, that they have left behind. I hope to also hear from the DOT's plan on expanding protected bike lane and city bike station to all, all, all underserved communities who have always been the last one. Additionally, we hope the department will discuss its four-year capital plan, particularly in terms of its goal 
and priority once we recover from this pandemic, as well as the scope of proposed budget cut related to COVID-19. Finally, the mayor has recently committed to opening 40 mile street to pedestrian within a month and 100 miles by end of summer. We look forward to hearing how DOT plans to implement this program and how it will be carried out equitable to all community in need of open space. My brothers and sisters, the opening street should be equal at the percentage of people dying in different sick code and the percentage of people uh, uh, getting the coronavirus. If we have one sick code that have one digit person dying by sick code, or they have hundreds of people with the virus compared to 2000, then the opening street should be give priority to the underserved communities. The MTAs, I I'm gonna leave it there. Sorry, the MTA calendar 2020 adopted operating budget was adopted in December prior to the outbreak of the coronavirus. As a result, it remained balanced despite the fact that it faced several loss in ridership and, and fair box revenue. Similarly, the authorities newly adopted 2020 2024 nearly 55 billion capital program appears fully funded, pending federal approval of congestion pricing and seeding state contribution. We look forward to having the MTA update the Committee on the State of the Transit System during this outbreak and its effort to minimize expo exposure risk of both its unemployed and the city essential workers. Additionally, we hope to hear about the MTA, uh, how the MTA will navigate its future under the possibility of significant funding cuts. Please, the MTA plan of dedicating a period of time closing our transit, our train from 1 in the morning to 5 a.m. should be part of the time frame. We should not leave it open. The MTA should explain to us for how long our train will be closed from 1 in the morning to 5 a.m. Finally, we look forward to hearing about the MTA's recent decision on how that, that particular decision and how to close subways from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. and how it is treating one of the new most vulnerable population, the homeless. I also look forward to hear from the MTA on how they will be helping those communities that rely on the trains during this time. Many of these New Yorkers do not have the luxury of working from home and this closure will have a significant impact on the community. Before we hear from the MTA, let me take a moment to recognize, well, I will leave it my, to the, my, the, our staff to please call the name, recognize the council member who are with us right now. Pero más que todo lo importante también español, reconocer de que hoy estamos discutiendo un presupuesto de transportación para DOT, para el MTA, y que estamos pidiendo que no se recorten programas de autobuses de servicio, especialmente en la comunidad de más pobres, que el cierre de las calles se hagan principalmente en las comunidades que tienen un mayor por ciento con asma y con obesidad. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rodriguez. I just want to make sure that people understand that we're going to be talking to the uh, Department of Transportation now, and then the MTA will follow after that uh, we'll have a separate uh, hearing for that uh, today, but after the Department of Transportation. So I will now call on the members of the Department of Transportation to testify. We will hear testimony from Commissioner Polly Trottenberg. Commissioner Trottenberg is joined by Elizabeth Franklin, Associate Commissioner for Budget and Capital, and Rebecca Zack, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. Will the Committee Council please administer the affirmation Thank you. I will now administer the affirmation one time and you will be called on individually to so affirm at the end. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner Trottenberg? Yes, I do. Ms. Franklin? Yes, I do. Ms. Zach? Yes, I do. Thank you. Commissioner Trottenberg, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and Chairman Drum and members of the Transportation and Finance Committees. We wanna thank you for inviting us to testify on behalf of Mayor de Blasio on DOT's FY21 executive budget 
an FY20 to 24 capital plan. Today I'm testifying on a far more challenging budget than the one I presented on March 9th, shortly before the COVID-19 crisis overtook our city. Like much of city government, DOT is now adjusting to a new operational and fiscal reality, requiring us to redesign, postpone, or even cancel some programs, while doing everything we can to provide for the safe, efficient, equitable, and environmentally sustainable movement of people and goods in New York City. Many of the savings I'll outline in this proposed FY21 1.1 billion expense budget and 10.3 billion five-year capital plan simply reflect the reality of reduced service levels, operations, and projects for 2020. And while we're still grappling with the proposed funding reductions in this budget, we know there will likely be more to come in 2021 and beyond. Additionally, with the COVID-19 crisis still upon us, we face an unpredictable and less productive operational environment. We must now perform our work with a relentless focus on the health and safety of our workforce, our contractors, and the public, with social distancing, personal protective equipment, temperature taking, and sanitizing regimens for our facilities, vehicles, and tools. We also face an uncertain procurement environment as our contractors and supply chain firms face their own COVID-19 impacts. But I'm proud to say that during this pandemic, the team at DOT has been resilient, resourceful, and dedicated to keeping our agency operating as safely and productively as possible. And many DOT staff have stepped up to volunteer on other city needs during COVID-19, from food distribution to providing task masks for the public. I wanna thank them all for their service. I'm first gonna just go over the overview of our budget, but you can see it's in the written testimony. I won't read through the numbers, both our 1.1, billion dollar expense budget and our $10.3 billion five-year capital plan. I'd like to now turn to the immediate effects of the COVID-19 crisis on our operations. DOT, like many sister agencies, has felt the impact of the virus directly with employees out sick and tragically some lost forever. We mourn the loss of our colleagues, especially those on the front lines at DOT and throughout city government and the MTA, and are grateful to all the essential workers putting their lives at risk each and every day. And, and thank you, Chairman Rodriguez, for kindly noting that. In the face of the crisis, I'm proud to say that DOT has maintained all the agency's critical functions, including emergency infrastructure repairs, operating and expanding our speed camera program, and running the Staten Island Ferry 24-7. We're now starting to resume more field operations, including resurfacing, sidewalk and pedestrian ramp work, and pedestrian and bike projects. And we're working closely with our union partners to ensure that our field workforce is properly socially distanced, well-equipped, and fully supported. This crisis has dramatically changed our city streets. Traffic is down significantly, which has led to one bit of good news, a decline in traffic fatalities since mid-March, leading to the longest period without a pedestrian fatality, 58 days, since we began tracking by mode in 1983. However, unfortunately, some drivers are taking advantage of our much emptier streets to speed recklessly, and we know we can never let up our vigilance. DOT's speed cameras have issued almost double the number of violations compared to before the crisis, and NYPD has stepped up targeted speed enforcement. And we're continuing our pace of installing 60 new speed cameras each month and plan to meet our goal of standing up the largest speed camera program in the world. We've continued to grow City Bike with a focus on addressing COVID-19 impacts, the system now has 14,500 bikes in 900 stations, more than double the size of the system at launch in 2013. We recently began expanding into Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, where we're installing 100 new stations, including stations at Lincoln and Harlem hospitals. We've also partnered with Lyft, City, and MasterCard to offer free year-long memberships to essential workers on the front lines of COVID-19. We're also answering the call many of you, including Speaker Johnson and Council Member Rivera, to open up the city streets to pedestrians and cyclists. Last month, the mayor and the speaker announced we would open 100 miles of streets, including 40 by the end of the month. We're actively working with our sister agencies, council members, community boards, bids, advocates, and others to achieve this goal, and have thus far opened nearly 10 miles of city streets, and expect to open many more miles that we've been working with many of you on very, very soon. Lastly, even amidst the crisis, we're working with our contractors and partners at DDC to continue critical construction work on the majority of our capital projects, from transformational streetscape improvements in downtown Bar Rockaway to a new community plaza space in Soundview, to a full neighborhood reconstruction in Ozone Park, and the next phase of our Grand Concourse project. And we're continuing our critical bridge work as well, including upcoming repairs and resurfacing on the BQE. 
Now that our agency has grappled with the initial operational challenges of COVID-19, we're beginning to look ahead to innovative approaches to help our city and our economy reopen. We're grateful to the mayor for creating a Surface Transportation Recovery Council with representation from our sister agencies and a broad group of experts, including advocates, labor and industry leaders, and other stakeholders. We hope to work with this council on rethinking our streets and on getting people back to work safely and efficiently, focusing on biking, walking, buses, and ferries. The council will also focus on how our street network can help bolster businesses and restaurants through public realm and access improvements and support efficient commerce and deliveries. We know how important it is to seize the moment and draw upon our experience during COVID-19 to focus on making our city even more equitable, healthy, safe, and sustainable. And we very much look forward to working with the city council and taking your input and partnership in the shared goal. But this brings me to the fiscal reality and DOT's targeted savings of 61.5 million in this FY21 expense budget. I think it's useful to contextualize the impact that dollar amount represents. And, and you can see in my written testimony, some charts that lay out the numbers. While DOT's operating budget is 1.1 billion, over 50% of that comes from state and federal grants from the capital budget or represents revenue generating activities like parking meter operations and automated traffic enforcement. And therefore making cuts to those programs would not generate expense budget savings. Of the approximately 550 million remaining, large portions are relatively fixed costs such as the electric bill for streetlights and signals and leases on DOT facilities or support the inspection and maintenance of essential infrastructure on which all street users rely. A final factor when looking for savings is to do all we can to avoid layoffs as the mayor has pledged. This means looking for savings where we can from newer programs like Green Wave or Better Buses, which have more unfilled positions that can be cut without laying off existing staff, which is not the case for core DOT operations like roadway repair or bridge maintenance. Nonetheless, should more savings be required in the coming months, we expect we will see further budget cuts that will affect every part of our agency. In the area of Vision Zero, we've identified 10 million in total savings in fiscal year 20 and 21 with reduced spending on roadway markings due to current contractor capacity limitations, reduced media spending and a delay in filling positions. While we do not take these savings lightly with a total of 1 billion spent on Vision Zero thus far and 3 billion allocated in this budget, our commitment to eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries remains steadfast. In our Better Buses Initiative, something I know, Mr. Chairman, you've, you've written about with great concern, we've identified 2.7 million in FY20 and 5.7 million in FY21 in total savings from delays in hiring and reduced materials and supplies due to COVID-19. The administration remains committed to better buses and increasing bus speeds, particularly as traffic congestion returns to our city streets. We still expect to invest over 12 million from our expense budget into the SBS program in FY21, which will enable significant work towards, towards the goal of speeding up buses as outlined in the Better Buses Action Plan of April 2019. Specifically, DOT still expects to install an average of 7.5 miles of new bus lanes per year and will meet our previous transit signal priority goal of 1,000 intersections by the end of 2020. And we still plan to move forward with bus priority projects planned for 2020, including on 149th Street in the Bronx, which serves Lincoln Hospital. And we're open to adding additional projects as resources and community support permit. With the Staten Island Ferry, we identified 6 million in savings by reducing service and suspending lower level boarding in response to a 90% drop in ridership. And we've identified other opportunities for savings throughout the agency, including delaying parking meter upgrades and reducing vacancies. For DOT's capital budget, we rolled out 1 billion from the fiscal year 20 to 25 period into fiscal years 26 to 29. This is largely comprised of funding for the BQE project while keeping available for critical near-term work on the structure. Also in the category of capital spending, DOT's funding funded for about 600 lane miles of roadway resurfacing or around half of what we've been able to achieve for five straight years under the de Blasio administration. During my time as commissioner, DOT has been fortunate to have so many elected officials, advocates and other stakeholders supporting the agency taking on more projects and initiatives each year. And as DOT's mission has expanded, the agency has grown by over 30% in the last six years and added 1,000 new employees. But we now face significant budget cuts, a citywide hiring freeze, and restrictions on outside contracting. 
And finally, as I touched on earlier, we also face productivity challenges in light of the operational changes necessary to safely resume our work. But I'm confident that DOT's creative and resourceful workforce will find every way to make the most of our still robust resources. Even if we're unable to accomplish all that we would like, we will continue to maintain and improve our infrastructure, run the Staten Island Ferry, and implement vital, innovative pedestrian, bike, bus, and safety projects that will support the city's economic recovery and quality of life. In conclusion, I wanna thank the council for your partnership, particularly in the face of these unprecedented times. I'm proud of all we've accomplished together thus far. We've worked together in every part of the city, including our lowest income areas, and not just those neighborhoods with the loudest voices or the most privileged. I'm reattaching some of the equity analysis of our work that I shared in the preliminary budget testimony. We remain eager to continue working together to help our great city through this crisis and to create an even better New York City for tomorrow. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Appreciate you coming in and giving your testimony. I would like to just talk a little bit about the deferred bridge maintenance. Even with the current need to make difficult budget decisions, we must be careful not to repeat the mistakes of past recessions and defer maintenance on critical infrastructure. In the capital, in the executive capital plan, several infra infrastructure maintenance projects were reduced, including a 27% reduction in the plan Manhattan Bridge reconstruction and a $23.3 million shift into the out years for bridge painting citywide. Even before the pandemic, DOT shifted $138.5 million into the out years for the Queensboro Bridge, excuse me, the Ed Koch Bridge rehabilitation. Can you please detail all maintenance projects that have been cut or deferred from the East River projects, bridge projects, and explain why you think this is prudent? I, I, I'm going to speak generally, and I'm going to have Elizabeth Franklin pull up some of the details. And I think one of the general things, we couldn't agree with you more, Mr. Chairman. We never want to go back to those days, as, as you recollect, when we had to shut the Williamsburg Bridge down because the city had deferred maintenance. And, you know, I think Mayors since that time have, have pledged to make sure that we always keep our bridges in a state of good repair. And I'm, I'm grateful to this mayor and this council, we've had a lot of resources to do so. Certainly as we have started to face budget pre pressures, what we have done is take a hard look at contracts where perhaps the schedule was not aligned with how we were actually going to be able to let the contract. And the BQE is certainly one of those examples where I think as, as a lot of folks know, that project, we're, we're probably still a couple of years away from the major work. So we've had opportunities to roll some of those projects out with not having a big impact on bridge conditions, but I'll let Elizabeth wants to speak a little more to the specifics. Am I unmuted? Yeah, I think yes. I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the specific projects that you mentioned, I'm gonna have <laughs> going to match project schedules um, in this past plan, this April plan. Um, even the BQE, as in the, um, because of the, the panel and everything else, we're, we're rolling out some of the work and getting to work with um, on the, the most critical parts of it in the next five years. And we still have the money for later on. Um, but as, as to the other bridges you mentioned, I'm gonna have to get the specifics on what's happening with each of those contracts. Let me just ask as a follow up with the BQE project. Did we get design build on that, right? And uh, is there a um, any time frame in which that needs to be completed in order for us to uh, continue with design build? Well, you you may remember we were granted a few years ago. There were just several particular projects that the legislator granted that authority, and then this past year the city was was granted a blanket authority which is good news. So that means we, we have more years for a whole bunch of design right. bills. Right, okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, the DOT did not provide performance data on bridge ratings for fiscal 19, despite having this information in past MMRs. Last year, 57.8% of our bridges were listed in fair, quote unquote, condition. Was this information in the 2020 PM MMR and has the percent of our bridges that were uh, in the list uh, were they rated fair or poor condition? Has that increased in 2020? Right, so I'm, I'm gonna jump in on this one and it, it is a bit of a complicated question. Um, a few years back, the federal government created a new bridge rating system, which is a, a much more 
I'd say, sort of complicated and multifactored system. And New York City DOT and a lot of other, you know, bridge owners around the country have been sort of struggling with matching the old system we use with the new one. It's not an easy one-to-one -one correlation. And so, you know, we are still sort of using our standard bridge evaluation protocols, very continuous inspections that both the city and the state do, but the, we're still trying to make those two methodologies mesh. Do you have an idea when that's gonna be available or? Um, I'm looking at Elizabeth on this one. I think, I'm, I'm hoping sometime by the end of this year, we're going to have a, you know, a system. And again, this is one where we're also working with state, New York State DOT, because they're one of the entities that also inspects our bridges. Okay, thank you. Um, to address the increase in cyclist deaths, in 2019, the city launched a $58.4 million plan, Green Wave Bike Safety Plan to enhance street safety. Due to COVID-19, DOT has proposed PEG that would reduce funding for protected bike lanes by $3 million over 2020 and 2021, a 17% reduction over the two years. Given that we're asking New Yorkers to limit non-essential travel on subway and buses and to practice social distancing, is it prudent to make such significant cuts to bike lanes? So just, I think it's, it's probably important to distinguish between the, the fiscal year 20 cuts and, and 21, because a lot of what's happening in 20 is really just due to events on the ground, due to, due, due to COVID-19. I mean, we, we've all had to pause different parts of our work, as have our contractors, et cetera. And I think, look, we, we, we want to work with the council on obviously what the shape of, of some of these cuts are going to look like. We know there's, there's nothing here that any of us are excited to see cut. We're just trying to find that, that right amount of what we can spend and what we can actually accomplish. Okay. Um, DOT planned on installing 300 speed cameras in fiscal 20 and 720 by 21 funded through $81 million in capital funding. Is DOT on schedule to install the 300 cameras uh, in both fiscal 20 and 21? We are, uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna thank my team because throughout the COVID-19, we have kept on track with our speed camera installations and maybe Elizabeth or Rebecca can dig up the latest numbers. And, and I think, you know, as I mentioned in the testimony, I'm very glad that we've kept that program expanding because we have seen practically a doubling in the amount of speeding as traffic has gone down on our streets. And Commissioner, is, um, can you give us a uh, list of where those speed cameras would be broken down borough by borough and, yep. um, and, and, and how they're being selected? How are you selecting those locations? We, we use a methodology where we, and, and one thing we're lucky is we get a lot of speed data from city vehicles. We look at places where we see high speeding and high KSI, which is killed and seriously injured. So we're looking in places where we see those two factors together. And then there are places that are within the quarter mile radius of a school and that, you know, they're, they're good places to place those cameras. And, and I think the methodology has proved very, very sound. Okay, and um, one of the things that's been quite popular, uh, especially in my district, are the bikes at Elmhurst Hospital. Uh, any plan to make those um, sites uh, permanent? I think we really like to. I, I think one thing that has been terrific is how much cycling has become an important uh, mode of transportation during coronavirus and so important for healthcare workers. So yes, we've done some work with uh, the other chairman on this and, and would love to work with all council members on this. Okay, really would like to have that because we don't have city bike here at all. So long time waiting for that. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm gonna turn it over to, um, Chair Rodriguez now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair John. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner, for the great work that you have done. Uh, and as we know, we had challenges that you know, it's not an easy time for us. Uh, Commissioner, uh, what is the plan on cleaning? And this question is NTA, but also include DOT when it comes to a, a some area related to train stations. And, and, and we had this conversation in the past on how I want the MTA to include a plan to clean stations, not only inside and the train, but also the entry of the stations. And it's coming from my understanding and my own a, a, a experience to see an entry of the station, let's say 176 and Giron, 
compared to Broadway on 96 on 72nd. It's a completely lack of cleaning in one side and the other one is, it went through the whole beautification. And when I approached DOT, MTA on how can you also take care of cleaning the entry because people also touch the stairs when they come from the street. There's a sidewalk like a three feet away from entry to the station. So they just throw the DOT. The whole thing was about that's not on us. That's on the city responsibility. If, if it is or it's not, can we, you look at this and see how the whole plan of cleaning also include, if it's something that the DOT or sanitation, whoever is involved but led by DOT also include an effort to clean the entry of the stations beside cleaning inside? I, I, I certainly think we can. I think it would be helpful, Mr. Chairman, to get us particulars about stations where you, you think this is an issue. And obviously I've just heard you mention. Be with me with this. This is about priority. This is about, you can take in a station, call in the upper west side, call it on the upper east side, call it on the middle class and upper class community. There are more resources, there's more attention. So I would like decide that I can give you 149th Avenue, that I can give you 176 in Jerome. I would like for the DOT, talk to the NTA to do the assessment and the personnel that they have assigned to clean inside, also to look at the cleaning at the entry of the stations across the five worlds. Okay, well, we, we, I'll be happy to talk. We're, we're talking to the MTA every day on a variety of topics. So happy to talk to them about this as well. And I know you'll be hearing from um, New York City uh, Transit Interim President, Sarah Feinberg uh, next, and I'll talk to her about it as well. Okay, but be with me with it. They just say that this is the city. A point blank, the MTA is saying that they don't have responsibility on cleaning the entry. I just want to be sure that, that if that will be the case. I, I do have to take a look there. about whether it is, whether it belongs to the city or the MTA, and if it's MTA property, what kind of a protocol we would work out there. So let, let me speak to them about it. Thank you. And my second question is on investments to improve our buses. As you know, publicly, I have said, and, I, and it's coming, be with me with this soon. This is about, I take my year that I will have to serve in government or to send the community. I will dedicate it to address the inequality that we have, you know, equity issue that we have in the city. And I even we told the mayor, he had made a lot of progress, but I think the coronavirus showed the real face of the city of New York when it came to the poorest and the richest. So I think that for me, I, at this moment, like you can, we cannot go to the transportation desert community and say, we will take a pause for the next two years on investing to improve our buses. So I don't want to put you in the spot, but I would like to at least be open to explore a way on how we can restore the funding for the better buses initiative. Look, certainly Mr. Chairman, and just to be clear, as I said in my testimony, we, we, we are still committed to doing a lot of bus lane work, not as much as, as we originally committed to in 2019, but we are not putting a complete pause on that work. But of course, I, I think our message here is we fully recognize this is gonna be a negotiation with the administration and the city council and, and these cuts are painful. No, nobody is enjoying finding ourselves here. And obviously we, we wanna work with you all and, and get a set of priorities that, that everyone can agree on. But I, I, again, this is the moment where as we have seen any other big cause and fight, you know, from the Sukkari Park, I won't occupy Wall Street, to the Black Lives Matter, to the climate justice. We are seeing a lot of youth and a lot of energy of people who are embracing all the fight that don't necessarily affect them directly. I want to call all the leaders in agencies to understand. There's a voice in on the certain community that say, this should be a priority here. For my colleague in government, if you talk about the Better Bosses Plan, Anias is starting addressing priority to the underserved community. Like those are the one, because there's a correlation, there's a connection. Asthma, obesity, diabetes, plus coronavirus, you know, is the equal to so many people dying because of the coronavirus. So I think that when we look about those communities, those are the one, most of them, that they're dealing with transportation desert. They have to walk 20 blocks from the apartment to a training station. So whatever we can do to address it, also looking from the social class perspective, it is important if we want to address what happened during this time of the coronavirus. I said before, 
It doesn't matter if anyone lives in the C code 10001. Anyone could have it, anyone can die. But the number there is no high as the poorest neighborhood. So with the better buses, I want everyone to look at on the certain community as the opening of streets as a top priority. In case that we need to cut, we should cut in all the area that they already had plenty buses, that they already have plenty good transportation. You know, look at it. Look at the Upper West Side. Look at the Upper East Side. Look at the Long Island City. There's a ferry there. Look at the new community going through gentrification. They have better buses than the poorest ones. So I just want for you, you know, to look at this and see how we can, you know, keep this conversation going on. Right. My next question. I just appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, and obviously that, that also will be a discussion with the MTA and it is no secret that they are facing, uh, you know, right now, pretty devastating budget situation. We'll, we'll see that there may be another relief package down in Washington that helps them, but obviously that, that's going to be something both agencies are going to need to work together with the council on. Okay, and, and next question, Commissioner, and I don't know if you have the number in total, if you have a great, and if not, if you think and put it together, I would like to see and, and I have some idea, we have some idea that the city of New York and most of the Democratic, most of the city that we are in blue state, they lost some funding from the federal government. So do you have any idea to what percentage, how number went down from the last four years of Obama's administration to transport in, to the last four years of Obama in the first four years Donald Trump when he come to in, in getting federal funding to our transportation system? Right, I'll, I'll get you those numbers, but I will say, interestingly enough, Mr. Chairman, we have not seen, transportation has actually not been an area where we've seen big cuts during the Trump administration. That, that's been traditionally down in Washington, an area of fairly bipartisan support, and Congress has mostly kept those programs somewhat held harmless, but we'll get you those details. And, and do you think that have, I mean, question, have the DOT look at asking good contractors because we have good Apple and we have bad Apple everywhere in government, public, private, academic, everywhere. And I know that there's a lot of contractors that they are good. They are good ones. There's other ones that we all have to be pushing them. We need to make them accountable. We need to, for them to get the project on time. We need to work with them to control the prices. Have DOT looked to start any conversation with contractors in, in, in by asking them or suggesting them to cut the prices of projects by at least 10%? And if that conversation has not have happened, do you see any possibility that having conversation with contractors that they have project for this budget and with the possibility that we also plan for the next, for the budget, the 21 budget, that we get contractors to cut the prices by 10% on DOT and across the agency so that we can get some saving there and be able to invest those money in other projects on transportation and across other agencies in the city. Um, that, that, that's a good question, Mr. Chairman, and one that you may recall the MTA sort of did their own experiment on um, where they sort of went to their contractors, not who were doing heavy construction projects, but they were doing different consulting projects and asked them all to take a 10% cut. I would say that the firms that were the hardest hit by that were MWBE firms. They had the least ability to absorb that kind of a margin. So if this is something we want to look at, we have to be very careful because I think it hits the minority contracting community the hardest of all. I do think though that clearly um, the city should take a fresh look at all its financial commitments and see if there are places we can get some savings, absolutely. And, and I think you know, some, some bids may come in lower now because the contractors are more anxious for work, but some contractors have also struggled as we have at the city level with a lot of new expenses, new cleaning protocols, new equipment, new vehicles needed. So, so I think the market is still sorting itself out. I, I would just want to make sure anything we did d did not, you know, unduly harm the MWBE community. Okay. So for the purpose of time, I have the question, but I will stop here, and so that our colleague also have, get a chance to continue asking questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Rodriguez. And now let's go to our council member questions.
If any council members have questions for DOT, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called upon in the order in which you have raised your hand. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. The Sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. We will hear please uh, from Council Member Powers followed by Council Members Menchaca and Adams. Your time begins now. Okay, thank you. Nice to see you, uh, Commissioner. And thanks. I, I've been talking to your team on a few items. So I want to say thank you to all the folks at DOT. Um, a couple of quick questions here. The first being um, uh, one of the thing, ideas that other cities have had, and I've been talking about and trying to see if the city can put together a game plan is as we're doing a reopening sometime in the future about ways to, I, it, 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 to me, it seems like bars, restaurants are going to be the last ones to be able to reopen and likely with capacity reduction. So I think you had mentioned this, but one of the things I'd like to see, and perhaps my district can serve as a template or a pilot for this is to look at maybe expanded space in the streets, curbside, sidewalks to help those businesses be able to do outdoor serving, do the capacity reduction inside, we'd be able to take better advantage of space on the outside and to help those businesses out as they're gonna have a slow phase in and reopening. And I would be curious to hear if the DOT is uh, where you are on that. And also if you'd be willing to work with me and I know some other colleagues who are interested in this, maybe to have a, a call or a, a, a meeting, a, a virtual meeting about this with stakeholders to talk about the various different hurdles, challenges, and likelihood that we can do something like that. Um, I'll start there, and then I have two short questions. I will, I'll all my questions. The other questions are- We are absolutely <laughs> thinking about it, and, and I'm happy to say sister agency are as well, particularly Small Business Services, and Ann Del Castillo, who's part of her bailiwick at MOM, is looking at larger restaurants, city planning, and we all recognize, and, and there was a story about it happening in Vilnius, Lithuania, um, of turning over part of the streets and sidewalks so restaurants can space out and do social distancing. We are, there's sort of an interagency group that's looking at sort of how you would manage it and some of the permitting issues, but, but we're, and, and we've been also talking to the restaurant association. I agree your district might be a great place to start to test this out and happy to have a team of folks connect with you on it. It would be, I think, a wonderful way to help restaurants start to generate some business again and, and bring some socially distanced uh, life back to our streets. Thank you. And I think we'd have to talk to SLA and other state stakeholders too if we're talking about service. But I would be glad. I'll look forward to their call. Uh, second and, and last here is just in terms of open space uh, in general beyond just the serving, but one is um, Rockefeller Center, 49th and 50th, the topic we've talked about a lot. They've been looking to also be part of the Open Streets program, wanted to hear feedback on their ability or that ability in my district to be able to use those cross, those, um, you know, sort of uh, through streets that go uh, adjacent to the plaza. And second, around Grand Central, lots of open space, lots of opportunities there. If you could just talk to us about any plans around that might be in the works around Grand Central. Well, as you know, and I, and I want to thank, you know, many, many of your colleagues and community boards and bids have been coming to us with a lot of ideas on open streets. And, you know, I think we've, we've tried to evolve a model where we're being very light touch and obviously not having NYPD stand at every corner. Um, those obviously are some iconic locations that you're talking about, but uh, happy to put them on the list and, and talk to you about them. Again, we're, we're trying to lean in and, and open up as many streets as we can while dealing also with any place that has bus routes or emergency vehicle routes, just trying to make sure you know, they don't impede anything that's important in terms of COVID-19 workforce or, or emergency vehicles. Okay, thank you. If you can have somebody follow up on the open street stuff, uh, that'd be great. And I'll thank you to Chair Drum and Chair Rodriguez for the time. Thanks. Okay. Okay, we'll go to our next council member, please. Can we have questions from council member Menchaca followed by council member Adams? Now. Thank you, everyone, uh, and thank you to the chairs uh, for, for this hearing, and thank you, Commissioner. So my, my first question is really uh, something that we had talked about before in terms of really working with local neighborhood uh, infrastructure to be a um, kind of component of the safe streets that, and open streets. So I wanted to see if, if there was any change. I know that the NYPD last time really talked about 
um, officers being a part of that. And I'm hoping that I'm, we're gonna hear something different from you in terms of really shepherding a kind of community driven uh, safety plan. Uh, one, two, city bike expansion, I'm sure has been uh, impacted. And I think a lot of folks in Sunset Park who are essential workers uh, might wanna engage in that program uh, in using city bike. And so what are the expansion possibilities in terms of kind of COVID related neighborhood essential worker populations like Sunset Park? Uh, and then the final question is those essential workers, many of them are immigrants and non-English speakers. And I'm thinking about our work during Vision Zero and how we really focused on hearings that were um, multilingual and sometimes non-English. And how are we bringing that population into helping shape the, what is becoming a very kind of clear, like, hey, council members, you decide what close, what streets to close and rather making it more participatory in, in, in process and design. Right, and, and, and just to be clear, it, it isn't, it isn't a, a, hey, council member, you decide. We, we actually have had our, our borough commissioner's offices reaching out to council members, to community boards, to local neighborhood associations, um, and, and certainly trying to do it in multiple languages. I'm, I'm sure there are ways we can do better. And I think we would love, to the extent that any of you want to, happy for you to help facilitate groups we should talk to. We do want this to be a you know, this is the way the model evolved. Instead of sort of a top-down PD manning all the barricades, we are looking for a community-driven model, but we recognize some communities, more people may be able to, to bring some resources to the table, some not, but certainly where there's an interest, we're ready from the city's point of view to step in and help and, and bring resources as needed. So if there are streets, neighborhoods, areas, you know, in any of the districts you all represent, let us know. Um, you know, in, in Brooklyn, Keith Bray is on the ground ferrying uh, all those requests through. Um, and I'm sure in your district, I, I can think of a lot of places where we could really successfully open up some streets. Wonderful. Um, um, city bike. Um, yeah, city bike. And then, and then the open streets infra community infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, city bike, we are, you know, trying to work on the expansion best we can you know, while the coronavirus is on and, and making sure again, I mean, one challenge I think we're, we're starting to work our way through um, is making sure we can reach out to communities when people are home, when community boards are, you know, not all of them totally up and running or they're sort of having Zoom meetings, which, which you know, not everybody is, is technology enabled. Um, but we also certainly see, you know, what a huge uh, boon City Bike has been during coronavirus for healthcare workers. So, right. you know, lo I'd love to sit down with you in a in a socially distanced way and, and talk about what else we can do down in your, uh, in your district for sure. Um, I think we, you know, I wanna thank also, you know, Lyft and City and MasterCard for stepping up and offering, you know, year, year long free memberships to all essential workers, healthcare workers, frontline city workers, people working in food pantries. So certainly for those of you uh, who have it in your district, make sure you know those folks can get free year long memberships. And then activating the, the, the kind of community infrastructure for open space rather than the police. Well, again, I mean, I think if you look at the, I, I happen to live near one of the, the open streets, PD is, is really, they, they're coming in the morning to, to put in the barricades, coming by a little bit during the day to monitor it as our, our DOT staff and park staff, but mainly it's, it's just sort of open and, and the community's keeping an eye on it. It's not a, it's very light touch for PD. And that's the only way we're going to get to 100 miles. We're obviously not going to do that with a, a, a PD heavy model. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we need to move on to the next uh, council member, please. Uh, can we have questions, please, from council member Adams, followed by council members Lander and Cabrera. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chairs Jerome and Chairs Rodriguez, for this important hearing. Hello, Commissioner. It's always good to see you. Thank you for your partnership uh, over the years. Um, Commissioner, you know, over the years that, that I've been elected, it's just been a couple, but uh, you know that I represent areas of Southeast Queens. And for a very long time, our, uh, our sectors were not really given priority by DOT. So when I came in, um, I kind of boosted that priority to the top of the list to try to get repaving done and a lot of other things done, four-way stop signs and 
just a lot of things that paid attention uh, more to the safety, you know, of our uh, pedestrians and our, our commuters. So we know that DOT has a limited time frame where the roads can be repaved now. To what extent, and again, I'm being selfish about this, as I'm sure my colleagues get selfish about their, their work uh, and their districts. To what extent has street repaving been delayed as a result of COVID-19? Not, not selfish to care about your district, for sure. And, and it has been great a great partnership with you. We appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we took a pause on our major resurfacing, you know, basically for a little over a month while we retooled that whole operation to make it safe to make sure that the work that the crews had all the masks and cleaning supplies and equipment that they needed, that we had adequate vehicles, we retooled the schedules, how people mustered at the facilities. So we did everything we could. We've now got our resurfacing program up and running again. Our, our lane mile target for this year is 1100 miles. I don't think both due to the pause and due to the sort of all the new protective measures we're taking that we're gonna quite get there, but we're gonna try and get as far as we can. Um, you know, I'm happy to say folks are happy to be back at work. Now, just as I highlighted in my testimony, I do want to make sure council members are aware, um, for my five-year capital plan, this coming year, I'm only budgeted now for around 600, roughly speaking, lane miles. So that, that will represent a, a big decrease in resurfacing in, in the coming year after this one. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to jump here really quick because I see the clock goes very fast. Uh, we know that litter and dumping has been a big, big problem um, for a very long time. Um, our parkways and expressways continue to experience just a horrible amount of litter uh, right now. So what, uh, what role is the DOT playing in the cleanup of our parkways and expressways uh, in the era of COVID-19? I mean, we have arterial maintenance crews, which do clean up. And again, as I said, we had to do some pausing while we retooled our operations to make them safe. Our folks are back out there again. And, and council member, if there are places where you're particularly seeing a, a garbage accumulation, let us know, let Nicole Garcia go, and we will send crews out to do a cleanup. Time. We'll do Van Wick Expressway, just saying. Van Wick, okay, duly noted. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to our next council member, thank you. Can we please have Council Member Lander followed by Council Member Cabrera and Council Member Rose. Council Member, your clock starts now. Thank you, Commissioner, to you and your team for all your hard work. It was good to see you out in the first hours of open streets on Prospect Park West. And I know you guys are working hard to make that work and spread it as the chair cares rightly so much about all around the city. I also really appreciate that bigger street rethinking you spoke about, what Paris has done in accelerating bus and bike lanes, Corona Piste, as they're calling them, is truly impressive. And it's amazing right now during the reduced traffic to see how fast, on time, and effective our buses can be. And I, I really hope we can build on that with more protected bus lanes, both during the emergency and beyond. Um, and I also really like the idea you were discussing with Councilmember Powers as cities have done from Atlanta to Wuhan, of opening up our streets to restaurants to serve outdoors in this crisis. And I'd like to raise both of my Zoom hands for my district to be able to participate in that uh, as well. Moving on to the budget, it was not so long ago when we stood together in the rotunda as the mayor signed the dangerous vehicle abatement program to help address the risk and harm caused by the city's most reckless and recidivist drivers. And, we might have hoped that the COVID-19 crisis would make us all treat human life as more precious, but sadly the opposite seems to be true when it comes to speeding and recidivist reckless driving. Uh, before the crisis, the number of drivers who had 15 or more speed camera violations in a single month was usually zero and sometimes one, two, three, maybe five. In March, it was 18. In April, it was 180. Um, according to research compiled by Brian Howell, in just the three months since February, nearly 700 vehicles have received 15 or more speeding tickets. It's a 3,000% increase from the same period last year. And like you, I'm so grateful that with more people inside, no one has been killed. But with that kind of increase, it's just a matter of time. So even in this pandemic, we really need that dangerous vehicle abatement program. Uh, funding was not included in the preliminary budget because we had only just reached agreement on the program. And when I asked you about it at the preliminary budget hearing before this awful crisis, 
you indicated that the plan was to include it in the executive budget. Unfortunately, the executive budget includes no new needs. So that means there's no funding in the budget right now to implement this program. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. And I just want to make sure I have the number right here. I think I got it wrong in a conversation with Streets Blog earlier. What we need for FY21 for this program is $1.6 million. Is that right? Yeah, Streets Blog, I don't know where that number came from. It was it way came off. from me, so I, I gave them the wrong number. Okay, there you uh, go. <laughs> um, all right, so that's about one-tenth of 1% 1 of the DOT budget. And I don't want you to have to cut another $1.6 million from anything because you've already made the painful cuts we're talking about today. But since the mayor committed to this program at the signing ceremony and since it remains important and since we continue to see recidivist reckless driving, I really hope City Hall Time. can find the $1.6 million we need to save lives and get this program uh, started as, as we agreed. And I know you want to do as well. I mean, I will, I will just say, Council Member, you know, no doubt it, it certainly is painful. We all, we all stood together celebrating your great accomplishment in getting this program passed. And I think we look forward to discussions about when, when we can resume this one. Obviously, you know, it's, it's not only a budgetary matter, we have a hiring freeze, we have more or less sort of a pause on contracts. So there's several elements we need to work through if we're gonna stand up a new program, but obviously we, we know we'll be talking to you about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next council member, please. Uh, can we have questions, please, from Council Member Cabrera, followed by Council Members Rose and Reynoso. Council Member, your clock starts now. Thank you so much. I first want to thank the chairs for getting to us, colleague, quickly. I want to acknowledge that. Thank you so much. It means a lot. Uh, also, Commissioner, I want to thank you for the work uh, yourself and the Bronx Commissioner Navarro uh, that uh, you did in my district this last year. I know when we have uh, the issue of Corona, you know, it tends to cloud all of the work uh, that was done this last year. So I wanna personally thank you. Uh, you've been here in my district and uh, we, we felt the difference uh, in our streets. Uh, so I wanna thank you personally, thank you for that. I wanted to ask you uh, three quick questions. Uh, one is related to e-bikes, uh, as you know, uh, the state uh, gave us green light. Uh, looking forward, uh, if you could uh, give us some leadership and just uh, implement some policies so we don't have to legislate it uh, through uh, in the council. Uh, second, uh, and uh, as you know, many of the advocates have been asking for this. And in light of the fact of the what I heard uh, Chair Drum mention with the city bike. Oh, this, this, I couldn't think of a better timing that we could have uh, to have the e-bikes uh, for healthcare workers and other essential workers. Uh, in terms of second questions related to jobs, uh, what, how much margin do you see that we have right now uh, if we don't get the federal help uh, that we're so hoping? Uh, at, at what point do you let go? Uh, do you find yourself forced uh, to, uh, to call for layoffs? And also equities, uh, and I, I hear about streets uh, uh, perhaps being closed for restaurants, models that we see in other countries and pilot programs. Uh, I will hope uh, that uh, communities of colors will be included in that. Uh, I know everything usually is focused in Manhattan and, uh, and I, what I don't wanna see is our uh, people living for the Bronx, going over there while our restaurants over here keep hurting. And so if we could work on that. And um, uh, and last question, which I, I haven't heard anyone talk about this, you know, summer is coming. We're gonna have 90 degree days, 95 degree days, 100 uh, degree days. Now with, you know, we, we already getting the tints of global warming. How, how do construction workers in the streets uh, for the, they'll use face masks. I mean, it's, it is right now. It's so, <laughs> is there a technology they can use? I, I, I don't know. Have you guys talked about that? I would appreciate your input in, uh, in all these four questions. All right, let, let me make sure I get them all. I think first on the, the e bikes and the e scooters, um, we do need to work with the council. Um, we need together to, to have them officially legalized. We're, we're, we stand ready to work with you all as soon as possible. I certainly think, as many of you ha have said over the years, 
you know, the, the, delivery, the delivery workers on their e-bikes have become real heroes. And I think the city's very grateful and want to work with you all as quickly as you can to, to work out a, a, a protocol on those. Thank um, you. Uh, on the, I'll, I'll refresh my memory, on, on the restaurant question, absolutely, I hear you, you know, obviously we're hearing from a lot of the Manhattan bids, but, you know, we, we were also working with um, the Third Ave bid up in the Bronx on an open street, and, and we certainly want to make anything we would do with restaurants available in a bunch of different neighborhoods, um, and we're thinking that through, and, and obviously hearing interest from all of you about commercial areas in your districts would be helpful. And I apologize. The other two questions were uh, related to the jobs. How much margin do we have right, right now before we lay off in mass uh, for the summer? Right, right, know, for construction so, so in jobs, and again, I think this this is part of why you know this budget discussion is a difficult one. You know, when I look at an agency like mine, where we have exciting new programs that we were looking at, like like the reckless driver program of Council Member Lander. Part of the reason we're not funding that is because we're, we're programs that involve hiring new people are on a pause so that we're trying to sort of preserve the city workforce we have with a hiring freeze. And I think it is it is the mayor's plan and, and OMB's plan to try and maintain that, that we have no layoffs. But I, I think also you've heard the mayor say that the, you know, the, the fiscal picture is uncertain. We're, we're hoping from federal help, um, but, but certainly from the point of view of DOT, we're looking to do everything we can to avoid layoffs, to, to take care of our own workforce, but that does force some of those difficult choices about do you hold off then delay for some period of time new programs and new hiring. In terms of the masks, you are right, they are hot. And you know, as I said, we, we certainly took a pause in our, our roadway and our sidewalk work and, and a number of our outside contractors to figure out the new protocols to make sure that our employees are safe, that they can socially distance, that they have the right equipment, that, that vehicles and tools and everything are being sanitized as they need to be. That's a question we're gonna grapple with. It's a general question that construction workers deal with during heat conditions. Oftentimes they work reduced shifts, they'll get out of the sun in the middle of the day. So I presume we'll, we'll probably even have to do more of that. There are a lot of different mask technologies out there and, and maybe there's some Good ones. The ones that I've seen, though, the particularly the high quality ones, they do tend to be, they tend to make you warm for sure. So it's another thing we'll have to think about with our workers. Thank you for pointing it out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I just want to remind council members we do have the MTA coming in at 3 p.m. So if we could keep our questions short, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Next council member, please. Questions, please, from council member Rose, followed by council members Reynoso and Janai. Councilmember Rose, your clock starts now. So you're having some difficulty with muting the council member? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Can we please restart off. the clock? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Um, and thank you, uh, Chairs Drum and Rodriguez. Um, the department will use state funding of $1.5 million in fiscal 2020 and $6 million in fiscal 2021 in the out years in place of city funds for costs associated with the Staten Island Ferry. Um, You've, um, by eliminating the lower level boarding at the Staten Island St. George Ferry Terminal, DOT anticipates saving $909,000 in, $100, in fiscal year 2021 only. Why is it that there's a savings program in place if additional state funding of $6 million was added and will be used in fiscal uh, year 2021? And, um, Will, will DOT amend the current lower level boarding to include um, senior and persons with disabilities? And um, are you going to remove the lower level boarding plan? And if so, if that, that's- I, I, I've got the questions. And, and look, certainly, as you know, council member, we, we've, um, we've had a lot of challenges with the Staten Island Ferry. We saw ridership plummet by around 90%. And we started having a lot of challenges with our workforce. A lot of folks testing positive, um, being out sick and quarantining. 
And so, you know, we thought it was prudent to, as you know, re reduce service frequencies. And that has enabled us to regularly clean and sterilize the boats, important both for our workforce and for the passengers. Now everybody has all the proper PPEs, masks. We're also giving masks away uh, at, at both terminals. And just to preserve the workforce, we saw, for example, that low level boarding, we were getting very, very low numbers. They are always open for people with disabilities and people with bikes. There's a separate entrance that they use, but the bigger lower level boarding we were seeing, you know, on some of the runs, we were literally just getting a handful of folks. So as we see ridership numbers start to rise again, we will take, we will take a look at those. But for now, it's just, we were serving very few people and using up the a lot. question was that state, the state apparently put funds in for um, the Staten Island Ferry. Um, so, uh, why did that necessitate a cut um, right, in service? We, and we, and um, I, I just want to I want to uh, get this get you to say this also. Um, are you going to commit to reinstating full ferry service um, every thirty minutes after the pause for twenty four seven after the pause? Right. So. so we're grateful that the state gave us that money. We're using it for the ferry, but you know the city overall is facing you know a billions and billions of dollars of revenue losses by the end of the year, an extra Time. $3 billion in coronavirus costs. So again, since the ridership had plummeted so dramatically with the ferry, it's one of the ways uh, the city is is you know looking to to reduce some of its expenditures. We have said, as you know, to your colleagues, you know, as ridership starts to go up, as we have better workforce availability, uh, and we're sure we have all the protective equipment, we will start to rekindle the service again. In, in we wanted that for the, for the record, we wanted that. I'm sorry? I wanted to get you on the record. I wanted to get you on the record saying that. Well, I. I I'm, I, you know, I, I want to be a little cautious in that I, I can't totally predict the trajectory, but I think as we have said, as we get back to, you know, normal levels of ridership, we will continue with normal levels of service with one caveat, the, the, the sanitizing of the boats and making sure they're safe for passengers and for the crew is a new factor here that we're going to have to work in with all our operations. Okay. Thank you. Okay, our next council member. Uh, can we have questions from council member Reynoso followed by council members Jonai and Miller. Council member, your call starts now. Thank you. Hello, commissioner. I hope you're doing well and uh, everyone in, uh, in the Department of Transportation is doing well. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to focus on businesses uh, and really focus on street closures uh, in an attempt to expand their space uh, in order to allow for the reopening to when it happens to be to be helpful and productive to to these business owners um, i'm also going to plug uh grand street uh from driggs all the way up to the waterfront uh, i've actually had three businesses come to me looking to know if they could put uh chairs out in the streets i said you can't can't close down the streets by yourself you got to let dot do it but just really being thoughtful in this time. It seems like a lot of people are biking. They are. A lot of people are biking. This, uh, by the way, I just want to say there was, there's a shop that's seen almost like a 400% increase in sales of bikes since the coronavirus. So as obvious people are doing this more, uh, it, it is the time when there are less cars in the road to really take advantage about putting, putting bike lanes down, um, closing some streets, adding plazas, and in these, in these, cases, I'm um, shutting streets for pedestrians and for businesses. So I just wanted to um, ask, I know you said you got a team together. When can we expect uh, uh, something, some form of study or conversation coming from the mayor that speaks to taking advantage of our uh, supposedly uh, less frequented streets? Well, I, I would certainly say, based on, on what I'm hearing from all of you today, you know, as I mentioned, the, the mayor has started up a, a, a surface transportation council. I clearly want to put this high on the agenda and, and work with you all because it, it appears there's a big interest in it. You know, I want to be careful. Now, some of the streets that are being referenced, I think you mentioned Grand Street. I think that's a bus route and a truck route. So obviously, we'll, we'll have to work through some of those details. But I think I'm hearing loud and clear from many of you. This is something you're hearing from local businesses. Uh, and I think could go a great way towards making our streets, you know, safer and more inviting and helping some of these restaurants and stores 
start to open up and, and see some business again. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, yeah, just one more, one more quick one. It's just uh, I want to emphasize that Grand Street North of Driggs is not a bus route. Um, Grand Street South is. So I just want to make sure that that's noted. Okay, North um, of Drake. And again, just really want to highlight and put a top priority, businesses and streets. Thank you, Commissioner. So I would just say again, all our borough commissioners are taking incoming from everybody on all the streets they'd like us to look at. And we're trying to be quick and nimble in that. So, um, you know, look forward to taking a look. <clears throat> Thank you. Let me get my pitch in for the restaurants and streets as well. So uh, if you're taking notes, please consider Jackson Heights Elmhurst. All right, we'll go to our next council member. Council member Jonai, followed by council members Miller and Kozowitz. Council member, your clock starts now. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank the chairs and thank the commission. I just wanna echo, and I'll pick up on this also, the entire borough of the Bronx sidewalk cafes. Rather than just a district commissioner, um, the restaurants need it. It'll add a little activity to what is now desolate. I want to pick up and echo on some of the comments about uh, trash. We've discussed this in prior uh, hearings as well. When it comes to the MTA and DOT and the responsibilities between sanitation, the MTA is only responsible for two feet from the building structure. The rest of the sidewalk falls into no man's land. And we go back and forth on this often. Sanitation says it's DOT, DOT turns around and says it's MTA, and it seems like Groundhog's Day all over again, which now brings, segues right into the parkways. Last year, we had quite a few conversations about parkland, who's responsible for maintenance, who's going to do the work. It falls into that not my responsibility category, similar to the train stations. I don't, I'm hopeful that we can avoid a replay of last year where the grass grew to a point of four plus feet high. It is not what we'd like to see. I'm hopeful that you'll be working this out with the other commissioners, whether it be parks commissioner or sanitation ahead of the scheduled pre-cut season. Um, and I think I, I'll wrap it up with that. So commissioner, if you can give me a commitment to working on the grass, the cleanup of the trash uh, and echoing, uh, opening up the entire borough of the Bronx. We're permitted while understanding we have ADA compliance for our sidewalks, we need wheelchairs to get by and the other requirements um, and, and where we have tree pits, that obviously gonna be another problem. We, we, we'll, we'll make sure we, we try and get ahead of that, the, the grass issue we, we had last year. And I think we did finally work it out. We'll, we'll get on top of that. And look, again, I'm, I'm glad to hear from all of you how much interest there is in, in opening the streets up to, to restaurants and businesses and, and really wanna take that back to the mayor and, and my sister agencies and, and get to work on how we can start to make that happen. And I wanna correct you on something that you said earlier about where you're putting cameras in and uh, where road dining is going in. You said you rely on uh, incidents, uh, the report that was issued. Uh, I bring up Morris Park again. It was delisted from the high priority, but yet it was included into road dieting. So when you refer to avenues where there are high incidents or number of crashes or fatalities, that has not been the case. It's arbitrary on where you install or where you do road dieting or where you implement other traffic measures. And I'd rather you um, all true to the report to decide where you're going to implement them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll go to our next council member. Can we hear please from council member Miller followed by council members Kozlowitz and Levin. Your time starts now, council member. Good afternoon, everyone. Cheers, Drum and Cheers Rodriguez. Uh, Commission, it's good to see you again. I'm glad everybody's healthy and safe. Um, I have a couple of questions. First, on uh, the Better Bus Network that 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 we, we initiative that that we all have been been working on. Uh, in lieu of the proposed cuts, do we have the capacity to implement the transit signaling priority uh, that we uh, had anticipated? 
as well as some of the work that we've started in major hubs such as Archer Avenue and other places throughout the city. You know, we had the plastic ballads and that didn't work and it came out and we have other plans. Um, are, are we going to have the ability to see these uh, 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 bus networks be, uh, uh, see them full to full, full fruition uh, in the work that we had started? And, and so hopefully we can do that. And then um, I want to talk about some of the signage and the shop work that has been late, to say the least. We have we, we have a complete area of change where the signs have almost vanished. You don't know where you are. And signs that go down, it takes years for them to be replaced. And so we're very much uh, concerned about whether or not uh, the, the cuts that we see are going to impact the work that we are behind on. And then finally, Councilmember Adams uh, introduced legislation uh, last year, co-signed, co-sponsored that um, that would examine the need for one-way streets in, in areas that have high density now that didn't enjoy the type of density uh, years back. And, and, and so um, I think the initial response was uh, that the legislation was not ne necessary uh, because uh, the borough commissioners had the capacity to do that on their own. Over the past two years, we have done one street, uh, a total of two blocks. And um, we had two cars can no longer drive down these streets. They need to be one ways. And we're hoping that we can see that uh, work continue to be done. All right, uh, no, Council, let, me, let me try and answer your questions. First of all, I'm happy to say we are keeping pace with, with transit signal priority. We're going to hit our target this year. That, that work, I think we're going to be able to continue to do at the same pace. It, it's, it's, we've actually, I, I want to compliment my traffic ops team. They've continued over the past few years to find ways to do that at a more and more affordable price and, and have really gotten good at doing it. So we'll keep up with that. I know, unfortunately, the Archer Avenue um, Pilot did not work so well, but but Archer Avenue is still very high on our list. Um, something we're going to be talking to the MTA about. I mean, we recognize we got to we have to continue to figure out some some ways to to make that route work better. Uh, and we'll we'll come back at you with some ideas there. On um, on signage, are you saying you're seeing places where signs are falling down and not being replaced? Um, yes, some some have been some have actually been taken down. And we've asked to put them back and, they're, and they're, they're kind of where you have the daylighting on the corners and people want to park on the corner. So they've actually removed the signs. And so we've asked that they be put back up and there's a number of locations they haven't gone up for nearly two years. And All some right. and then some are just faded, totally faded. Let, let me let me take a look at that. And on the one way streets, I think if I remember the bill and I, I'm not sure I completely it was sort of requiring us to look at them every it just seemed like it was perhaps a lot of work to get at what is clearly a sort of a targeted problem in some neighborhoods. And I think our process has been that the community board has to sign off on the one-way streets. And I think is that sort Correct. of, well, I think what's holding things up perhaps in, in Southeastern Queens. And maybe we need to, with Council Member Adams, just brainstorm a bit about how to deal with that log jam. Because in other well, we parts of the city, I for one-way street conversions. Okay, thanks. We have thank to move you. on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next council member, please. Can we please have council member Kozlowitz followed by council members Levin and Cohen. Council member, your clock starts now. Okay, thank you. It's good seeing you. I'm wondering, you may have spoken about this before. I had to leave for a little while. The uh, construction on Queens Boulevard bike lanes, where is that at? Um, well, that's a good question, Council Member. Uh, at the moment, um, there were some things we were trying to wrap up with that project before coronavirus hit. Um, some work with the, a, a design firm and, and our, our state and, and federal uh, overseers. Um, coronavirus has kind of put that on a bit of a pause. So um, at the moment, I, I don't have a totally clear answer about when we're going to move forward with that project, so um, that that's one where we're, we're going to have to come back to you all. It's 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 it, it's hit a few snags related to, to COVID nineteen. Okay, and one more: the fences along Queens Boulevard up until now have been replaced rapidly. Will budget cuts prevent that from happening when a car goes into it and takes it down? 
No, I mean that that is not something where we we want to see any uh, any reductions in in terms of of replacements. Okay, thank you, and thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member. And we're going to go to our next one. We have uh, three more after this. Can we please hear uh, from Council Member Levin, followed by Council Members Cohen and Richards? Council Member Levin, your clock starts now. Hi, Commissioner. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, one uh, uh, quick point, uh, uh, following up on what Councilmember Lander uh, spoke about and the need for the um, uh, increased accountability on, um, on repeat uh, speeders. Um, you know, the numbers that he cited are um, beyond alarming, a 30-fold increase um, in, um, in, in, in uh, repeat speeders. Um, and so we have, you know, if, if we're gonna be looking at um, increased social distancing, um, probably well into the coming fiscal year, um, <clears throat> we need to make sure that there are resources in place uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to reduce that, whether it's through the enforcement or, um, you know, an enforcement of the existing law or NYPD enforcement, um, <clears throat> speed cameras, um, uh, any, all the above, um, because it's, it's a, a huge hazard and um, uh, people should not be um, getting away with, with uh, that, that type of repeat dangerous behavior. Um, I mean, at least they are getting a lot of speeding tickets. <laughs> Obviously, some of them, it's, it's not quite teaching them the lesson we would hope. And, and look, as I said to Council Member Lander, you know, we obviously this will be a discussion with the council about what what is just going to be the timing in this budget climate for, for standing up new programs. We certainly agree that this one is an important one. We're just dealing with, uh, you know, some difficult budget realities at the moment. But just, I mean, it, it's, it's directly related to the to the pandemic itself, you know, the, the, it's, it, the situation is made worse um, because of the social so. Well, I, I, I will just say it is a strange phenomenon, though, which is speeding is way up, but, but you know, knock on wood, fatalities are way down. Um, it, right. it, it's, a strange, it's a strange combo at the moment. And I, look, I don't want to take it for granted because as more people start to get out in the warm weather, those, 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 uh, those facts could change. So, uh, you know, again, we're, we're not lacking in vigilance. And, and we are just so you know, with all the speed camera data we're getting, we are giving it, you know, regularly to PD to show them the corridors where we're seeing the most egregious speeding and they are trying to do targeted enforcement in those areas. Okay. Um, all right, just let's, let's keep that conversation going because, um, you know, if, if, if this is one that, that'll save lives. And so I think it's important to gear up on that. Okay. Thank you. And thank you very much. Next council member. Um, can we please hear from council member Cohen followed by council members Richards and Gredenchuk. Your time will start now. Thank you very much. Good to see you commissioner. Hi council member. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you about Marshall Parkway right now. Uh, you know, but I am concerned about one particular project that we've been working on and uh, you know, I'm concerned uh, about uh, potential budget impacts uh, we've been working on trying to come up with some kind of resolution for private streets. Uh, and I, I'm curious if you know the status. I've been promised that, that we were very close to coming up with a proposal, uh, but I, I have not been briefed if there is one yet. And now I'm a little concerned. I would really hate it. Like this is an ongoing problem in my district. It's really one I'd like to solve before I leave and time is starting to tick on me. So uh, I wonder if you know the status of that. And I know it's a citywide problem as well as my district. Right, and and we've heard about it in in you know probably most of all in Staten Island, but but it is a challenge in in at least probably four of the five boroughs, pro probably a little less so in Manhattan. Um, look, I, I I think the, the challenge is for the city to assume ownership of all the private streets is is a, a sort of an epically expensive undertaking, billions and billions of dollars. I I think the question we've been grappling with, and it's probably an even more acute question. Uh, in these difficult fiscal times is, is there some system for looking at the streets most in need of repair, you know, probably in the most underserved neighborhoods, and is that a place to start? 
And I think that's where the conversation was headed. I'll admit, I don't know that, that we achieved resolution and, and now we would have to look at that in, in light of the current budget climate. But I think that would be potentially the way to go, which is come up with some kind of a, you know, an evaluation system of the streets that were most in need of repairs, you know, in the most, you know, probably disadvantaged neighborhoods with the fewest resources and prioritize those to start with. Um, and, and maybe that can, can be a part of this budget negotiation, uh, you know, if, if that's something members have an interest in. I mean, I have some orphan streets that really, you know, they, they happen to be in more affluent parts of the district, but I don't know that, you know, if you can't drive to your home, I don't know what the answer is. I, that, that, you know, they, the streets apparently belong to long defunct associations uh, and they're really orphans and, and the conditions are abominable. Um, there just has to be a resolution and, uh, you know, whether that, you, know, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of times where I think as a guiding principle, uh, people in the greatest need, but, you know, it's, it's not passable. I don't know if it matters unless you happen to be able to afford a tank to drive home and that we just need to make sure that people can get to their homes. Yeah, look, it, it, it's an enormous challenge. It's just the problem is the scale of it is sort of a, a multi-billion dollar challenge. So again, you know, happy to continue that dialogue, you know, as, as, as part of these budget deliberations, it's certainly something we can talk about, but it, it does come with a big price tag. I just like to, I know that you said, I'd like to know if we could get a timeline to find the status, at least of what your, your work had. Time expired. Um, well, Council Member Cohen, happy to, to follow up with you on this, this topic. I'll, I'll, I'll reach Thank out. Thank you. We are very pressed for time, so I'm going to move on to the next council member, please. May we please hear from Council Member Richards, followed by Council Members Grudenchik and Holden. Uh, well, sorry, thank you. Grudenchik, Deutsch. Thank Hope you. that's not cutting into my time, but thank you, Commissioner, for uh, all, all your work. And uh, if you hear uh, trucks in the background of, of this uh, hearing, that is trucks repaving Francis Lewis. So I wanna thank you uh, finally, it's been a long time coming. Uh, and matter of fact, I can't even leave my block because you have blocked off all the blocks. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, Far Rockaway Plaza and I know you mentioned it early so we don't anticipate any budget cuts there. I also wanted to add, uh, just ask a, a few things. Of course, I'm supportive of SBS and we should try to preserve that. Uh, as much as possible to move people in buses during this period in a safe manner. And then I wanted to hear about the bike share program, a line bike, for instance, where we at with that specific program. And I also, of course, have to hopelessly plug uh, South Queens. You know, we, we heard about this, these open street programs, uh, but quite frankly, we didn't see any streets in Southeast Queens. Are we not worthy enough uh, for, for open streets, I, I'm, I'm a little troubled by that. So I'm hoping that uh, your administration is certainly looking at opening up some streets in South Queens somewhere. Um, and if, you know, I'm sure Councilmember Miller and Adams uh, have some recommendations and we would have some recommendations for open space as well for our community. So that's, that's where I'm at, Far Rockaway Plaza. Thank you for paving, bike share. Of course, SBS, let's keep that going and then also uh, open streets for Southeast Queens. All right, thank you, Councilor. As I mentioned, the, the Far Rockaway project is moving forward. It's on schedule. I think we're starting, this, we're starting construction this construction season. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's about 30 million, right? Still, so we, we have yeah, not cut that. Double check on that number. And, and I think anticipating um, completion in, in 2022, uh, would be delighted to work with you and your colleagues on um, open streets. You can you can reach out to the borough commissioner's office. We have a <clears throat> excuse me a survey you can fill out online. But obviously, we want to get to 100 miles, and that will hopefully take us into every district that wants us and um, every neighborhood that's interested in this. And we're very excited about that. In terms of um, bikes and scooters, so. Um, you know, I think as I was saying to your colleagues, we've seen a big explosion in interest in cycling during COVID-19. We're going to, as part of the mayor's, this Surface Transportation Council that he's put together, take a look at all the ways we can expand cycling. We're going to have City Bike be a part of the council. And I know you had certainly had an interest in the Rockaways in perhaps being one of the first sites for e-scooters. Um, 
and for that, we you know are awaiting uh, you know working with the council to to sort of take the steps that are needed to legalize those here in the city. Thank you. Stay safe. I look forward to following up on those items. Thank you very much. Next council member, please. Council member Gradenchek, followed by council members Deutsch and Holden. Uh, and that'll be it. Thank you. Starting time. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, just, uh, just quickly, uh, I, I know you're, you're concerned about this, Mr. Transportation Commissioner. You know, um, I represent the Eastern Rim of Queens along with Paul Malone and uh, Danique Miller and um, Donovan. And I am extremely concerned, as I know you are, that once we start to go back to work and people may be a bit leery of getting on the subway, not that I have any subways in my district, but um, I am concerned that we are going to have Carmageddon or whatever you want to call it, uh, because there's really no easy way to get um, into Manhattan or Western Queens. And I'm, I'm sure the same is true of, of uh, Southern Brooklyn going into downtown Brooklyn. So my suggestion, my, my colleague, Danique Miller, was, uh, is a great champion and I've joined him on the Atlantic ticket and Andrew Cohn uh, has also joined us um, to open up Metro North and the Long Island Railroad in New York City um, at a much reduced cost. Now, I know that, that you do not run the MTA, um, but I know that the mayor has appointees on the MTA board, and we would love to have your and the mayor's support on this issue because it basically costs nothing because very, very few people are riding the trains as it is. Um, it would be a great way. The, the, the infrastructure exists. We are not building subways up Hillside Avenue. We're not going to build a subway in my lifetime anyway. Uh, on the Long Island Expressway or even out to Southeast Queens, the, the, the money just isn't there. So I would appreciate that. Um, and the other thing that I, I would like you to think about, um, and I know it's not even in New York City, but also again, in the MTA's bailiwick, and, and I'll be talking to the governor's people about this, uh, a park and ride at Belmont Park. Uh, we have a train station there. They could run trains. They could run a couple of trains at rush hour. Um, I know that thanks to, greatly to the intercession of uh, Chair Leroy Comrie of the Senate Corporations Committee, we will be getting a full-time train station there, but this would be something that could be done quickly. The parking is there. Um, it's not like people are going to the racetrack because it's not even open. So um, it would be a way to do it cheaply and just to put those thoughts in your mind and I will yield my other 50 seconds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I, I would say we are certainly focused on the issue of the sort of the Carmageddon, as you say. This the council, this the mayor has put together is going to look at that. And his two MTA appointees, um, Bob Lynn and David Jones, are on the council. So I will certainly make sure I talk to them. I think we totally agree with you. We've all been champions of making city ticket or whatever freedom ticket, whatever it's called, more available to city residents. Uh, you know, at an affordable yeah. price. It's I mean, a very good idea. Just in Adrian Adams district at Rochdale Village, you have 6,000 families living there. That's hundreds of people you could take off buses and out of cars um, right there and get them into Manhattan in a half an hour. Thank you. Good suggestion. Okay, we have our next council member, please. Uh, we have a final question from council member Holden. Starting time. Hi, commissioner. Hi, Thanks for your great testimony. Thanks for sitting through this. Um, by the way, the open streets in Forest Park is working well. Thank you very much for that. Oh, Glad to hear that. <laughs> Once um, more? Uh, you never expected from me, right? Uh, but it, it is working well, and it's, uh, it's, it's, people are enjoying it. But anyway, um, graffiti has exploded in my district. I, didn't, I don't know if you touched upon this because I had to step out for a while. But um, And it's, I think it's all over the city now, and I know you're – you suspended the program of cleaning it for a while. When do you expect that to get on board again? We, we are restarting that, that council member. And if there are places where you're seeing a lot of graffiti, let, let Nicole Garcia's office know and we will get folks out to do some cleaning. But, but I also have some volunteers that are willing to help out if we got the paint. Is that a possibility? Because sometimes, you know, it's, it's so overwhelming that we want to get the graffiti off within 24 hours. It's not always possible for the city to do it, but we have volunteers. Uh, right. I'd like it, to match the paint. In, in some places you would paint over, in some places we bring chemicals that actually melt the graffiti away. So happy to talk to you about that. I don't think we're turning down volunteers if, if there's a place they can be useful. Great, thanks, thanks, Commissioner. And, and a couple other points. Uh, I wanna um, just echo, we, uh, we have a lot of trash on the arterial highways. 
Um, you know, it's, all, it's bad in normal times, but now it's much worse. So uh, I'll talk to uh, Commissioner Garcia about that. And is there any way to expand the ad adopt a, a highway program uh, to, to get more businesses or people involved in that? Yeah, we, we have we have at various times sort of made a push on that campaign and right in, in light of actually the, the budget hardships the city is facing, um, probably good to do another round. And that, that's something we've actually t typically done in conjunction with uh, with council members and borough president. So so we can come back to you on that. Great. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member. We do have one more from uh, Council Member Deutsch. We skipped over him and I'm sorry about that. Can Council Member Deutsch. Starting time. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my, I have two questions. My first question is regarding speed cameras. So although I don't uh, uh, condone speeders, you have uh, the speed cameras around the schools uh, throughout the city and the schools have been closed. Uh, question is, uh, are those cameras still in operation? And number two, if they are, what is the rationale behind it? And my second question is, is um, when you continue to do all the essential uh, work for the infrastructure, uh, are those, uh, is that work gonna be given to New York City contractors opposed to contractors who are based out of state? Because our businesses have been suffering even before COVID and uh, over COVID they have been suff suffering tremendously. So I want to know how many contractors uh, do, does DOT use that are out of New York City? And if you do have how many, if you, if you can consider using New York City contractors? So our contracting, is, as you may know, council member, is done under some of, I think, the most complicated uh, procurement rules in the land. And for us, it partially depends on where the funding comes from. If the funding is federal, um, then I'm not able to have a, a New York preference. If it's state, I'm not necessarily able to have a New York City preference. And if it's just local funding, then I have to work through the city's procurement rules about the lowest bid and all that. We, we, we certainly want to support uh, local firms. And I think a lot, of our, a lot of our contracts do come from New York City firms. And I'm actually going to have my folks, maybe we can, we can check on what that, that, uh, that percentage is. But I, I always, in the case of my procurements, have to follow whatever are the relevant um, procurement rules, which, you know, depending on- But you the, do the have policy. contractors, but you do have contractors based out of New York City, correct? Oh, quite a few. Yes, for sure. Okay, for sure. so that's and something that we should look into. I'll get, I'm happy to get okay, to I'll that percentage. On the, on the speed cameras, the, the, the bill that the, the state passed last year expanding the program does allow us to, to run them year round, for, you know, all day long. And I, I think, look, we recognize school is out, but I think as, as you're hearing today in this discussion, speeding has doubled on our roadways. It's, it's been astonishing. And anyone I, I know who's been out and, and just, I certainly see this in my own neighborhood, cars going at tremendous speeds. And, and so we think right now those cameras are, are really doing a lot to, to save lives. And we want to keep them on. All right, because people are questioning if those, if those cameras are in operation, maybe we should let them know. So this way it will, it will reduce speeding and it doesn't become a gotcha camera. Uh, people, the, the, the focus of it and the objection of having those cameras is to reduce speeding. And we need to let the public know that those cameras are in operation. I'm inspired. Okay, thank you very much. And now Council uh, Chair Rodriguez will close this hearing out and we're going to move right into the MTA portion uh, without a break. So uh, Chairman Rodriguez, did you want to close us out on this part of the hearing? Chairman Rodriguez unmuted. Appears that we've lost Chair Rodriguez's audio. Okay, so we'll give him an opportunity when he comes back, because uh, I think we should move on to uh, the MTA at this point. I do want to thank you, Commissioner Trottenberg, for coming in and for providing testimony, and uh, we're most grateful to you. We'll follow up with other questions uh, later on. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Chairman Rodriguez. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So I'm now going to call on the members of the New York City Transit to testify. 
We will now hear testimony from interim president of the New York City Transit, Sarah Feinberg. Oh, are you back? Yes, okay, yes, Chair. I do have a few. Certainly. I have a few Yeah, to the deal. I don't know what happened with the technical part, but before you leave, if you. Chair Rodriguez, did you want to make a statement? I would like to, I say I have still, whatever happened, I was disconnected right now. I did have some final question to the DOT commissioner. Okay, so I think she may have left, but what we'll do is we'll follow up with questions. I'm sorry, uh, we didn't hear you responding. Okay. I, I wouldn't say this guy. Okay, I can't, it's hard to hear you. I, you're breaking up. She, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg is here. Do you want to ask? I do, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Commissioner. Commissioner Trottenberg, can you hear me? No, we can't, uh, ch Chair. Yeah, you're a little hard to hear. Okay, so Commissioner, I do have some final questions. And, and, and I would like also to call the attention that the MTA should be patient. They did not come to the preliminary budget hearing and they should give the time for us to stay with the question that we have today. Commissioner, I, I have one electric bike and electric scooter. As you say that you're ready to work with us, it, I personally as a chairman of this committee is ready to work with, with Speaker Johnson and my colleague and the advocate. But we also have to figure out some safety concern that also has been brought by has been brought by some senior citizens and other uh, residents. Are you also looking at as we definitely will be on board for the electrical bike, electrical scooter, be legal, but are you also looking already to some safety concern that we should address? I apologize, Mr. Chairman, you're, you're fading in and out a little bit. I didn't quite get the whole question. With the, with the DOT, are you ready? Are you looking to some a safety matter related to the bike and electrical scooter that should also be addressed as you move forward on conversation with the speaker, my colleague, and also uh, residents, especially senior citizens, as we would like to legalize electrical scooter and electrical bike. I mean, uh, of course, Mr. Chairman, this is this is going to be a conversation with the council, and um, you know, as you know, the, the state bill actually did not legalize them in Manhattan; only legalized them potentially in the outer boroughs upon the council's uh, and the administration's action. And obviously, I think. If we're going forward with the scooters, we would do it as a pilot project where we would test it out, perhaps in a less dense neighborhood, and and make sure we did very much figure out the the safety protocols and that it was something people felt comfortable with. Okay, are you open to work uh, from your role with the administration and discuss the possibility that we uh, uh, give a forgiveness or, or parking ticket? to first respond I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, you, you cut out again. Chair Rodriguez, let's take this up. Will you be open to the Chair Rodriguez, let's take this up in written questions. We can't hear you, we're having technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Give me one second and I will uh, re-enter. I do, give me one Chair second. We have MTA here and they're only staying until 4.10. Chair Rodriguez, can you hear me? I do. I'm trying to enter it through my other phone, and that's okay. Can you hear me now? 
Quickly, please. I mute right now. Can someone unmute me? Chair Rodriguez, we're going to have to move on, and we'll get back to you uh, and uh, allow follow-up questions at a later time because we have only a few minutes left. We're already way over schedule. So I want to thank you, Commissioner, for coming in, and uh, we'll follow up with questions with you yes, at a later yes, time. We'll, we'll take all the questions and, and provide the committee with answers. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we're now going to move on to uh, the MTA, New York City Transit, and I'm going to um, ask my colleagues uh, who will be joining us for the MTA portion of the hearing to remain on the Zoom, excuse me. And uh, anyway, we have been joined by, now I'm lost, okay. Uh, by uh, Sarah Feinberg, Ms. Feinberg is joined by David Keller, the Acting Director of Budgets, and John O'Lever, the Chief Development Officer. I'm going to ask the Council Committee uh, the committee council, excuse me, to please administer the affirmation. Um, thank you. Do you believe, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Ms. Feinberg? I do. Mr. Keller? Yes. Uh, Mr. Lieber? Is Mr. Lieber with us? I, I do. I'm, I'm with you and I do. Thank you. Uh, you President Feinberg, uh, you may begin when ready. Okay, thank you so much and thanks for holding this hearing. Good afternoon and thank you for having me, particularly to Speaker Johnson and Chairs Rodriguez and Drum. My name is Sarah Feinberg. I'm Interim President of New York City Transit. I'm joined by Jano Lieber, MTA Chief Development Officer and President of MTA Construction and Development and David Keller, Acting Director of Management and Budget for the MTA. Like every government agency, organization, and industry across the country, the MTA has been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Developing our response has been my biggest focus since starting as interim president at New York City Transit. Things are moving quickly and our incredible workforce has not missed a beat. I am awed daily by their dedication. They are the backbone of every action we've taken, stepping up day in and day out after, despite their own fears and anxieties. Last week, we made the historic decision to close the subways overnight from 1 to 5 a.m., which has so far proved successful in shoring up the safety of our system. Hundreds of cleaners and staff have been mobilized for this effort to move to more aggressively clean and disinfect stations, subway cars, and buses. We're also working with the city to connect more unsheltered New Yorkers with the critical services they need and deserve during this difficult time. We wouldn't be able to do this work without the partnership of the city and the NYPD. It's crucial that we continue to work together in the long term to protect our brave and heroic workforce, essential customers, and those who will return to the subway in the future. Closing the system overnight was a painstaking decision that we did not take lightly. The subway is part of the fabric of New York City, and it is core to our identity as a city. For 115 years, the MTA has operated service 24 hours a day with only rare interruptions. But extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. People who devote their careers to transportation don't relish any moment when they have to close it to the public. And yet in these strange times, I could not be prouder of the heroic work that was done last week. It was a Herculean logistical challenge brought together on an unbelievable time frame, and New York City Transit more than rose to the occasion. If there's any silver lining to the overnight closure, it's that we're not just cleaning more often, but we're changing the way that we clean. We've prioritized testing of innovative solutions like UV, antimicrobials, and electro electrostatic sprayers that we can continue to use once this crisis passes and we get used to a new normal. This week, we began piloting UV technology for use on subway cars and buses. We're looking to see if UVs are more efficient and less expensive than our current efforts. The bottom line for our customers is that things underground will look different than what they're used to, but they can trust that safety will continue to be our guiding principle. I can't emphasize enough just how vital a role the city's support plays in our response. I'm grateful for the commitment we've received from NYPD to secure stations while our crews execute this vital cleaning program. More than a thousand officers have been patrolling overnight. The bottom line is that the MTA is a transportation agency and our expertise is not in social services. The subways are not a replacement for the shelter system. 
And this is where we need the city to step up and keep stepping up, not until the weather breaks or a cold spell is over, but day after day for the long haul. Protecting public health and safety is at the core of every action that we've taken. The MTA has been a global leader among transit agencies since day one, acting more quickly than our national and international counterparts, some of whom have only just started to adopt measures we put in place weeks ago. Madam President, may I ask you to, Madam President, may I ask you to summarize because we have very limited time. Yeah, I actually was trying to do so and it skipped large portions, which probably made it feel a little disconnected, but- I'm Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Would you prefer I just take questions? That, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that offer. That would be wonderful. Please. Thank you very, very much. You ask, me, right. you ask me a broad array of questions and we'll probably hit everything I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, I think we'll cover everything is right. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. I appreciate it. Right. And our first questioner is Council Member uh, and Co-Chair Rodriguez. First of all, I'm a little dis I'm not a little, I'm disappointed. Now with the new president of the new city of transit, and a lot of respect to you and I look to keep working with you. But now we have to be dealing with the pressure because they only have 40 minutes, 50 minutes. That's unfair. They didn't come to the preliminary budget. Now is the time for us, I get it that especially you chairman of finance and my colleague, they can be tired long day. But for us to be rushing the time and cutting the time for five to three minutes and not rushing and not to hear specific from the MTA because they have to step out and go to another meeting, that's unacceptable. The New York City cannot be only seen as the one that they can for help when they need support from the congestion price, when they need additional capital when they need a million dollars. We should demand for them to have as much time as we need them, at least from the perspective on how much time we need the MTA. If we from the council have to cut the time because we have all the business to do, I understand it. But for me, this is unacceptable from the MTA as an institution. But going straight, you know, I, I'm very disappointed when it comes to the MTA, when we announced at the beginning that they needed to clean the station, including the entry of the station, that the answer that I got was directly from their communication person that that's on the DOT jurisdiction. So now, again, President of New York City Transit, you know, the whole thing, nothing as a personal level, but as an institution, are you committed to also take responsibility to clean the entry of stations so that the station, the underserved community are as clean as those at Colombo Circle and 96, 96 and 72nd and Broadway. So first of all, can they hear me? So, so first of all, um, thank you for the question. So first of all, we've, we've had good conversations before by phone and I'm happy to continue those conversations with you one on one and with your colleagues and also when it's uh, when it's more appropriate when we're beyond the pandemic obviously happy to meet in person as well. Uh, I apologize that our time is short today I think in the future if there's more notice on the hearing we might be able to accommodate. Um, uh, more folks to meet for longer, but I can um, assure you that every station is being cleaned, regardless of what neighborhood it is in we have searched the flooded the system with more than 2500 cleaners and they are hitting every station every car uh and they're hitting stations twice a day and so um the suggestion that we are only cleaning some stations is just it's just false the entry of the station in on the third community are they the entry is that on the dot responsibility or is that under the mta responsibility well, if you're referring to something that's within the station itself, that's something we're cleaning. But if you're referring to something that's outside of the station, we're likely, we're unlikely to be cleaning that because that would be, I assume, city property. So it's exactly. So we can see, and please, the coronavirus is put in the face of the city. For us to say that the station has, are as clean in all the stations across the neighborhood, go and tell that story to people who live in the Bronx. 
go and compare, take picture and see at the station in underserved communities and then look at Colombo Circle. You saying that they are clean the same. Sir, I, I absolutely believe that they're all being cleaned. Absolutely. Now I cannot, I cannot tell you what is happening outside of the station. I can promise you that that uh, just owning every single car and cleaning every single car in our fleet and every single station twice a day is about all we can handle at this point. I can't vouch for what's outside of the station. Okay, and and this time it's not about it's not about the thing that we can do after the coronavirus. No, this for is God's something sake, that we'll continue. For God's sake, the Wolfie New Yorker left the city. They went to the Hobson Valley. They went to the Hunter. And the other Wolfie one, they had the 3,000 square feet in their apartments. You know, from where we had the big numbers of people, the larger numbers with the virus and dying in the poorest neighborhood. They take the train. You know who could, didn't have the privilege to work from their, from their house? from their apartments, the undocumented New Yorkers, the working class New Yorkers. So unless the leadership in our state in the city understand that equity is a big issue and we continue putting a band-aid in this crisis, we will not be ready to be prepared for the second wave of this coronavirus. So my call is out. First of all, we need to pay attention across the board, not only to the inside of the station, but at the end station. And then when you look at what things that we can do, I would like to know for how long will the train be closed from one in the morning to five in the morning? And I don't, I know the answer can be for as long as it takes on the coronavirus. But you know who do, who's waiting to know the time frame? those who need to take the trains in the morning. So do you have a plan on for how long the train will be closed from 1 to 5 a.m.? So what the governor has said and what I certainly agree with is that we will continue to clean the system and surge the system with cleaners throughout the pandemic. So the safety of our workforce and the safety of the workers that we're moving and the people in our ridership is our top priority. And so we're going to continue to clean the system uh, overnight through the pandemic. Um, and, and sir, I think I agree with you that um, the health of our ridership is number one. I, I disagree with the fact that you're suggesting that the system is clean in some places and not clean in others. If we have issues there, I want to know about them. We're trying to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep the system as clean and as safe as possible for everyone. In terms of the overnight service, we're also making sure that we for those who are depending on the subway service between one and five in the morning, we have added an enormous amount of bus service. We've enhanced local service. We've added additional express route, express bus service. And we're also, in, also offering our vehicle for hire program for those whose commutes would be longer than an hour and 20 minutes or require three or more stops. And so I believe from the numbers I'm seeing that we are accommodating folks, but if there are folks that, who are unable to be accommodated, we absolutely wanna know about it. I, in my last, my last comment or question, I know that my colleague also had the question is about guy, you know, and, and, and my tone of my conversation, my comments is about being walking around, driving around to the poorest area in this country. When you look at where do we have transportation deserts, most of them, presidents are not in the middle class and not on the upper class. It's in the poorest neighborhood where we have trans the most issue transportation desert, where you have the people in overcrowded station, especially this time where also the MTA should control the physical distance. And it's a challenging one because I agree with you and the governor, we will not build to address physical distance. But one thing is clear, all New Yorkers take the trains, but who's dying? In which sequel no, look, are people dying? Excuse me. I'm sorry, I didn't so mean to interrupt you. What so I so all, all, all I'm saying is about the special attention should be given to the underserved communities, 
that's what I'm coming from. And I think it's not a matter for me to, or any council member to give you any particular station, to give you as you mentioned too. I think that if the city is the one responsible to clean the entry of the station, and our purpose is for the riders to have a welcome entry, I'm not the one that should be giving you and sending photos, you mean the institution. The institution should do the assessment, how clean are the station at the entry in each station in the city of New York. But again, I, I saw that we can take the approach that, you know, look at the numbers, look where people are dying. And yes, we, uh, the, 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 the trains in the station is a vehicle through where coronavirus spread. But what happened then? That most people who get the virus are in the, in the third community. It's the same four train that go from City Hall to 96th Street and keep going up to 96th Street to, up to, uh, to the Bronx. So why people die not those who live in the poorest area? Why those people who have the high, you know, in, in numbers of cases with the virus are there? So I'm just sharing with you what I heard from many writers, which is about we need to clean not only the entry, we need to clean the entry of the station, and also we need to preserve the plan to upgrade our buses. We need you to work with DOT so that the funding that is probably could be cutting the program to operate the buses in our city should be restored. I know that this is a city responsibility, but the NTA should be engaged in this conversation. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to be fair also, you know, we were running behind in our own schedule. We went over at least 20 or 25 minutes. So I do, um, do recognize that as well. We got a late start. But anyway, let's go now to our um, next uh, council member to ask questions. Um, okay, uh, Chair Drum. Uh, the next question is from, I apologize for a frozen computer. Okay, uh, can we hear please from council members Miller followed by Cabrera and Holden. Starting time. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Madam President. Uh, pleasure, this is Councilmember Miller, and uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, I do want to reiterate what the chair said that we missed you for the preliminary hearing, and we did want to talk about some of the very important capital projects, and, and, and uh, we had questions about whether or not they were going to continue to happen, i.e., the Jamaica Bus Depot in Jamaica, Queens, which I represent, which happens to be the oldest depot in the city, which is operating at about 70% of 75% of capacity 20 years ago. And so it's really important. Um, but uh, in the immediacy, we want to talk about your commitment to this overnight plan and what that means. Uh, I've had the privilege and, pre and pleasure of representing those workers as the president and business agent for those uh, transit workers, uh, car cleaners, and, and uh, bus maintainers as, as well, who are cleaning. Um, and I've, I've been into the depots and uh, downstairs over the past few weeks. And uh, while you say there are 2,500 people committed to this, um, there are normally one person uh, serving a, a very large station, which is inadequate. What does that mean in this day and time um, it, it, are you bringing on additional staff? And I know that transit workers were uh, adversely hit and uh, with infection far more than any working group. Um, do you have the capacity to do so? What does that look like? And um, so we want to talk about the human capital portion of it. And I'm very appreciative of the initiative and the fact that uh, the board has uh, voted to, to support the benefit package, the five hundred thousand dollars, and the, the health care, super important. Um, but also, how do you provide services to those transportation deserts in the community, um, such as Southeast Queens, which has the highest number of public employees in the city of New York, and um, south of Union Turnpike? There's no service going. We don't have shuttles operating. Um, we don't have buses operating. And, and even from the Long Island Railroad Jamaica Station, there is no shuttle if you have the luxury of getting there. Um, have you coordinated with local uh, transportation and know in advance that this, you know, these are your needs? So uh, how do we address that um, in, in the immediacy? 
Um, how do we protect workers? And, and are we going to continue with those major capital projects that really are important to these transportation deserts? And, and by far, let me just preface it by saying that I'm so glad that you're here today to talk about the most important transportation system in the entire world. And, and it's been left out uh, in the transportation conversation. Uh, but right now, the closure is very important. If you can uh, uh, speak about that, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. So thank you so much for all those questions. And I'll, I'll try to run through um, them as quickly as I can. And um, but I wanted to I wanted to start by thanking you, sir, for um, I believe you delivered lunch to a bunch of our um, MTA workers today. So that was very kind of you. Thank you so much for doing that. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. So I'll, I'll go through a bunch of your questions quickly. Um, first of all, on the capital projects and on the Jamaica bus depot, I'll, um, I'll defer to my colleague Jano. And if he doesn't have the latest on, on Jamaica, I'll come back to it. But I, I want, I'll leave the capital program for him. He's, he's best placed to answer that. In terms of, um, of worker, uh, of our own workers and worker protection. So first you, you made one comment about um, MTA workers being hit harder than any other industry, and I, I just want to I want to clarify that we have we have paid an unbelievable price during this pandemic, uh, which has been heartbreaking. Um, I, I it is in no way to suggest that the price that we've paid isn't isn't severe because it is, but I'm not convinced that that we have um, that that our industry has um, has has paid in a disproportionate way than others. I mean, I think one of the things you're seeing is that the MTA has tried to be incredibly transparent about the way that we're approaching this pandemic, how we're caring for our workers, how we're distributing PPE, what we're doing to clean and disinfect our system for our workforce and our riders. And I think by virtue of being very transparent, we've been sharing information as it comes. And we, in hopes that people understand both what we're doing and also can learn from us and, and learn both about the pandemic and how transit systems should react to, to um, challenges like this. So look, at the end of the day, I, I, I hope that, that, um, that the suffering and loss for the MTA comes to a close very soon. But I think that one of the reasons we've gotten so much attention is because we've been so transparent. Um, but in, in terms of worker protection, I think one of the things that I found to be most stunning about the situation we find ourselves in is that as a transportation agency, we ultimately made the decision to distribute uh, PPE, including masks, to our employees because the CDC and other federal authorities had not stepped out and recommended that action. Um, you know, I am a I am a broken record on this. We are a transportation agency. We are not a social services agency, and we're not medical or health experts. And so if you're looking to the MTA to give you medical advice, you're going to the wrong place. And it, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, the fact that the CDC was continuing to stand by its guidance that people should not wear masks, uh, you know, weeks ago, uh, it, it felt very um, out of touch with the reality that we were seeing on the ground. And so we made the decision to proactively start distributing those masks to our workforce. Uh, and I'm glad we did. I wish we'd done it sooner, frankly. Um, but I think you know it's wow. it's a strange wow. place. It's a strange place to be when when a transportation agency is making uh, medical calls that the CDC isn't willing to make. Um, mm -hmm. And and look, I think I'm not you know I'm probably not the only transit agency leader to feel that way. Um, it was also incredibly frustrating mm -hmm. um, personally and for us to have such difficulty in getting the PPE that we wanted. I mean, we have stockpiled an enormous amount and had a lot of masks on hand and gloves on hand but it was um you know it was a huge undertaking by our procurement folks to be able to get the kinds of supplies that we needed because the reality was is that the country did not have them on hand because the federal government hadn't stepped up there so it was it was very frustrating look we we will do everything we can to keep our workforce safe and we will we wake up every day and i think that I've done everything the day before and I and I try to find new things to do the next day. So so we have, you know, on the buses side, we have um, put in a buffer zone between the bus operator and the public. We're doing rear door boarding so that the public is not coming into um, into interact with the operator. Um, we are, you know, protecting the operator with additional space. 
Uh, we are no longer taking cash in our stations. We are, you know, so we're, we're trying to do whatever we can to make sure that we can protect our workforce and also keep our keep our riders safe at the same time. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm um, sorry. the overnight service? Just... The overnight service will continue through the time of the pandemic. The governor has said that, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, the, the question was whether or not there, there are transportation deserts that don't, we don't have service overnight in Southeast Queens. Do you, how do we reevaluate that? So we will we will certainly we have tried to um, to hit everything with our bus service. We will absolutely take a and look at, about, um, at, okay. at the yeah. We will take a look at those deserts to make sure that your folks have a way uh, to get where they need to go. But at the same time, I also want to urge them to go to our website and sign up for the Essential Connector program so that we can make sure that if really bad move, <laughs> uh, Council Member, we need to move on. Okay, thank you. I want to make sure that they're getting where they need to go, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right, I will go to our next council member, please. Thank you. Can we please have council member Cabrera followed by council member Holden followed by council member Gibson? I'll make it quick. Uh, and Chair Drum, I want to thank you uh, for, I know you could be asking questions uh, right from the beginning. And again, you, you're always a, a first class uh, chair. And I really commend you for thinking about the rest of us. So I'll, I'll follow uh, with your example and I'll be parsimonious with my time. Uh, Madam President, I, I have to say, uh, I, I commend you. Uh, you literally, uh, this is like the worst time of any president of MTA uh, could conceivably walk into a situation into a pandemic and then take over uh, this system, uh, and I have watched you from afar. I don't know you personally, uh, but I appreciate your decisiveness. Uh, you know, you, you get you getting things done, uh, and I and I see the action and appreciate that. My question is uh, regarding your welcome. My question is regarding uh, the elephant in the room, uh, which is I'm concerned about the federal government. What level of discussion are you having directly? Are you having direct talks uh, with the administration at the federal level? What would happen if we don't get help? Right now, we're losing 90% of all the funding that we normally would get. And God knows when we're gonna be able to open. I'm very, very worried. Uh, and my second question is in regards to, and this is a question everybody's asking me. They ask council member, why don't we have more cards? Why are we cramming everybody up in the, you know, in the trains, uh, in the subway? Why can't we just double it up so we could have more space and they're afraid to go in? If you could help me uh, with those uh, two questions, I would really appreciate it. Because this is the question that people are asking. So in terms of the federal response, uh, look, I mean, you may have seen that the House released a bill just a couple of hours ago. We're still reviewing it to, to see how it um, see how it could impact us. But it certainly seems positive. Look, I, I don't. And obviously, with the help of Senator Schumer, there was a first tranche of federal assistance, which has been unbelievably um, helpful. And we're grateful to him for his work. Um, look, I think, you know, New York and, and MTA are the leading edge of this. I think all other transit agencies are going to be in the same shoes as us soon. Um, you know, additional, not getting additional federal help really isn't an option. Um, you know, this is not, you know, we are in a situation where we can't just, you know, we don't, we can't go sell more things or raise prices, right, um, significantly. And so this is just, a, this is a situation where what the federal government is just going to have to step up. Um, you know, the, the governor and others have called for a HEROES fund. Um, you know, Senator Schumer has Time done great fire. work on Time this. Fire. Speaker Pelosi's done great work on this. And so um, we are in close contact with uh, the Hill on a regular basis. And I know others at the MTA, including Chairman Foy and others, uh, are in close touch with both our congressional delegation and members of the administration. So I just don't see that it could be an option that we don't get additional federal assistance. And the trains? Uh, being so packed anyway to increase the yeah. no look it's a it's a great question I want to I, I want to make sure that people understand I, it is hard to imagine 
uh, New York City Transit functioning uh, and operating service where everyone can social distance, right? I mean, even if ridership ticks up in a very small amount, in a very slow way, um, you know, we are going to end up with moments where cars or trains uh, have more people than is ideal, right? Because as construction comes back, as retail comes back, as all the things come back to our economy that we have to have come back in order for New York to recover from this, that means we're going to have an increase in ridership and even, you know, small increases in ridership. And we want to go all the way back to where we were before. Even small increases in ridership mean that people are going to have to, um, have to take it upon themselves a little bit to social distance and to get space where they can. Um, the current standard is six feet plus a mask. That is not something that I think that we should assume is going to be um, something that we can maintain uh, going forward as ridership picks up. So we have been <laughs> urgently asking medical and healthcare experts, please give us your advice and your best guidance on social distancing. If, if you can't do six feet in a mask, is it four feet in a mask? Is it two feet in a mask? My sense of it is that it will be the number one priority will be to be vigilant about mask use. Masks will be required. And the second part will be give, you know, get as much space as you can between yourself and fellow riders. I think that's where we're where we're gonna land. And if we can give our riders the tools and the control. Uh, and as much control as possible over how they're entering the system, interacting with the system, interacting with others, we will have done a good job of, of giving our riders control over their own destiny. So that's going to be our focus. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you for your kind remarks. Uh, let's go to our next council member. Can we have council member Holden followed by council members Gibson and Grudenchik, please? Starting time. Thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you, President Feinberg. I appreciate all your comments and uh, testimony. Uh, and I've been hearing from constituents who are very happy to see the trains this clean. They haven't seen that in their lifetime, they're saying. Um, so what are the additional costs uh, that we're dealing with with the MTA cleaning the way you are? So it's, it's unclear at this point, obviously, um, as you know, the longer this goes on, obviously, the, the more expensive it's likely to be. Um, and but this is just not something that we have flexibility on. I mean, we are, um, we are, we are increasingly effective and efficient every day. We just started this a week ago, less than a week ago. And I would say already we have learned, you know, where we can be more effective and efficient and cleaning. And so we're getting better all the time. And I think that will costs will come down as we get better and more efficient. Um, but this is, you know, I think Chairman Foy said about a week ago, this is likely to be a multi hundred million dollar uh, problem. And I, I agree with that. And, you know, I was doing some research uh, about a month ago um, of looking at other subway systems, how they were cleaning. And I looked at Moscow and they, they had the uh, hazmat suits. They had the UV lamps. I think they were about four feet high. Uh, they had the foggers, so did uh, Seoul, South Korea. They had the hazmat suits, the foggers, the UV lamps in February. Yeah. And when I looked at the MTA, the way we were cleaning, you just had somebody sometimes without a mask with a rag. And knowing the virus, knowing how it spreads, I mean, it was spreading like the flu. This is what I, our own um, Department of Health at, in early March at a, at a city council hearing was saying, you don't need masks. When we know how the flu spreads, we know how viruses spread, it seemed that misinformation was everywhere, not only the federal government, but our own government. And, and some of it, I, I just couldn't understand. We still see the uh, this TV stations using the footage of MTA cleaners use with no masks, and it and that and then to see how many deaths we had in the MTA. That's it was upsetting. It still is upsetting um, that we didn't give. It looks like we didn't give our our um, our MTA workers the proper equipment. Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, at this point, I'm shocked if we have anyone out there uh, who's not wearing an N95 or other mask. We have distributed, I think, more than a million and a half masks. And I say to, um, to New York City Transit employees constantly in my emails and my videos to them, um, if you start your shift and you do not have the PPE that you need, raise your hand, talk to your supervisor, talk to your manager, and if you have to, send me an email. 
uh, and we will make sure that you have everything that you need before you start your shift. You know, I, I for a while I got a handful of those emails, and in every single case, I'm I think excited. that it turned I'm out excited. that the PE the PPE was you know in the next room or in the unopened but, box but on have, the floor. But does every it, worker have a hazmat suit? Because that's that's the problem here, I think too. I'm not sure I agree with you that it's the problem. Certainly, our cleaners have access to those suits if they want them. Some of our contractors use them. Some of our cleaners use them if they want them. But we do have those suits. I'm not sure that the that um, the experts we've consulted believe that they are necessary. But we certainly have them, both stockpiled and on just hand. Look at, just look at the our MTA workers. The whole country of South Korea, I think, has 250 deaths. Moscow, the, the same thing is very, very few deaths compared to, to uh, New York City. So I think we have to re look at how we're cleaning, even, but certainly how we're treating this virus. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Can I just say, can I say one thing about the cleaning? Of I just want to say that. One of one of the one of the important things that this overnight shutdown affords us is the ability and the space and the time to test some new cleaning solutions. So we are testing UV, we are testing microbials, we are testing new sprayers and new devices that allow us to clean faster and more efficiently. So that's exactly one of the things that we're doing on the overnight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next council member. Uh, can we have questions, please, from Councilmember Gibson, followed by Councilmembers Grudenchik and Adams. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam President. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, just two very quick questions on the capital plan, and I appreciate all the work that everyone is doing during COVID. Um, currently, the state funding makes up nearly a quarter of the 2015-2019 capital program, but the state will only contribute $3 billion or 5.8% towards the new plan. And that does not include congestion pricing. And we all know congestion pricing will largely impact and be paid for by New York City residents and taxpayers. Is it fair that the proposed capital program has the state and city each contributing $3 billion in funding? I'll, I'll refer you to my colleague, Jano. Jano, do you want to jump in on the capital okay. program? Sure. Thanks. Council member, Jano Lieber here. Good to see yeah. you. Um, you too. Look, we're, the, the, and, and I hope you're staying safe and your colleagues as well. We're, listen, the, the, the capital plan was adopted by the legislature at the, at the governor's request. Um, the capital program review board adopted it at, at the beginning of 2020, and it was historic. And it did put us in a position to really upgrade the system in a huge way. So we were moving aggressively to all of a sudden put, you know, put 70 stations in ADA accessible shape for the first time in a single capital program. We had all of those projects moving and obviously they had to stop because of the impact of COVID. And your colleague asked about the need for federal support, our ability uh -huh. to get the operating budget back in shape and with it to be able to continue the capital program really depends on federal support. That is the, you know, an existential issue for all of us and your constituents who are depending on the MTA, not just to operate for us to continue to make it better. What I can tell you though, is that all of the capital program work that was underway has continued during the COVID crisis and it's continued safely. We aggressively implemented a whole group, I mean, a really aggressive safety program and the result was keeping workers separate, disinfecting tools, monitoring entry and exiting. We were able to keep a very low rate of COVID positives in the construction workforce. So if we can get the money back in shape, we are ready to run all the capital projects that everybody okay. can run them safe. Okay, thank you for that. And the capital plan assumes about 10.4 billion in federal funding, almost 20% of the total plan. Um, do you guys believe that you're going to get this level of funding from the federal government? And given the political climate and everything we're dealing with COVID, is it safe to assume that the federal government is going to give us uh, this $7.5 billion for infrastructure projects? Have you guys received any commitments from Washington, D.C.? And do you really believe that this is a realistic assumption? I, I, I do think it's realistic. And here's why. I'm fired. One, the Congress really aggressively moved to uh, address the transit program in the CARES Act. We've asked for more money, but um, as you know, we've talked about it, but 
in the first uh, uh, emergency relief uh, pro uh, uh, program enacted by Congress, there was a significant chunk for transit. So they understand how important it is to continue investing in transit too. Are, are the numbers that we were assuming were basically just depending on what had been gone, what what had been given to this uh, the MTA in the past, so that yeah. it's not unreasonable to assume that we'll continue to get that same amount of money, especially since Congress is obviously pouring money out to try to stay, stave off the effect of the COVID crisis. And three, right. there is real talk about an infrastructure stimulus bill, and I'm sure we'll participate. So I do think it's reasonable. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next council member, please. Uh, can we please hear from Councilmember Gradenchuk, followed by Council Members Adams and Lander? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, for being here all day. And I look forward to spending many more days like this with you. Um, uh, President Feinberg, it's nice to see you. I don't think we've ever met, um, but it is nice to see you. I really don't have much in the way of mass transportation in my district. It kind of, uh, we do have buses, but that's about it. Um, I'm one of two districts in the whole city, I believe, that doesn't have a single subway station, but we manage. Um, I had mentioned to um, Commissioner Trottenberg before this, uh, Councilman Miller, my uh, dear colleague and uh, the other half of the Jamaica Avenue caucus, um, we have been pushing, you know, we have the Atlantic Fair, and I know that you you do not deal with the um, Long Island Railroad or Metro North. But I think um, we are looking, as, uh, as you know, at a disaster when we reopen the city um, because it's just going to be impossible. Uh, if people don't want to get on buses and subways, they're going to get in their cars. I have a district that has over 90% car owners um, per household. And what we would like to do is put some of those people, at least, on the Long Island Railroad. Um, we have stations in, throughout Eastern Queens. We have Metro North stations throughout the Bronx and Upper Manhattan. And so whatever voice you could add to that would be helpful. And we do also, while it's not New York City, um, in just over the border at Belmont Park in Nassau County, we have tremendous parking lots and a Long Island Railroad station. And due um, to the intercession of my dear friend and colleague, Senator Comrie, uh, we are going to get a railroad station built there. But um, we have one now that basically sits there empty or it has work trains sitting there. Um, we could put thousands of people on the Long Island Railroad. Um, and I have to think that those trains are gonna be empty also because people are gonna be very reluctant to get back on for all the reasons that have explained here. So no questions, but I hope you and, and your colleagues here will add your voice to that. Um, I will be mentioning it to the governor uh, if I can find him, but, uh, or his, his people, um, but it would be a way to get you know, a percentage of people into Manhattan or into Western Queens or into downtown Brooklyn um, uh, without ever getting on a, um, a subway. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Understood. Thank you. Understood, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, our next council member, please. Um, may we please hear from council member Adams followed by council members Lander and Koo. Council member Adams, your clock starts now. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Feinberg. A pleasure to meet you. We've never met also. I represent District 28. That's the Jamaica South Ozone Park, Richmond Hill. So uh, Council Member uh, Miller and I uh, were neighboring um, uh, districts. And I just wanted to go over a little bit maybe of an update for the Queens Bus Redesign Program. Um, my colleagues and I overwhelmingly disagreed with the plan initially. So if there are any updates that you could provide us, let us know what's going on, whether uh, things have actually come to a halt because of COVID-19, whether it's still on the front burner, um, when the design for the boroughs will be completed, and what the current outreach is right now for uh, community boards, council members, and stakeholders. So where are we right now with the Queen's bus redesign? So thank you so much for the question. Um, so all of our redesign work is really on pause at the moment. Um, look, at it, they are absolutely, they absolutely remain pr top priorities. Uh, it's, it's a huge effort on our part to, to right size and make some changes to bus service to make sure that we're meeting people where they are. Uh, but all of that is on pause at the moment. As you can imagine, it, you know, early on, it, it quickly did not make any sense to be having community meetings where we were actually bringing people together 
to interact with each other. Um, and so we have put everything on pause. We wanted to make sure that everyone understood that, you know, the input from the community is, is vital to all of this. And we're not gonna move forward without being able to hear from the community. So, so that, that work is on pause for the moment. We do wanna get back to it because I think it's important um, and would love to work with you on it and, and um, speak with you, you know, over the phone and in person when we're able to, because I would love to hear your thoughts on it. And I will say that I know that, you know, these redesigns start in a place and, and people are unhappy and then we make changes and it gets, it, it tends to get better and better. And then once, once the service is up and running, people use, usually are pretty happy with it, but we take this, we take the input part very seriously. And I want to make sure that we're working with you and hearing from you about your concerns. Thank you very much for that. I'm just going to squeeze in one more. I've got a couple of minutes left. I am a commuter, um, or at least I was, uh, E-Train end-to-end every day. And the homeless situation is significant, Jamaica Station. Um, so I, I just want to get your, your take on this. The MTA, are you looking at perhaps um, deploying social workers in the subway system? We know that our subways are policed very heavily doesn't seem to do a, a whole lot um, outside of, you know, antagonize, antagonizing folks. So um, that's the first part. And the second part is, has the MCA actually trained police officers in dealing with riders' mental health issues? And I'll stop there. Yeah. And Time. Thank you, great questions. Um, so first of all, we, you know, again, we're a transportation agency, we're not a social services agency. And so we believe that the priority is to make sure that we are treating everyone with um, an enormous amount of respect and grace and kindness, but to be making sure that those who are vulnerable and need social services and need medical services and need mental health care uh, aren't turning to us to get it, but are being, um, you know, move to and, and sent to the folks who can actually offer it. So we are working very closely with the NYPD, with our own MTA police force, uh, with homeless outreach workers from the city, with the BRC, and with, um, and with uh, medical, um, with nurses and medical staff and, and other outreach workers and social workers to make sure that the folks who need help are getting it. And um, to answer your question about, about police training, our, I can only speak for the MTA police, but I believe this is the same with the NYPD. We, uh, we do train people in how they work with those who are struggling with mental illness. And um, you know, it, is a, it is a very difficult job to be a police yeah. officer in the transit system. I, my hats are off and I'm so grateful to our MTA police and to the NYPD for all the work that they do. Um, and this is one of the challenges. I mean, this is these are folks who are vulnerable and have, who have not gotten the help that they need. And um, you know, being in a transit system is um, and treating as a de facto shelter is not the right answer for anyone. And so, um, the fact that they've turned there means they're not being served elsewhere. And so, um, we are trying our darndest to get them into the hands of the folks who can help them. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our next council member, please. Uh, council member Lander, followed by council members Kuh and Deutsch. Council member Lander, your clock starts now. President Feinberg, thank you so much for being here and thanks for stepping up to this job in what's really a daunting and impossible time. And, and I apologize, I got my timing mixed up, so I didn't hear your testimony. So I hope I don't ask questions that repeat it, but I apologize if I did. Jano, also really good to see you. It's not that long ago that we were talking about what we could do in the Gowanus rezoning to strengthen the transit system. I still wanna get that elevator for the Union Street Station, but that's for another day. Um, I really appreciate all you guys are doing, the whole system, your, you know, your employees, the, the MTA workers, the TWU members, and you know, the cleaning uh, that's been stood up is great. I wanna ask about three things that seem to me also really essential for starting to be able to have our subway system carry more workers as people start to move back in, including a lot of people who are very hesitant to get back on the subways, but we, we need them to because we're not a city that can work if people get back and try to get on cars. So I guess one is a question about um, time scheduled demand management. What's the relationship between the work the governor and the mayor are doing to try to work with some you know, businesses and corporations who are larger Manhattan employers 
to think about every other day scheduling or four day a week scheduling or altered timeline scheduling so we can prevent rush hour from being massively overcrowded on the subways um, I guess a related question about the roads, Sam Schwartz has put out some interesting ideas about, you know, sort of short term tolling of single driver cars on the East River bridges, because we've got to do something to prevent just a flood of cars that start to come in as people start to return to work. And I guess finally, um, if people are going to practice social distancing underground, it seems to me that we need some like public health corps ambassadors, like a set of people who are not NYPD or transit cops, but who aren't just like regular transit workers either, folks who are trained and get some, you know, have, have some skill and ability in communicating the need for strap hangers to observe social distancing and like help us ride in the ways we're gonna need to. So that's a, a lot, but I wonder if you could talk a little about the preparations you're making on those fronts. Sure, sure. Thanks for the question and, um, and nice to talk with you. So first on the staggering, so on the staggering of hours and of days. So we have absolutely first, I think the governor came out first and urged employers to do this. We absolutely echo it. Um, you know, as the city reopens, as ridership comes back, you know, to the extent that employers can be responsible um, employers here and have you know shift hours so that you've got some folks coming in early some folks coming in later and then the same on the on the um on the other end of the rush hour that would be very helpful urging from a lot of businesses. we have the tools to like compel also so we might need to think about something that's a well, little i don't have the tools to compel but you do so so go for it um right. but i think you know look we're the but staggering days of the week would be great as well we are hearing from businesses that they're planning on doing that so that's the good news um, I take your point on on tolling, but I will just say that's not my wheelhouse, and uh, and I'll let others weigh in on on cars and tolling. Um, in terms of the public health core, um, I, you know, I will tell you that the first thing that strikes you in this um, role is the scale of the system, and 472 stations having um, public health ambassadors at every single one of them would. Um, be a dream come true for me, um, but I think would be um, extremely hard to, to scale and to, to find those folks. I can tell you what we are planning, though, which is that we will have police, we will have MTA staff, we have platform controllers, and we've hired, a, you know, a, um, some uh, short-term contractors to try to help us with this effort. We are not going to be able to be in every station at every moment, at every hour of the day, reminding people you know, where they can stand and where they can't stand. This is very much going to be about reminding the ridership of our recommendations, of the, the best uh, recommendations and the, um, the best practices for medical and healthcare experts. But this is very much going to be a shared responsibility. Riders are going to have to, and I think they will appreciate this, when armed with the best information we have about how they can keep themselves safe and healthy, they will have to take some steps too. So I'm not, you know, I can't be on every platform to tell people, you know, that car looks too crowded to me. Why don't you, you know, head down a few more? Um, I, you know, we're going to have to count on folks to make some of those decisions um, themselves. And I am counting on employers across the city to be flexible and helpful and to acknowledge that it's a lot better to have an employee arrive 15 or 20 minutes late because they waited on a less crowded train than to show up on time but but having packed into a car like a sardine so um appreciate your help in echoing that thank you okay let's move on to our next council member uh council member crew followed by uh council members Deutsch and levin council member cool your clock starts now Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair John and Rodriguez. And I want to thank President Feinberg for doing a wonderful job uh, during this pandemic. You know. uh, the things I want to say is that like, now the subway is clean. Can we do it permanently like that? <laughs> because I walk subways all over Asian <laughs> countries. They're all clean. And I was wondering, how come New York cannot do it? So now it gave us an opportunity. Every night you shut off for a few hours and then you clean the, the subway. So, so another thing I want to say is that since we do it on the anti train, we should have robot to do it because robot never get tired. You know? 
And this is very easy to done because the subway is configuring the, the same, you know, the, the benches and things. So if you have a robot to do it, it will save a lot of time and and you will avoid uh, the workers' uh, infection. That's one thing I want to say. And then and another thing I want to say is the, the platform, right? In other countries, they have lines on the platform telling you how to line up. But in New York Subway, there's no lines. People are all standing all around the, the platform. So if you have lines lining, uh, draw on the on the platform, then people know, oh, this is uh, too many people. I will go to another, uh, uh, and, I mean, further away from the platform. So people, and then they have a uh, navigator during busy hours. They tell you, hey, line up here, line up there, you know? So those are the two points I want to make. And then one more point is that since we are short of revenue now, we should increase business in the subway, in, in the platform, in the dance, dance, uh, in the subway. In Hong Kong, in Taiwan, there are all kinds of bakeries or, or convenience stores in the subway system. You can buy coffee, sim uh, flowers, you can shine your shoes, you know. So we should increase that. First, you increase revenue. Second, you could if you have more people there, you will cut down on crimes, you know, or muggings or robberies, things like that. So thank you very much for doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the suggestions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, uh, President Feinberg has to leave in a couple of minutes, so our next question will have to be our last question. Uh, and that question uh, goes to Councilmember Deutsch. Councilmember Deutsch, your time starts now. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I have two questions. My first question is, um, I want to speak about the homeless uh, homelessness on the transit system. So there were reports uh, last week that um, there were several homeless people who uh, passed away on the transit system. And also in the homeless population, there were dozens of people that passed away because of COVID. Do we know that, uh, do, do, we, do we have any information if those who passed away on the transit system, if they passed away because of COVID? Because it was reported that it was because of natural causes. That's number one. And the second question is, is um, what was the success rate of the MTA working together with Homeless Outreach and the NYPD to actually getting the homeless into shelter, those who were sleeping on the transit system? So thank you for the question. So let me take it in reverse order. So first of all, the success rate uh, for having uh, folks actually enter the shelter system. Uh, those are not numbers that we're tracking. The NYPD is tracking them. And I know even more closely, uh, Commissioner Banks, the city uh, homeless outreach is, is tracking them. We do, a, um, I have, I've heard from them on a daily basis that they are very happy with the numbers that they're seeing. So they're, they feel like on a regular basis, just a, a handful of, of people taking My them on the offer of services. And there is a, a significant uptick okay. over the last week in the number of people who are taking them up on the offer of services now. So I know they're, they're quite pleased, but I'll send you to them for the specific numbers. And in terms of the, the deaths, I mean, unfortunately, we are such a vast system with so many riders that um, that individual riders, you know, passing away of natural causes in our system is not a terribly uh, unique thing to happen. It, it, when you just have millions of people, uh, the, the numbers are such that um, that will occasionally happen. I do not have any uh, reports that those were COVID related. Uh, I, I, I remember at least one was a heart attack, but I, I don't know what the others were, but I, it has never been flagged for me that those were COVID related. I just wanted to go back to Mr. Cruz's um, uh, remarks for one minute because I thought I was gonna have a, an opportunity to respond to him. I just wanted to thank him for acknowledging how clean the cars are and how clean the trains are. And it's such a testament to our cleaners and the folks we've got cleaning the cars right now that, you know, really any time of day now at this point that I'm in the system, I am stunned by how clean uh, the cars are. And it's just, uh, they've done an unbelievable job and they are doing it by cleaning 24 hours a day. The overnight outage uh, and closure to the, to the riders is so that we can really surge the system, but they're cleaning 24 hours a day and it shows and it's um, really a testament to them. So thank you for all those. Thank you very much, President Feinberg. I know you have to leave this time. 
I do believe that Mr. Keller and Mr. Lieber are staying, if I'm correct. Are you yes. able to stay or? If you wish, we're able to stay, yes. Sure, we only have a few more council member questions and uh, it would be great if you could answer their questions. But I do want to thank you, President Feinberg, for coming in and for giving us testimony and for foregoing your, your opening statement, which uh, is very much appreciated as well. Thank you. You bet. I, am, I, I trust that you'll remember that next time and let me go on twice as long. So <laughs> okay. Very thank good. You thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. And now we'll go to our uh, last few council members' questions. Uh, no other questions? Oh, yeah. Chair Drummond, this time we have no uh, further oh, questions. All right, then. All right. Then we'll just go to uh, Council Member uh, Chair Rodriguez and uh, for a closing statement. Chair Rodriguez, are you with us? We may have lost Chair Rodriguez. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, everybody gets off the hook easy today <laughs> in that sense, but we thank you for coming in and uh, we will uh, follow up with questions um, a little bit later on with you. Again, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now let me just close out. All right. Uh, this concludes today's hearing. Before we close, as a reminder to the public, the committee and subcommittee will be holding a remote hearing for public testimony on the executive budget on May 21 at 11.30 a.m. If you would like to testify at that hearing, please register at www.council.nyc.gov forward slash testify and information about how to access the Zoom meeting will be emailed to you. You may testify at that hearing via web or via telephone. You may also submit written testimony through that registration website or by emailing finance testimony at council.nyc.gov. And just finally, let me say thank you to all of my colleagues for your help and cooperation uh, throughout the day. It's been a long day, uh, but I appreciate everything that everybody has done and the questions that you've asked. Again, thank you everybody. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.